Good morning, good morning, good morning, WordCamp. The few, the proud, the not too hungover from the sponsor parties last night. <laughs> Welcome. Just a few announcements before we get started. As Kathy said, um, thank you to our sponsors. Um, their generous contributions are making the event possible. Please take a moment to visit them in the sponsor, ha the sponsor hall as you're able. Also, please join us for the official WordCamp US social. It starts at seven tonight. It's slated for Riverfront Park, but we're watching the weather, so stay tuned for announcements on that. <laughs> We'd also love to see you for contributor day tomorrow. It starts yes. at 9 a.m. for folks wearing a yellow lanyard, and they will be able to help you. Don't forget to use the hashtag WCUS when you share your WordCamp photos on Instagram and Twitter. We would love to see your photos, and also you can share your um, WordCamp photos directly to the WordCamp US official collaborative photo album. Look for signs with the QR code. Our first session of the day is Developing Cultural Intelligence with Petya Rykovska. Petya has built a career out of being uh, the cog in the center of organizations and teams, allowing them to run seamlessly and efficiently. As the director of agency operations at Human Made, she is responsible for the smooth and efficient delivery operations of a cross-culture, cross-cultural, globally distributed agency business. In her 15 years of experience in the software development industry, Petya has held roles in product marketing and event management, enterprise media product development, business operations, project management, and resource management. She's volunteered in, led, and enabled global open source communities, one of which, the WordPress polyglots, played a key role in developing her passion for breaking the boundaries of cross-cultural communication. Please welcome Petya. Thank you. I did not know that all of that would be <laughs> read on stage. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have written a shorter, uh, but you know, a pitch. Okay, good morning. Can I, is it too much to ask you all to kind of come a little closer, just a little closer? 10 seconds, just yes. Thank you. If, if that's okay, only if that's okay. <laughs> you can also stay where you are. Thank you so much. All right. So we're on time now, but usually I am late. And this particular situation is 9.03, and I am late, despite the fact that five minutes ago, no, eight minutes ago, everything started pinging, you know. Slack pinged me, Google Calendar pinged me, I got a text message, I got an email that I had a call, I got all the pop-ups about having an email about having a call. Yet I am late because I went to edit an agenda item and lost track of time. It doesn't really matter how benign the reason I'm late is. When I walk into, walk into Zoom, Jenny, looks really pissed. <laughs> what is happening, Petya? This is turning into a thing. You're late for every meeting. <laughs> this is totally disrespectful of my time. It's turning into a real thing for me, she says. This is the first thing she says when I open Zoom. I take a deep breath and try my very best to not roll my eyes. And I mutter an apology immediately, instinctively. <clears throat> and then I try to move away, promising, semi-promising, that I'll try to not be late for meetings anymore. <laughs> Behind my forehead, my grumpy, moody Bulgarian is just losing it. Why? Why is this a team? Why is this such a big deal? Why is three minutes such a big deal? I stay composed. But I don't have time to process. Usually, when I get into a situation like that, you know, experience from the last several years has taught me, stop Petya. Count to 10. In those 10 seconds, you'll be able to rationalize, and it will be OK. But I don't have time. I'm already late, and we've got stuff to do. So I just stay pissed until the rest of the meeting. And I'm pretty sure that because of that, we probably get a little bit less done than we would have if I had taken 10 seconds. 
The thing is, I realize once I'm off the call and before I start ranting to somebody else about how anal Jenny is about being on time, I take these 10 seconds and I, like it's all it takes, 10 seconds, and I got it. <laughs> you keep forgetting Petya, I remember. Jenny is actually American. She's not French, you know. Just because you met her through the French WordPress community, it doesn't matter if time is as fluid to her as it is in your mind. Jenny is American, and you know. You know that about Americans. Time is money. That's what they get taught from a very early age. They're very particular about time. You, you're not particular about time. I was born in communist Bulgaria, which is, was particular about things, including time, but the regime fell when I was seven, and then it was chaos. The 90s, which actually brought me up, there were no rules. And actually, people rebelled against everything that was to be related with the regime. And time was my tiny little quirk. The thing that I did to rebel, because I was a very good girl that went to school and had good grades. I mean, the fun fact is I almost didn't graduate because in 12th grade they almost threw me out of school because I was notoriously late for class. And like a leftover from the communist regime was that, you know, if you're late, like 30 seconds, if you come in after the teacher walks in, you get 15 minutes deducted out of a 45 minute class. And then that piles up and piles up and piles up. I've always been able to kind of get away with it, you know, you know, using charm and being, you know, actually participating in class and my teachers loved me. So, you know, here and there, it wasn't that big of a team thing. But I never really thought of time as being such a big deal, a particular time in general. But it is. It's one of the eight big things that actually differentiate between cultures to an, to an extent so much that it can actually bring quite a lot of arguments that can you know, be in a way of you communicating and working effectively with others. So, as I started working for a global company, I very quickly realized that we all speak English and kind of with the language comes the culture of the Anglo clusters that everybody working with English assumes needs to be, you know, the culture, the habits of everybody working in any industry using English as a primary language. <clears throat> but it's not really that simple because most of the misunderstanding that comes in day-to-day -day communication <laughs> is not based on the fact that somebody speaks better English than, other, than another person, you know. It's mostly about differences in the cultural programmings of people that have to communicate and collaborate to get things done. And in your professional life, you've come across these concepts, you know. You had to be smart to be good at business, right? You had to be smart and have, like, high IQ to be successful in any way. Then at some point, emotional intelligence became a thing and you had to be good with people. But nobody told you at that time you started developing your emotional intelligence that what they meant was being good with people like you. So what cultural intelligence is all about is being good with people who are not necessarily like you. And this is what we're going to talk about today. There's a Danish so social psychologist that I really like, but I can hardly go through like a full lecture of his. But I like this definition that he does, that culture is the software of the mind and it's the operating system that invisibly runs your life without you even realizing it. It's what your habits, your behavior come from. It's the way you've been programmed to see the world. And before I dig in further, I want to talk a little bit about stereotypes because at one point or another during this talk, you're going to get a little pissed and be like, well, if you just know the people you're working with, you know, if you know who they are, if you know what they're all about, if you not, like, get to know them better, you're not going to have to deal with this and you're not going to have to put them in boxes and judge them by, you know, the environment that built them. That is true, <laughs> you know, and these arguments are really valid. 
Speaking of cultural differences leads us to stereotype and therefore puts individuals in boxes. We should be looking and judging people as individuals. That's true. But ignoring cultural context means always judging everybody but with your own culture as a benchmark. And that is the big difference. So cultural intelligence is actually an outsider's seemingly natural ability to perceive and to kind of understand the behaviors of people that are not like them as if they are like them or as if they're compatriots. Over the years, I've been focusing on two main roles. I was helped before with all that was read before I uh, jumped on stage, but you know, I spent almost eight years of my life now at Human Made, which was a small WordPress agency 10 years ago. Now it's a big WordPress agency. Um, and I also um, was involved for a very long time with the WordPress Polyglots team. When Human Made started, it was a bunch of nerds in the UK doing WordPress sites that just you know, wanted to do their own thing with their friends. Over the years, it grew into this global, cross-cultural, multi-regional WordPress enterprise business. And I've been really privileged to have been a part of that growth for the majority and gone through like, the processes of us understanding how we can work better, even using our differences as an advantage. But before there was human made, I was WordPress and the WordPress Polyglots team. And that's, those are the people that taught me the most. Even though I couldn't put a structure around it, I put a lot of experience around it. And yeah, luckily, um, later on in life, I kind of was able to also um, use that experience in my work at HumanMade. And when I started <laughs> with the WordPress polyglots, I didn't know what I was doing. And all I can think about is just like, how can you know old things about old people? You know, when Zay, who was <laughs> leading the Polyglots team before uh, I took over comms, stepped down, I was just like, how are you doing this? I don't know nothing. How am I going to do this? He said, Petya, people just want somebody to listen to them. I said, oh, thanks. Yeah, that's really great advice. You know, I still know nothing. Turns out years later, Getting into something like this knowing nothing is quite a bit more useful than if you had gotten it thinking that you know everything. Because you can't. You can't know all things about all people, but you also don't have to. Really don't. Because in the base of developing your culture, cultural intelligence is the ability for you to suspend judging everybody else's behavior based on what you know and what your habits are and what you've learned. Counting to 10. And then maybe thinking before you react. So in a way, cultural intelligence is emotional intelligence with a bit of curiosity about what's happening in front of you and why. Why are we like this? All right, did I already speak about the global cultural clusters? If I haven't, I'm gonna for a bit. The global cultural clusters that David Livermore speaks about are over there. I'm not gonna focus on geographic location because culture is really not all about geography. In fact, I was chatting to Kadam, <coughs> who is where you come over there the other day he was helping me kind of with some stuff about this talk and he shared that he feels way better embedded and understood by his work work colleagues like his work friends than he does by most Americans he's from the US and that's normal because like there's there are cultures and levels it's you know in that, that are different than just like geographic location you know we as wordpressers have a shared culture and it's very uh, usual for us to understand each other quite a lot better than we would with anybody from any other industry just based on that. So 
it's important to also acknowledge that these are very high level and it's ab absolutely okay for you to be born in one place but like carry a different culture because of where your parents came from or how you were raised or what you chose for yourself. And it's absolutely okay for you to be a total mess of several cultures like me, you know, born in that weird era at the end of the, so end of the Soviet Union and then you know, live, living in a country that was trying to figure itself out for years, you know, copying some Western standards when it came to work, trying very hard not to copy too much so that you can still keep some sort of identity. And over the years, working with the polyglots, working with the humans, I kind of, you know, you learn a lot of lessons. You're in a lot of confusing situations. You go through weird things that you don't understand. You try and understand them. You learn, you grow. But I've never really been able to put any of that in, in any type of structure before I read this book called The Culture Map by Erin Mayer, who put the world on a scale, um, on a map with eight scales that are the main things that are different for different cultures based on geographic location, but not only. These are the eight scales. Communicating low versus high context cultures. Evaluating direct versus indirect negative feedback. Persuading principles versus applications first. Leading egalitarian versus hierarchical structures. Deciding consensual versus top down. Trusting task or experience based. Disagreeing. Embracing conflict or avoiding confrontation. Scheduling linear time versus flexible time. We're not going to have time to go in depth. I highly recommend if you're interested in culture to just like take a look at this book. But I want to introduce you to some of my colleagues that helped me actually develop this talk uh, and some others that are going to be mentioned in this talk. Uh, I already mentioned Jenny. She's over there. She's from uh, the un United States but lives in France. Kadam, who is in the top right corner, who is American. Jenny Wong on top, who is a uh, first generation uh, British citizen of Chinese, de Chinese descent, and she mixes cultures wonderfully. <laughs> Over there, down there, that's Miguel from Brazil, one of my favorite new colleagues, Juliana from Bulgaria, Vanita from India, and Lorna from Singapore. As I said, we're a diverse team, and I kind of reached out to them while I was preparing this talk to chat a little bit about their experiences uh, across different levels of the scale. So we're gonna start exploring a little bit all the eight scales of the culture map. Communicating low context versus high context cultures. Can you read between the lines? Do you prefer to be taught directly what you have to do? Do you prefer a more sophisticated way of communicating? Do you get annoyed when somebody repeats something in front of you like you're maybe a little child, like I get annoyed when that happens. That's the big difference between low context and high context cultures. In high context cultures, good communication is sophisticated and layered. Messages are both said out loud, but also read between the lines. Messages are also often implied and assumed. Body language is absolutely crucial. In low context cultures, good communication is straightforward and direct. Repetition is welcome. Anything is actually welcome as long as it clarifies things. So it gets very, very interesting how low context versus high context cultures clash in a remote work environment because we can't really read body language. And for a lot of people from high context cultures, that's a very, very big part of what you're saying. And how you say something matters way more than what you're actually saying. I mean, I'd say that that matters quite a lot for everybody, but still, if you deliver a very straightforward, clear message in a particular way, the way you deliver it 
will be taken into consideration way more than what you're actually saying in high context cultures. Whereas somebody from a low context culture will take away what you said and don't really bother that much about any of your delivery. And at the same time, <laughs> you know, repeating over and over, and that happened to me recently, somebody on my exact team, like I was trying to get a message through and I wasn't succeeding and I kept repeating the same thing, but this is what my outcome is. And I got, do not repeat the same thing over and over. I heard you the first time. I'm not a little child, Petya. And I was just, okay, it's not why I was doing it. I was trying to say very straightforward what I want to do. Do you agree with that? It's difficult in those situations. It's also difficult working with people from uh, our Asia Pacific region or with clients from our Asia Pacific region who never show their faces on camera unless they're dressed for work, which during the pandemic, <laughs> during the pandemic was not a very, very usual you know, situation. So you end up working with avatars. There is a very straightforward, according to all the books, way of managing across multicultural teams. And that is defaulting to low context. Straightforward messaging, etc. It makes sense. It really makes sense. But what it doesn't make sense of is that not everybody always speaks up. Not everybody will always say the things that they think about. Not everybody will always be vocal. And it very, very much depends on where they come from, around how they express themselves, even in writing. And some people might be limited by this form of communication. So it's very important that people that don't come from low context cultures are invited to those conversations. I remember, this is actually a story for another slide. Let's not get carried away with this. Let's look into this one, which is my fa favorite one and the one that confused me the most because I had to face it head on. Human Made is a very egalitarian company. You know, it would never occur anybody to call Tom, our CEO, anything else but Tom. Like some people don't really know his last name and like get confused him with other Toms in the company. You know, he just like strolls barefoot during company retreats and in his swim trunks during, you know, State of the Humans, which is, you know, our version of State of the World. Word. I've seen him wear the same pants like for eight years in a row. And like he's a very, very, <laughs> very low key guy. And it was like, obviously, the founders kind of build the culture and the motto. And it's, it's very normal for us to be informal in our communication at work, to kind of speak like that. And usually that projects quite a, a bit to our, towards our clients. You know, we would call our clients by name, we would speak to them like at first name basis, like we would call our stakeholders. And even like in written communication, we wouldn't really use surnames that often, <laughs> but that could not be the case when we started working with Japan, where not only we were meant to be dressed for work, but you know, there was a very formal way of having to communicate with them. And we had so many clashes in the beginning of those relationships, so many things that we couldn't understand. And because our American and our Japanese and our Asia Pacific teams had to collaborate. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, I thought I lost myself for a moment. <laughs> There were quite a lot of confusing moments that we had to figure out. So the biggest thing for me with the low versus high um, power distance cultures was when I had to hire my team. Because I did allocation management at Human Made at this time, I needed a team that could cross over the world. So I needed to hire in APEC and I needed to hire in the Americas because I'm in Europe. We can cover the regions. And I hired Shannon, who lives close to Chicago and who's lovely, and Vonita, who lives in Bangalore in India, who's also lovely. And they had so much in common in their enthusiasm and passion for the work, they really love people, they're very outgoing, you know, so much in common. And they had such fundamental differences that it hit me really hard how much of a different like approach I had to have with both of them so we can actually work effectively. <laughs> Shannon, I could deal with, you know. Five years at Human Made had taught me how to deal with Anglo cultures. You know, people are communicating directly, you know what to expect, you know how to talk to them, all that. <laughs> but working with Vanita caught me off guard. 
four days in, we were in a meeting and I'm giving her feedback in front of the whole team about something that she had prepared for the meeting. And I was like, you should do this, you know, in this way or this way, like this is probably better done in X, Y, and Z ways. And it's very, I, you know, it's what I consider like very mild, kind of not critical, but just like a small correction, an opportunity for her to learn, to grow, for the team to know what we're talking about. So, you know, they can help her along and know where she struggles. She grows quiet 30 seconds after I start speaking and doesn't speak until the, rest, the end of the call. <laughs> she only says, okay, and keeps nodding with this expression on her face. We go on into a one-on-one -on -one because I sense that something's different. We go into a one-on-one -on -one immediately after the call and she starts crying. She's like, you're going to fire me, right? I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? She's like, you just like, you just criticized me in front of the whole team. Like you got, you just, you know, told me that I hadn't, that I didn't do something right. I was just like, but this was just, you know, we talked about this. We talked about giving feedback in context and, you know, we're just like, working through issues as they were happening and like that this is the way and you agreed you said yes like i like to work like that like, this is like and then of course i will agree you're my boss like you're telling me how things are done like of course i will agree and then of course you know you're gonna i, I thought that you're gonna fire me like you you can't really give people feedback in public unless you like intend to do such and such action in india and then I got it. India is one of the most high power distance co countries out there. It was normal for her to think about critical feedback in public meant that she was in real trouble. And she still has to this day difficulty giving me feedback in public. They do not speak to any, anyone that they report to in public or do critical feedback in public, regardless of how transparent the company culture is. She has difficulty giving me feedback at all. I had to drag it out of her using ways that might not be as straightforward. And she still, to this day, not to this day, well, we've worked, worked through these issues, but like it, at least in the first six months, like she really wanted me to, to run everything that she was doing through me. She needed permission to do any part of her job. And I was inexplicable to me. Autonomy is like how human made became successful. We have it built in our culture and all that. But autonomy has to be taught to some people that come from different cultures. You have to teach them not to ask for permission. <sighs> the head or the heart? How do you build trust? Apparently, you can't do business in Japan without going to karaoke. Did you know that? <laughs> You can't. And you can't do business in Portugal without overeating. I also didn't know that. And that's, you know, it's true for Italy and any of the European or Latin American countries. Well, I didn't know that. So when I went to Japan, um, because of the jet lag and everything, like I tend to generally kind of skip social events at work camps. No, I said no, no, <laughs> no, no. If you want to do like any sort, if you want to have any sort of relationship with these people, you go and you sing karaoke, you make a fool of yourself, like get that mic and just like scream into it, do whatever. It doesn't really matter. Like what matters is you, you have to be there and then everything in the morning will be fine. Apparently some of this like various cultural <laughs> differences with relation based countries involve heavy drinking, which you, <laughs> you, can, you still can't get out, get out of. But yeah, I don't know. You can at least maybe pretend, I don't know. But the thing is, in, in the West and in the Anglo clusters, trust is built based on tasks. You do what you said you will do. You are very professional at work. You're always on time. You communicate clearly, you're organized. You're fine. I trust you. Wherein, <laughs> in the other cultures, it's not really like that. You gotta go do karaoke. And multicultural remote teams need FaceTime because that mix of people really built. The trust can't really be built unless people see each other. 
decisions are made by those who show up. I heard that it was an American core contributor giving a talk at one work camp once upon a time, and I loved it. And it turned out that it's a Sorkin quote from the West Wing. Perfect. And it was like a principle of WordPress, really great. But then, you know, over time, you, you know, observe chats on Slack, on the WordPress Slack, and you actually understand that decisions are made by those who show up and they're to speak up <laughs> and actually participate. And uh, the two types of decision making across cultures are consensual and top down. And if you have a multicultural team, the first thing you have to decide is how you're going to be making decisions. Otherwise, you will go asking the room, some of the room will speak, other people will never, never raise their hands. And the worst thing that you can do is in an established consensual decision making environment to go in and force a top down decision. Trust. Oh. If you're in Japan, you can go to karaoke, but like, I don't know what you do if you're anywhere else. We're trying hyper, like embedding the concepts of high performing teams at Human Made right now. And one of them, one of the principles is that you have to embrace conflict as a productive way to move past an obstacle. Oh man, was our APAC team freaked. So many people in these cultures don't really do public conflict. They don't. And in talking to Lorna and Vonita about it, like there are principles deeply embedded in the culture that say that you know you resolve things privately, you resolve things between individuals. You can't like have a public fight in a room and then be okay. On the other hand, is my colleague Frank, who doesn't really mi mind calling you an idiot in a post or anything like that, and then going and then going to lunch with you and just like having a you know a really nice chat. It's not an issue. Like he doesn't really consider that to be problematic. It's the most, the most usual thing to sit down with you know, the Portuguese and the German to have like a really heated discussion. I mean, the Germans don't really get heated. You know, all you get is this while well, they argue. But still, you know, they get heated in their own way. And you disagree and you like scream. I mean, some scream, some like very, very kind of earnestly disagree. And then you're friends, you go for drinks, it's fine. In some cultures, if you do that in public, there's no way. There's no way you want to see this person later. There's no way you want to work with them, any of that. So embracing conflict, conflict is quite tricky. So you think about that. Just don't imply everything that you, don't apply everything that you want to do in a cross-cultural company in the same way throughout your regions. Speaking frankly, is that a gift or a slap in the face? When you give feedback, is that a direct negative feedback? Do you sugarcoat it or not? This deeply matters. And the why versus how. Do you start with how you're going to solve an issue or the theory around how an issue should be solved? Those are the other two. I'm running a little bit behind, so I'm not going to get into detail on these ones because I want to talk about this one. <laughs> time. So in linear time, project steps come one after another. Deadlines matter. Everything is fixed. And we know what the cultures are. That really, really, what the cultural clusters are that really, really depend on that. In a flexible time, flexibility is everything. Project steps are approached in a fluid matter. You know, the focus is on adaptability and not on everything being done in a particular order. So, sorry. So on the scheduling scale, we've got Germany and Switzerland on one side, we've got India and Kenya, and some of the Asia, Asia clusters on the other side. And I, and somewhere, I guess, around the Russians on like a little bit of the fluid side, but don't really know where exactly. Because the culture map is a scale. It really depends not only where you come from, but like who you are, what are the cultures that influenced your growth. And that's something that you shouldn't be forgetting. So how do we do this? 
how do we know all things about all people? How do we develop our cultural intelligence? It starts with figuring out what your core is. What are the things that make you you? But maybe really you. What are the things without you're not going to be you anymore? And what, what is the flex? Where is the flexibility that you have to adapt and to grow? On the left hand, oh, is it left? It's your left, yeah. On the left hand there is the salesman that will flex to sell you anything. They will not have absolutely any core values and you won't trust them for the world. They don't have anything that makes them them. They will flex towards you. On the other hand, over there is my granddad who will not flex. <laughs> about anything. He is who he is, this is the way he, he does things, and there's no moving that. There's no moving the scale. And in the middle there is your ability to adapt towards the otherness of others. The big thing here are the knots, because as you start looking into yourself and developing, you actually find things in your own culture that you're not particularly proud of or comfortable with, and those are your knots. And those are the things that you probably have to work on the most in order to be able to collaborate and understand others. And understanding whether you can actually adapt them and move on from them, or they're just an integral part of you and you just have them in mind. But maybe you keep, you keep them. You know, some of my, <laughs> some, of, some of the things that I, I figured out about myself like a while back were, you know, the things I'm uncomfortable about is like, I'm, I'm not really comfortable with where I'm in life, not because I'm not happy at where I'm in life, but because I've been culturally programmed to be doing an exactly different, like a really different thing at this stage. You know, babies, family, what my purpose in life is shouldn't be this. I'm really uncomfortable with that, even though rationally, rationally, I don't have any issue with where I am. I am happy. But inside, it struggles. So it's work every day. And cultural intelligence is developed by having the courage to actually ask the uncomfortable questions and dig into those things that you feel deeply uncomfortable about. Have the willingness to admit what your knots are and either move past them or acknowledge them. And the paradox is you can only develop cultural intelligence if people will share with you and they will only share with you if they think you have enough cultural intelligence to understand and be willing to listen. So be willing to listen. Turns out Zay's advice on point. People just want somebody to listen to them, Petya. He said, be genuinely interested in other human beings and their experiences. And the otherness doesn't have to be otherness. It can be what's interesting about a person. Be aware of your knots. Learn to make a fool of yourself. It's useful in general from someone very particular and tied up. Re recognize and set up to cultural intolerance as well when you recognize it. Because staying silent is not going to help as well. I recently, somebody recently told me most people, Petya, listen to reply. You know, I try to listen to understand and it stuck with me and I think that that's the core. When you listen, listen to try to understand. You might not understand, but at least you will learn. Because a lot of people think about cultural intelligence, Intelligence is knowing a lot about others. And what it actually is, is knowing your own culture, starting to decipher that, reverse engineering yourself a little bit so that you can react in certain situations. Spend the 10 seconds, not carry any frustration or anger or misunderstanding or confusion with you more than you have to. Because not everything is resolved in 10 seconds, let's be honest. So, how over time am I? <laughs>
44 minutes almost. So what did I do about being on time? Because I quickly realized that that was pissing off more people than just Jen. So I set up my notifications to ping me a minute before a call and I would go on the call immediately and be the first one in regardless of what I was doing while I was waiting for everybody to get in. Because the thing was that I quickly realized being on time is in my flex. I don't care about that. I don't really mind. You know, it's my cute little quirk from, you know, when I, when I was a kid. You know, it's something that I think I can get away with, but it's in other people's core and that's important. And it's a little thing that I can do to change. And I'll be honest, <laughs> you know, this is a very, very easy and straightforward kind of flex example to be giving. There are things that are going to take more than just changing a notification setting for you to kind of get over. But it works. Because being on time is in a lot of my, my colleagues' core. And I may be late every now and again, but not as often as I was. And now, because before I get over, get over time, because I'm in the US, I'm going to say thank you. The slides from this talk are in my speaker deck and on the Human Made blog there is a summary of this talk that has some resources uh, from the material that I mentioned on the talk if you're interested in learning more or reading more. So yeah, do we have time for questions at all? Two minutes? Okay. Yeah, I think there's a question. Thank you so much. It was a really great presentation. Um, Thank you. My question was a little bit about, uh, I know that there's a lot of talk about toxic work cultures in general. So we do have a lot of responsibility as leaders to, to ensure that our culture in the office is good for everyone. Um, but you also mentioned that there are certain things, for example, deciding that you might want to set up as your company's culture to begin with before you start onboarding other people and adjusting for their cultural specifics. So is that the same for many things or is, is it different in your opinion for the different uh, areas? I think it's definitely different and it helps to have somebody very culturally aware in, in the company to be able to kind of go through and implement these things even on regional levels. And it's okay for a culture to start, for a, you know, a company culture to start from one spot and then evolve. What's important is to not try and box people into a culture that was developed, you know, from the one global cluster. Just it, it's still fine to set up a ground rules, but it will take you longer to onboard certain people towards that, and you have to have the patience and give them the time to adapt, and not expect the same results from people from different cultures necessarily when they're culturally sensitivity, sensitive issues because it's like asking a person who can swim and who cannot swim to swim, you know, at the same time. You will have to learn fast or they will drown where the other might not really have a big issue or big difficulty with that. So yeah, it's worth looking at the, at the eight scales, figuring out what are the core values of our company. It's the same, the same thing, you know, as looking into yourself. What is your company culture and what are the core values? Which cultural clusters are they best <laughs> tuned into? Do some of them need more attention? And where, is, where are the parts of your onboarding process that need tweaking based on where the people are? Does this answer your question? Okay, anybody else? There's a question over there. Thanks for a great talk. I wanted <clears throat> myself a little bit here. I work in software global in the mid. Sorry, the mic is kind of <clears throat> cutting off, so I'm not Sorry. sure. I, I started working in uh, globalization of software in the mid 90s and working with teams and managing people 
uh, to make their software ready for global markets. And what you presented today was actually the bigger problem in terms of, of um, getting software ready for global markets is the different you know, cultural aspects. And this was a great presentation of, of kind of capturing that problem. And the, the hardware, <laughs> sorry, the software side in some ways was the easy part and getting people on board to make sure that the software developed and worked in Japan versus America was technically fine, but the, the, the subtleties of all the cultural differences. And I've, I've been, you know, follow, I've been in this area for some, some large number of years now. And, and I, I, I still find it frustrating to, you know, to, that we're still having to have people like you give these talks because we, we haven't yet as a, as a uh, community really fully embraced what you said, and I'm wondering if working with your clients, whether or not you're seeing improvement in, in this area. Um, definitely, we are very, well, the, the thing is, when you're doing business, the shift and the adaptability of like how, how your employees kind of see things, adapt as the client needs adapt. So we adapt to our clients better, towards our clients better than we adapt towards our people. This is one of the big things that we have to kind of change, I think, as an industry. Because like we are very ready to accept our clients' cultural differences and adapt towards them. Maybe not necessarily ready all the time, but like at least we are very quickly become aware of them and try and adapt. And we're slow, way slower adapting towards like the people that are actually working for our companies. So yes, I see a lot of adaptability towards the business relationships. Um, I think it would be great to see more adaptability towards like the people working in companies as well, because that serves both. <laughs> Does this answer your question? Thank you. All right. There are two more questions over there. Do we have time for them? Or if not, I can also absolutely, I would love to kind of have conversations in the hallways. So please find me, um, you know, I will be around all day today and not stressed anymore. Thank you. Are we on time? Yes. Thank you, Petra.
Hello, 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 WordCamp. We are getting ready to start our 1015 session. We have a few announcements before we get started. Um, we want to thank the sponsors for their generous contributions that are making WordCamp possible. Our first WordCamp back in a few years. Please take a moment to visit them in the sponsor hall as you're able. Also, join us tonight for the WordCamp US Social, formerly known as the After Party. It starts at 7 p.m. tonight. The plan is for Riverfront Park, but we're watching the weather to see if there need to be updates to that, so please stay tuned. We'd also love to see you for Contributor Day tomorrow, starting at 9. Now look for folks wearing a yellow lanyard, and they'll be able to help you out. Don't forget to use hashtag WCUS for sharing your photos on social media. You can also share your photos directly to the official collaborative photo album. Look for signs with the QR code. Our next session is Designing for Accessibility with Sarah Cannon. Sarah is a seasoned UI UX designer, former business owner, creative director, and passionate about creating an accessible web. All right, thank you very much. So good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Cannon. I'm a short, white female with dark hair and eyes, and I'm wearing a black pants outfit. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm a web design consultant based out of Birmingham, Alabama. So it's really nice to be here on the West Coast where I thought it was going to be nice and sunny, but it's more like Alabama weather here. Hopefully it'll clear up by this weekend on Sunday, and that'll be awesome. Um, so, but today I'm here to talk to you about designing for accessibility. As a designer, this topic is something that I've slowly learned more and more over the years. And I wanted to share design methods with you today that we can all integrate into our individual design practices in order to create a more inclusive web for everybody. A web that can be easily accessed regardless of disability. And I always like to say that I am a lifetime student and I'm learning more and more every day about how to make designs accessible. So who is this talk for? Designers such as myself who work in a layout tool such as Figma individuals doing site audits for accessible design, and basically anyone wanting to sharpen their accessibility skills or increase their awareness. I want to open the session today with a quote by Tim Berners-Lee that I love so much. The power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. We are champions and creators of the internet. That's why we are all here at WordCamp. And I believe that we have a moral obligation to harness the power of the web and make it a place for everybody. And this is essential to why I feel passionate about giving this talk today, because I've been digging deep into how I can make accessibility part of my design process, and I want to encourage others to do the same. This topic is just so huge that there's really no way that we can cover everything in a 45 minute session. So we're going to cover a lot of best design practices and how they relate to accessibility, as well as other tips. So what do we need to consider when we talk about accessibility? The world is a very large and diverse place. So we need to consider a bunch of people when we design that aren't necessarily the average users. They could be people with visual impairment, such as partial or complete vision loss, color blindness, elderly, situational impairment, people with auditory impairments, motor skills, impairments such as loss of use of missing limbs, arthritis, broken fingers, people with cognitive impairments, such as brain injuries, learning disabilities, seizures, literacy, people with environmental factors, such as non-native speakers, and people temporarily have, that have the inability to listen to audio or read. Some people use tools to assist them in accessing the web and content. The average user might use keyboards, mice, and trackpads, touchpads, like touchscreens, but others might use tools such as screen readers, customs cursors, or eye tracking. There are just so many various ways that people can access content. And it's important that we start paying attention to accessibility in our designs in order to ease the barrier of entry, regardless of what tools, tools people are using. So with that being said, how accessible is the web anyway? This is kind of sad. In 2021, WebAIM did an accessibility analysis of the top 1 million home pages and found that 97.4% had accessibility failures. I believe that we can do better 
and that we are obligated to. We need to dig deep into ourselves and find empathy for our end users and incorporate accessibility into our routines. In her ebook, Giving a Damn About Accessibility, Sherry Byrne Harbor says, good accessibility is about compliance, but great accessibility is about empathy. So good accessibility looks at the product, but great looks at the entire user experience from start to finish. So if we can try to empathize with any given person's experience, we will teach ourselves to make better design choices from the start. If you would like to read Sherry's ebook, go to accessibility.uxdesign.cc. It's a great resource for anyone who needs to convince themselves or others, maybe higher up, the importance of integrating accessibility into design practice. We need to pay attention to design best practices in order to make the web a better place. So we also need to take extra care to think about how our design choices affect the greater community. Some of these practices I'm gonna go over today you might already know because they're just good design practices. Even so, it's good to refresh with an eye for accessibility. So why do we need to pay attention to our typography when it comes to accessibility? Typography is the medium in which our content is conveyed. So if this content is difficult to read and confusing, the consequences are really dire. Good typography equals better readability, which equals ease of cognitive load. It's really important to convey our content without causing confusion for our users or straining. Everything has a compounding effect. The more and more difficult the readability is, the more frustrated your user will be. And if you heard Christina's Deemer's talk yesterday, it will use up spoons. So definitely check out her talk if you have not already. It's amazing. So what are some things that we can do with our typography to increase our accessibility? I have six rules of thumb that I want to share with you today. One is to simplify your body fonts. Ornate body copy can be very difficult to read, so simple is obviously better. I can see this a lot done in fancy girl boss themes where they italicize Sarah's fonts, they make it look cool, but really in fact they're very hard to scan and read, even for an average user. Number two is to watch your paragraph widths. Too wide a paragraph text makes reading from line to line challenging. You can get mixed up in which line you're reading. If you want to keep your width, you want to keep your width around 60 to 80 characters. I see this a lot in the block editor actually because you can set your block, and you, just because you can make your text the whole block width, it does not mean that you should. You should make sure that you could constrain it. So when you're working in Figma and in, in design and on a grid, this also applies. So you can have a wide grid in Figma, and it could be very easy to just span your paragraph content all the way across. But really, this obviously breaks our rule. We want to constrain our paragraph text for readability. And trust me, the average users will love you for it. And don't forget to constrain on widescreens, especially when you're like when you have like a large monitor and you are doing full width and it goes like all the way across. You don't want to like have to move your head to read everything or to see everything. Make sure you have some constraints in place. Number three is kind of obvious that this will increase accessibility, but use large body copy. It's obvious that small body text is hard to read. You want to make sure your body copy is 18 pixels or higher. Small body copy is basically a remnant of the constraints of print in newspapers and magazines, but we don't have those constraints on the web. People are used to scrolling. So on a side note as well, don't make your smallest text, like your metadata and your categories, below 14 and 16 pixels. You want to be able to sure be people to be able to read your content with ease, even if they have some limitations. Number four is pay attention to line height. This can often be overlooked, and people can just end up using default line height. He heading lines can be difficult if they're very far apart, and constrained paragraph text is very hard to read. The solution is to reduce the line height on your headings and make your minimum body line height at least 130%. Basically, you need to use your intuition here because different fonts act differently by default, but this is a general rule of thumb. Pay attention to it. It'll also make your designs look a lot more professional. 
Don't ever justify your text. Justify a text creates gaps or rivers of spacing in the text, causing the content to be harder to scan. So you want to left justify your body copy as that's easier to read. When centering, don't center text that's longer than three lines. So if it's longer than that, you should just left justify it to prioritize readability. It's pretty agonizing to read a very long paragraph that is centered. Number six is minimize the use of uppercase text. Headlines in all caps are very hard to read. So we want to limit the text, the limit the uppercase text that is not user inputted, such as categories or metadata, so that's capitalized only by CSS. So this reduces the error of a user typing in all caps into the admin because they can't, you know, they can't do it if it's something that um, is not user inputted. And this is kind of problematic if people type in all caps because some screen readers might actually read all caps as acronyms, and that makes it very difficult for some people. So if you're going to have some meta that's in all caps, such as a category or a date, adding letter spacing to it um, also helps improve the scan, your scanning ability of the uh, metadata with the all caps. So here are the typography tips today, just to um, recap, simplify body fonts, watch your paragraph widths, use large body copy, pay attention to line height, don't justify text, and minimize the use of uppercase. After our quick typography lesson today, let's talk a little bit about links. Links are an important function of the web and very imperative with navigation. If it is difficult to navigate your site, you can see why this will be an issue. I have six rules of thumb for links to share with you today. The first one is to not rely on color only for links or communication. Using color only can get lost in grayscale. Although the, left li the link on the left looks very well defined for people that see color, if you view it on the right in grayscale, note that it's very difficult to define from the rest of the text. It would be easy if you're colorblind to not even know that link is there. If you're going to use color, always pair it with an indicator. So if you choose to use color, that's perfectly fine. We all want to have beautiful colors in our designs. But make sure there's an indicator with it, such as an underline, so that's easier to tell that it is, in fact, a link. Here's another example of utilizing an indicator rather than color alone. Um, Someone who is colorblind will not be able to tell the top two apart from the excess or error message based on just the color. So having an icon will make it so that they can. Number two is make links easily distinguishable. The underline method is great, but underline and bold is even better. And if your link is going to leave your site or open up into an external window, adding an icon can be very informative. Making distinguishable links to content obviously further enhances the experience of the user and it's an important information does not get lost. Number three is don't bold on hover. This is something that's extremely common. But if you, when you do this, the hover effect can cause the content to completely shift. Um, so if you want your link to be bold, have it all ready to be bold and then add a hover state on top of it, such as removing the underline or adding a highlight. So it definitely don't reverse the effect and unbold your link because it'll also cause the same sort of content shift because bolding and unbolding can move the text. Number four is maintain target size minimums. Too small a target size for touch or mouse and unpadded links are difficult for a lot of users as it requires a very high level of accuracy to click or touch. The absolute minimum target size should be 44 pixels by 44 pixels, and at least eight pixels between elements, and additional padding is even better. Sometimes you can say, oh, that's more of a development issue, but you as a designer can make sure to annotate it for development. It's a good idea to be extremely aware of how sites are built and communicate best practices to developers as a requirement so that accessibility doesn't like, slip through the cracks on your site. Number five is to make focus states obvious. First, create focus states in your designs. One way to do this is reversing. That's a, a great way to have a very obvious focus state. So is using a contrasting outline. 
but be sure to provide development with everything they need to be successful. Just don't leave anything up for chance. If you don't give developers states, sometimes there might not be any. I've seen this happen where someone had a beautiful design, but they didn't include any hover states or any focus states, and the design came back from development where there just wasn't any. <laughs> it was just you hover over it and nothing happens at all. So you want to make sure that you just don't leave these things up to chance, and as a designer, make sure that you take these things into account. Number six is don't override cursors. Let the user de determine their own cursor size. As you can see here in your system preferences, you can have a normal cursor size and go up to very large. This is very, very important for low vision users because they set the cursor size to the size that they feel most comfortable with, that they can see the best, that helps them navigate properly. Imagine that you're consuming content on the web you open up a web page and your cursor is suddenly gone and replaced by a custom design one. But say you are, have uh, issues with vision and you need that custom cursor and now you can't track visually where you even are. You're suddenly extremely lost. Or even more horrible, imagine that the cursor has suddenly turned into a chicken wing. True story. I was given a site designed to audit for accessibility, which was designed by a client's internal designer. And lo and behold, the cursor was a chicken wing on top of a chicken wing photo. Can you even see the chicken wing? <laughs> this is the stuff of nightmares to me. <laughs> Whether it's a chicken wing or not, imagine how bad it would be for a user with low vision or other cursor needs to have that tool that they use to navigate suddenly change or disappear. So luckily, we, will, we were able to convince the client to ditch the chicken wing and go with a normal cursor that way, you know, people that have um, their cursor set to whatever they feel most comfortable with can see their cursor in the way that they choose. So some link tips that we've just gone over. Don't rely on color for links or communication. Make links e easily distinguishable. Don't bold on hover. Maintain target size minimums. Make focus states obvious. And as a bonus, don't override the cursor. Moving on from links, what about best practices around forms and accessibility? Forms can be a very big source of frustration. I'm sure every one of you here has had a frustration with a form at some point in your life. It takes a very big cognitive load to fill out a form without error. So I have four tips to share today on creating accessible forms. One is placeholder texts are not labels, and they shouldn't replace them. Placeholder labels disappear on focus. Have you ever started filling out a form and then had to click out of the field because you forgot what you were supposed to be inputting into it because the placeholder text was used as the label? Doing this can cause users to lose track of what field they're entering info into, and so labels should always stay visible in any state of the form in order to, to avoid confusion. The only exception here is that if it's a one field email sign up and it's coded properly for accessibility, but me personally, I tend to just avoid that altogether and have proper labels on everything that I do. Another thing to note is that you need to ensure the color contrast between the placeholder text and the input value is obvious. That way it's evident whether the text is real content or a placeholder. You don't want to end up in the situation where you think you've filled out all the fields because you mistake placeholder text for the actual input and then get an error. Number two is explanatory labels help provide more context. I worked on a project where you sign up for an academic portal and you enter a username and an email on sign up. Users were confused about, one, why they needed a username or what email to use to sign up. Instead of just saying username, have a more explanatory label such as your public username. That lets them know that others on the platform will actually see what they put in that field. This can avoid a situation where they might put maybe an old embarrassing high school handle that they used to have into that username field and not know that it was going to be public. Also having an explanatory label such as your campus email assists on letting the user know that the email that they actually need to use to sign up 
is the email that they have from their campus rather than a personal email. So this way they don't get an error thrown at them immediately, making it harder for them to complete the form and to sign up. So when we did this little change, making this obvious really helped up with sign up retention and support requests. Number three is be clear with your required fields. Without requirement indicated, we don't know what is required and we want more context for our decisions. So asterisks are okay, and so, but sometimes they can render small, but you have to be very careful with them, making sure that they're very clear. But clearly stating that something is required is even better. Also, if there are more fields required than not, switching to say optional on the non-required fields works just as well and it reduces clutter. We also want to utilize expanded content for further context. If we are unsure and need more instruction, we don't have any if we don't have any info to have any context to expand. So providing further info in a tooltip from an icon lessens the cognitive load of the form and insists with any rules that are needed without leaving the form. For instance, here we might hide in the tooltip what do you do if you do not have a campus email? Now you don't have to leave the form to get the information or you know, just you know, give up. Lastly, number five when it comes to forms is that if you're going to use placeholder text, make it informative. Don't let your placeholder text be vague and repetitive. Let the placeholder text help the user by giving context clues with the input formatting. So instead of saying phone number, phone number, date, date, email, email, you can have phone number with some placeholder text that gives you context clues at what kind of format you want the phone number in, what kind of format you want the date in, that sort of thing. This is um, very effective in helping people when they're filling out forms. So to sum up our forum tips for today, placeholder text should not replace labels. Explanatory labels provide context. Be clear with your required fields. Utilize expanded content for further context. And if you're using placeholder text, please make it informative for the user. Moving on to color and contrast, here's a section that I'm extremely passionate about because you know, color and contrast are extremely major elements that create design. So you see in a lot of girly, thing today, girly themes today, low contrast elements. It might look pretty, but it's not that easy to read. And even worse is if it gets into a trendy handwriting font. Color and contrast matter. That's why there are guidelines to what we need to adhere to. We haven't talked about the WCAG guidelines yet, um, but they have an accessibility success criterion. This is extremely important for when you're not only trying to audit a site for contrast, but when you're designing from the get-go. Contrast ratios matter. We want to always meet level AA criterion or level AAA when needed. You can find the whole document at w3.org slash tr slash WCAG21. It's great to browse through even though it's a little bit dry, but it's very important. So what we want to try to hit on every single one of our designs is level AA criteria. So the visual presentation of text, at least 18 points or 14 point bold, has to have a contrast ratio of four to five to one. Text and images of a large scale have a contrast ratio of at least three to one. And for non-text, such as different components, User, of user interface like form fields, icons, etc. They we want to have them to have a contrast ratio of at least three to one, so people don't skip over them and they can see them. So always look at your contrast ratio, no matter what. This goes for everything, with just a few exceptions. For AA compliance, you want to have that contrast ratio of at least four point five to one, and you can you see how here on the left. This button that's a light blue doesn't quite meet the success. It's a 2.02 to 1, and it fails everything. But if you darken the button, you can pass a lot of 
it's with a contrast ratio of 4.98 to 1. So this is essential for our users with low vision or vision impairments such as colorblindness. So how do we find out our contrast? Well, if you're using Figma, there is a Figma contrast checker plugin simply titled Contrast. And this, with it, you can select two layers and run to get the contrast ratio and the WCAG compatibility. So if you have, say, a brand color that's very light and you want to darken it for compliance, you can check that contrast and see, okay, I need to darken it so much in order to make it compliant. And there are certain tools that you can use to darken your color. I like to use a quick tool called pinetools.com slash darken color. And here you can add any amount of black into your brand color and get a value that is darker. It also has a light and color tool as well. It's a very rudimentary uh, web tool, but it's great to use for brand colors where a subtle shift in color can mean being AA compliant. Color can get easily complicated, especially when you're working with previously established brand colors. Sometimes it takes showcasing to a client what colors their brand can work in different scenarios. So here's an audit for a client's brand colors for small text to meet AA standards. You can see that the colors sometimes only pass in certain combinations, and you really need to go methodically through and establish what is and is not in compliance in order to get the best understanding of what your design choices can be in using these brand colors. There's a tool called Contrast Grid that will help you with this methodical checking. You can go to contrast-grid.hshapes.com and input your color choices, and it will tell you how they interact together as well as their level of compliance. There's also a Figma plugin for that called Contrast Grid. It's pretty powerful, so I don't necessarily recommend using it for anything client-facing because of how quickly confusing this grid can be to some of them. But for my own sanity when working with color, it's a great resource to get ratios quick. Let's take a look at a use case where I had to audit a client's design where their brand color is orange. Not just orange, but orange on a peach background. Not a white background, a peach background. Orange is a very bright color, and it can be very deceiving where you might think that it has enough contrast, it doesn't. So I had to take a look at its contrast ratios and made some adjustments. Let's just take a look at how difficult orange can be and how nuanced this can be. Take a look at these two buttons, for instance. Which button do you think has the higher contrast? The black text or the white text? Black, white, what? Anybody? I heard both. Okay. Um, if you said the black text on the left, you're right. And it's by a long shot. That's, in, that's kind of crazy to think about how it's like basically double the contrast of the white text on the button. But visually, we tend to like the on the orange button. You know, we kind of avoid sort of the Halloween theme going on. You know, it just makes it a little bit more like clean looking to us. But its contrast is just way lower than the other one. So for this client's audit, I took their brand colors and showed the contrast for all of them when they are combined with each other. I determined that we needed to make some adjustments for our orange. As you can see in the upper left, that it does not pass at all in any way. Not small text, not large text. Like they're, they're, the two colors that they want to use just do not have enough contrast when working together. So we have some options here. We can either lighten and wash out this peach color, or we can kind of darken the orange and keep the peach color. So we're going to give these options to our client in order for our large text to be able to have the contrast ratio that, it ne that is needed. So we end up just darkening the orange just slightly. And you can see here, it is not that big of a difference. But when it goes to grayscale, you can see that it definitely is a little bit darker. But it's just enough to push us over the edge so that we are compliant. The difference is very subtle, but it does solve our contact, contrast dilemma here. So you don't have to read all this, but when I presented to the client after documenting the audit, I'm like, okay, we now have this option to use. Even though we had to modify the brand color very slightly, we could keep the peach background. 
you know, this is a very controversial thing sometimes because when people have their brand colors, they are in love with them and they don't want to modify them. But sometimes in order to keep the aesthetic, you might have to make some little changes in order to keep the client happy and make sure you reach compliance. A great basic primer ebook for diving into the world of color and contrast is Color Accessibility Workflows by Jerry Cody. And you can get it on abookapart.com. It's just a very small primer and um, it's great for just wetting your feet into the world of color accessibility workflows. But if you're looking to dig down deeper into color theory on the web, I highly recommend the website colorandcontrast.com. There is a ton of information on color and visual perception. I have learned a lot from this site when it comes to color theory, and I think it's a, a great resource. So while we're still on the subject of color and contrast, we also want to make sure that we think about user settings for dark mode and light mode. In their system settings on a Mac, they can set appearance dark or light as their preference. And we can actually utilize this and create beautiful versions of our site that honors that user's preference. You can see how this is targeted with the preferred color scheme media theory query. We can really pay attention to our site designs no matter what mode the user has set and create a great experience in every situation by loading additional styles. We can also make sure we want to do this as well for high contrast mode. In a user system settings, they can select increased contrast as their preference. This lets the user determine that they want everything to be high contrast as much as possible. And as designers, we can utilize this setting and induce, introduce a more high contrast style sheet, such as one that is actually AAA compliant, further upping the accessibility standard for these users. And we, we can do this by targeting the preferred contrast more in the media query um, and introducing an alternative color scheme inside that media query. This is very important for low vision users. So I'm only going to briefly talk about um, content and accessibility because, you know, sometimes the designers, we have control over content and sometimes we don't. But we can all really know, we all really know that too much information can definitely lead to cognitive overload. And the structure of the content matters greatly in reading and accessibility. No one wants to get lost, get frustrated or confused. No one wants to have to think too much. No one has to not be able to access what they need. Or no one wants to read or listen to a novel when it can be explained simply. So we have some content tips today. Um, we want to provide skip to nav or skip to main content links for screen readers. We want to simplify and keep our paragraph links to a minimum. If we want to provide deep content, we can link to it on a separate page where a user can go if they want to dive deeper. But no one wants to read or listen to paragraphs and paragraphs of text and they're likely most not going to most just not going to do it anyway. They're going to skip it um, and not even read it or skim it. But people who use re screen readers will often listen to text sped up. And if your site is wordy, can you imagine the amount of time it would take for someone to get through it? A lot of time. So keep your um, content simple and your paragraph links to a minimum. Also, don't use complex words or be superfluous in your writing. Make sure your writing is simple. This is also good for non-native speakers, and it will translate more accurately with language tools. Maintain a consistent navigation so users don't get lost. Ensure all necessary information is visible and accessible to users on, de on devices that don't support hover states, such as touch screens, and that we don't, so we don't hide any content under hovers. This obscures information for people who might need it. And always, always use clear headings that are, that are in order without skipping any. Don't go from H1 to H4. Really just organize your content into clear and orderly sections, and that will tremendously help screen readers navigate your site. So alt text is used with images to describe images to low or non-vision users. We want to make sure that 
all images are, that are part of the content have alt text. So this is highly important to convey your content. But we don't want to put alt text on images that are not necessary for information. No one wants to hear a description of design element like decorative squirrel when you can just leave that off. Make sure your alt text and copy complement rather than duplicate each other. Say you have a website that talks in detail all about Jupiter's moons and lists their names. And next to it, you have an image of Jupiter and its moons. You don't need to name all the individual moons in the photo's alt text, as names are already noted in the content. So users using screen readers do not need to listen to a list of the moons named twice in order to understand what's in the photo. Video and audio are important content types. Some tips here include that you always want to include transcripts and subtitles. This is very helpful for users, whether a user has permanent hearing loss or sometimes are in an environmental situation such as a public setting without headphones. You always need to include transcripts and subtitles so your content can be consumed. And use audio descriptors in your videos whenever you can. This could come in a form of a voiceover describing what someone in the video is doing. Bonus points for ASL is included in your video. You can reach even a wider audience that way. And I want to empathize this strongly. Do not autoplay your videos. This is incredibly jarring to some users. Put the power into the user's hands. Let them control if the videos play or not. There are many resources about audio and video, and you can access videos about good practices on rootedandrights.org slash access that. It has some great um, resources for including transcripts and audio descriptions. And lastly, when it comes to content, try to keep it gender neutral. If you ever need to illustrate a persona for instructional content, keep it gender neutral and call the person maybe Jaden Doe instead of John or Jane. There's just no reason not to take this one extra step towards inclusiveness. Motion is making a comeback in web design. CSS is making it pretty easy to do. How are people with cognitive impairment, like brain injuries or learning disabilities, vestibular disorders and seizures, motion can be extremely jarring and making people confused or even sick. I'm not advocating against motion. It can be beautiful, tasteful, and even helpful for the user. But something we need to be aware of is the reduced motion setting. A user that needs reduced motion to make accessing content easier can set reduced motion in their Mac accessibility settings. And with this setting, we can target CSS animations, parallax, and just to slow or eliminate certain motions. We can use, do this by using the media query, prefers reduced motion. With this media query, we can target animations and transitions and basically respect the user's wishes to not get disoriented or sick when accessing our site's content. If you want to dive deep into motion, its implications, tools, and best practices, I highly recommend the talk Making Motion Inclusive by Val Head. Check it out on eventapart.com. It's fabulous. Dyslexia is also something that we need to take into account. A lot of people struggle with dyslexia, and it can make reading comprehension extremely difficult. Luckily, there is a font that's open, an open font license called Open Dyslexic, which is created specifically so the letters have weighted bottoms, assisting the brain in comprehension and readability. Anybody can use this font. It's open source. And this font is starting to gain traction, and it's even seen on the Kindle app. Here are some screenshots of my Kindle app on my iPhone. I open the font preferences, and I change the book to Open Dyslexic. And that is just, um, it's a great tool for people that um, need some help in reading. How great is that? There is even a browser extension for the font that changes copy in web pages. So we aren't going to, I'm not saying that we need to make all of our <laughs> copy open dyslexic font, but how, so how does this apply to us as designers? Well, we want to make sure our site can be altered by browser extensions and that all of our content is in text form and can be changed by the browser extension. That, and so that way, none of our texts are inside images, which we all know we shouldn't be doing this anyway. But I wanted to let you all know that this tool is out there and people are utilizing it. And it's pretty revolutionary, revolutionary for some people, especially for um, children learning how to read.
So you've been putting in all this hard work to make your designs accessible. How do we make sure that we hand them off to our design development that, to development so that nothing gets lost in translation? Well, we can annotate our design files. We can an annotate them for accessibility before handoff. You can find many kits for annotation in Figma, such as this accessibility annotation kit by Indeed, or you can build your own. Handing off designs to development with as much documentation as possible ensures that all the effort that you're putting into creating a more accessible web is not lost. This way, the site will be built with the best accessibility standards as possible while also maintaining design integrity. There's really no right or wrong way to do this, um, but just do your best to pay attention to detail. Work with your development team to determine what types of annotations they appreciate on handoff and make sure that the communication is best as possible. And always with your design, before handing off, create an accessibility checklist. A 11yproject.com has a great checklist for your site or any sites that you might be auditing. Be sure to check out this really um, informative site and make sure that your designs meet their criteria. A, the topic of accessibility is just so huge that I can never cover everything in this talk. So in case you missed it yesterday, check out Sally Thone's talk, A Rookie's Reflection, It's Never Too Late to Learn. She has a ton of accessibility resources and her enthusiasm is very inspiring. So we've gone through a lot of content today, but really what we need to remember is that no matter where you are in your team, whether you're a design, dev, QA, content, or if you're even building um, on WordPress solo, we need to all work together in order to make the web a better place for everyone. So when it comes to design, designing with accessibility in mind, it takes a lot of effort in a small village, but it's so worth it, because in the end, you have contributed to a more inclusive web. I'm a forever student, and I've loved getting to learn more about designing for accessibility, and so I really hope that this talk has inspired you in some way to put some of these practices in place. So thank you. Do we have time for questions? Three minutes, does anybody have any? Um, Whoa. What do you do, what, what, do you, what is your approach when you have a client, I know you do consulting or audits or whatever, when you present that information to a client, like your orange and peach, and you're like, look, mm -hmm. and they're like, yeah, no. Or they, you know, say, well, that's not as, you know, they want accessibility, but they're like resistant to it for design purposes or for whatever reason. What's, what's your approach to that? Um, a lot of times you can talk to them about how they might, will be limiting their audience and sort of like get to, with them on a business level. Um, but when it comes to clients that I work with, we talk about accessibility upfront from the very beginning. And I think that's very important. When you're talking about doing some designs for somebody, talk about it up front, up first, and say, this is a focus that I have, making the web a better place for everybody, and just letting you know that this is gonna be a focus of your designs, or the focus of your audit, and making sure that everybody knows that that is something that is gonna be established up front is also a good way to convince them. One more. You, <clears throat> you mentioned in your talk a color contrast plugin, but I went to WordPress.org and I put in color contrast and I couldn't find it. Oh, it's a plugin for Figma, the design tool. Okay. It's not okay. for WordPress.org. Okay. And then for checking color contrast for your website, which tool do you recommend the most to give you that number score? Um, you can use the one that I mentioned, the contrast grid. It's an um, online web page, and you can just input in your numbers, and it'll give you contrast. So if I Google contrast grid, mm -hmm. I'll find it? I think it's contrast-grid.com. Okay. Um, and basically, you can take your hex values and put them in, and then it'll give you the values. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And I hope everybody has a great rest of the day and enjoys lunch. Thank you, Sarah.
Hello, 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 WordCamp, and welcome to the last session before lunch. Hey, speaking of lunch, lunch is outdoors today because the weather is much better, but if for whatever reason um, you don't want to eat outdoors, you are welcome to use the session rooms. You do not have to sit on the floor in the hallway. There are tables in the back. It's okay to eat in here. Um, we have a couple more announcements before we get started. First, we'd like to thank our sponsors whose contributions are making WordCamp possible. Please take a moment to visit them in the sponsor hall as you're able. Um, join us tonight for the official WordCamp US social, the artist formerly known as the after party. <laughs> it starts at seven. Um, I think there may still be some questions about weather accommodations for that, yes? So stay tuned for that announcement um, whenever it comes. Uh, tomorrow, we would love to see you for Contributor Day, starting at 9 a.m. Look for folks wearing a yellow lanyard, and they'll be able to help you if you have questions. Don't forget to use the hashtag WCUS when you share your photos on social. We would love to see them. You can also share your photos directly to the official collaborative photo album. There are signs with a QR code for more information. And our next session is... DEIB, Uncomfortable Truths of Belonging, with Cami Chaos. Um, before I finish introducing Cami, I want to let you know that there's a lot of room up here. You can move forward and still maintain a respectful, pandemic-appropriate social distance from your <laughs> colleagues, all of whom are wearing masks. Um, Cami Chaos champions diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts for the talent division of Automatic, a company that she has successfully supported through a myriad of WordPress community-facing and internal-facing roles since 2013. For more than a decade, she has consistently brought an empathetic and collaborative ethos to the WordPress community and its gatherings. Cami writes irregularly on CamiChaos.com, <laughs> Chaos.blog, and more consistently on Twitter, or if words somehow fail her, Instagram. Thanks, Cami. Thank you. Hi, all. I'm Cami Chaos. Uh, I want to acknowledge that I haven't done this in front of people in almost three years. So, hi. Welcome to my nightmare. It's really lovely to see you all. I want to thank the organizers and all of you for having me here. What I'm talking about today is super important to me. Um, it is, in fact, so important to me that I think it needs to be important to all of you and everyone else. But for a number of reasons, it seems to fall through the cracks more often than not, and that is D, E, I, and B. But before I do that, I want to tell you just a little bit about myself, because I genuinely do like to know a little bit more about the person who's about to talk at me for 20 minutes. So um, my name is Cami Chaos, as I said. I'm from Portland, Oregon. I'm a mother. I'm a daughter. I'm a partner. I am a cat guardian to an amazing elderly kitty. And I'm also the person who leads the DEI cross team in talent at Automatic, which is why I'm here to talk to you about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. But first, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Today, I honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands I stand on, the Kumeyaay. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. The land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As visitors to and members of the San Diego, San Diego community, we acknowledge this legacy. Um, for those of you at home and for those of you who might like more information on this when you're at your homes, if you're interested in learning more about the land on which you reside, please go to native-land.ca. All right, as I've acknowledged, this is awkward for me. Um, those of you who know me know that I want everyone to feel as comfortable and safe as possible. I've spent most of the last decade trying to create safe spaces, uh, comfortable spaces for people here within the WordPress community. And sometimes I did an amazing job. I'm not even going to pretend I didn't. Um, and sometimes I did not do a great job. And when I didn't do a great job, I made a point of working hard to do better. Uh, but sometimes even better didn't feel like it was enough. And sometimes not doing a great job was because I like to feel comfortable and I like to make others feel comfortable. But it turns out that just letting some people sit in their own comfort leaves a lot of other people on the outside looking in, feeling excluded, feeling unwelcome, feeling unrepresented, and feeling othered, and feeling uncomfortable, which is what I want to avoid in the first place, right? 
So I would like to point out to you that if you are not being intentionally inclusive, you are being unintentionally exclusive. So if you only take one single thing away from my talk today, please let it be the DEIB work belongs to everyone. It is not just work for underrepresented and marginalized people. In most cases, people from marginalized groups are the ones who are doing all of the work. And that is because if we don't do that work, that work is going never to get done. So as an example, as a woman, which is a single part of my identity, not the whole of it, when I do the work of promoting feminism and fighting sexism, I'm doing it in large part because I've lived in a world that has treated women like second class citizens my entire life. I have been the only woman sitting at a table. I have been the only woman at a conference. I have been the only woman on a panel. Um, and it's not something that I have relished. Sometimes I wanted to stay home and stay quiet and not be a part of this giant machine that doesn't seem to understand me. But I showed up anyway so that even one other woman who showed up or one person from a marginalized group that showed up would know that they weren't the only other. So. This part is specifically for you folks who sound like, look like, present like those who have built this system that we live in. I want you to hear today that DEIB is your job. It's your job too. You need to do the work if we really want to make this community a better place. I'm used to hearing from people in positions of power and privilege that they do not feel comfortable engaging in DEI work and I understand because I don't feel comfortable engaging in DEI work either. So as we dive into the rest of this talk, please hear that the work of building a more diverse, inclusive, equitable community where everyone can feel a sense of belonging especially is the work of those, especially uh, with privilege, and it's never going to feel comfortable for you. And now I'm gonna zip through the rest of my talk as quickly as I can without talking too fast, I hope. Uh, because the part of this that I really enjoy the most is discussion. And I don't feel like DEI should be done from a soapbox. I feel like it should be a conversation with all of you. So, some definitions. Diversity is highlighted when we look at the differences in a group of people. The opposite of a diverse group is a homogenous group. So when we talk about diversity in this context, we mean people with different lived experiences from a range of different social and ethnic backgrounds and of different races, genders, sexual orientations, religions, castes, education levels, income, partner status, just to name a few pieces. And I would be remiss if I didn't include another very important part of the diversity puzzle, which is disability. Disability is often overlooked in diversity. I want to call this out specifically uh, there is no diversity without disability and accessibility. In this case, we're looking at diversity as the differences within a group of people. A single person, me, myself, I'm a single person. Um, I cannot be diverse from myself because I'm just me. Uh, there are two E words that are often used interchangeably here and they are not interchangeable. We've got equity and equality. They're not the same thing. When we talk about DEI, we're specifically talking about equity. Equality means each individual or group of people is given the same resources or opportunities. Equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and different needs, and sometimes different resources need to be allocated to meet those needs and to give people opportunities for an equal outcome. So I'd like you to imagine we're standing near a park and we're looking at two kids and there's a fence. And one of the kids can see over the fence. You can see their whole face. And the other kid is down by the fence and he's just, he's down, he, he can't see anything at all. Mm. Next to them are two crates. Now, if we wanted to have equality, we would give each of those two kids one of those crates and they could stand on them. And then the taller kid would still be able to see over the fence and watch the ball game. And the shorter kid, well, I hate to tell you, but they're still eye level with the fence. So equity is if we give both of those boxes to the shorter kid, because then guess who can see over the fence? Does that make sense? Okay. 
Inclusion is the action or state of including or of being included with a group or a structure. It doesn't necessarily reference how the person feels when they're being included. It's kind or fair. It just speaks to someone being included. Um, we need to make sure that it is more than that. It's about making a place that works for others based on their needs and their lived experiences, not just on the lived experiences of the people who created the situation. And then sometimes we tack the letter B onto the end of DE and I. And I've told you that I make silly mistakes. Um, the first time I saw a DEIB conference, I assumed that it was DEI in business. And I was like, oh yes, that's for me. I'm in business. I do DEI, fantastic. Uh, but I Googled it and I started to learn more. And now I understand that it speaks to belonging and making space where people are able to bring their whole authentic selves. Um, to their community, to their work, to their roles, and ensuring that they feel welcome, accepted, and valued. And in another quick comparison, if you want someone to feel like they belong, you don't ask them to make themselves at home in your awkward space to them. You find out what you can do to make it feel more like a home to them. Okay, now that I have played the part of the DEIB dictionary, and we have defined some basic terms so we're all on the same page, I'm going to tell you that to some people, this stuff just doesn't matter. They have reasons, and they think that they are sound, and they make sense to them, and they go along in business the way that they have always got along in their lives, uh, with a homogenous group of like-minded individuals. And I have heard people complain that this is business, it's not a family, it's not a support group, and that business is survival of the fittest, and something, well, they should just work a little bit harder for it. But that is not how equity works, right? So when you ask me why DEI is important, my first and visceral reaction is to tell you that it is the right thing to do. But as a person I already shared that I want people to feel welcome and included and comfortable, it goes beyond that. I want people to feel safe and wanted and welcome. I want them to feel seen. I want them to feel heard and to know that their input matters. Our communities are made better spaces for the wealth of diversity that we can welcome. And I will do whatever is needed to make that happen so that I can make this space that we're all sharing uh, a space where we can all be together and be our true selves. But that's feelings, not business. So let me tell you the business side of it. In this case, the right thing to do is also the smart business move to do. When you have one person, you have a single perspective and you have their skill set and you have their life experience and everything that they bring to the table. But one person is one person and they're going to build something for themselves. They're going to build who's deeply involved in their lives, and that's what it's gonna work for. When you bring in a second person, do you want another person who's just like the first person? Do you want that same skill set? Do you want that same life experience? I would prefer someone with a different life experience, with different training, with different knowledge, with different skills, uh, not someone who's learned all the same things. And it has been proven that more diverse and inclusive teams are more innovative and build better products a homogenous group of people will most often reinforce their own experiences and expectations, and it just becomes an echo chamber. So back to the beginning. When I was thinking, if you're a person in a place of privilege, don't ask other humans, particularly underrepresented or marginalized individuals, to do this work for you. It's your job. Uh, that's asking them to do emotional labor. labor. And so if someone says something that comes off as sexist, racist, ableist, and a marginalized individual calls them out on it, the person who has said the thing should apologize sincerely. They should then research how they can do better and move along. Don't ask the person who called you out on it to teach you to be a better person. Everyone will be super duper glad that you want to be a feminist or anti-racist or an LGBTQIA ally or someone who promotes accessibility, but it's not their job to tell you. I know that this is challenging. This has been a journey and a struggle for me as well. If as a person with privilege in a dominant culture, which I am, you think that this is challenging for you, marginalized people, which I also am, have spent every moment of their life being part of a marginalized group. That's their lived experience. Now, there's an exception to the don't ask them. You can't just ask someone to do it. Like, don't tweet something that's racist, 
When someone calls you out on it and says it's racist, turn around and ask the person why it's racist. It's not okay. You have the internet. You can Google it. Um, <laughs> but you can and you should pay experts from marginalized groups for their expertise and advice. As a woman, I don't wake up in the morning not living in a patriarchal society on some days. So I'm tired of fighting for women's equity and equality. I don't want to fight for my rights. I just want someone to hand me like the best gluten-free chocolate chip cookie that has ever existed and tell me that from now on I'm going to be paid the same as my straight white male counterparts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to hear that from this moment forward, people will not interrupt me when I'm speaking in meetings. And oh, by the way, the brilliant idea that I shared 10 minutes ago that someone just rephrased will be credited to me and not the person who just repeated back what I said. I don't want to help men fix a systemic problem with sexism because I've spent my entire life dealing with the emotional damage that it's caused. It's the same for every person who's a member of a marginalized group but potentially 10,000 times worse. Because we haven't even talked about intersectionality yet, but you can have privilege and be part of a marginalized group. You can have privilege and be part of many marginalized groups. We don't have one single identifying trait as a human that makes us who we are. We're all built up of different parts and pieces of our identities. So I'm going to repeat to you what I tell my daughter when she asks me a question that she could easily find the answer to herself, Google it. When I was a kid, it was, what does this word mean or how do I spell it? And my parents' version of it was, you know we have a dictionary. Google has way more information than the dictionary did. We have vast resources at our fingertips most days, so if you're not sure of something, if you don't know what something means, if you're concerned that something that you are saying or doing is or could be perceived as racist, sexist, classist, ableist, exclusionary, whatever it is, do the research, look it up, and see what you can find out online. There are also these things called books. We have them both in digital and like tree format, <laughs> and there are a lot of them out there. There are essays, there are blog posts, there's more information than you can shake a stick at. I know that we all have a lot on our plate, but this is something that really matters. And the more people from power and privilege that work toward this, the more that it's going to be seen as something that's valid and important. So read an essay, take a course, read a book, uh, take a training, hire an expert. And if you need someone to educate you, be willing to pay them for their expertise. This is not a comfortable space for most people. The only people I've ever known who this is a truly comfortable space Four are people who love disruption. And I don't thrive on disruption. I should, my last name is Chaos. Uh, <laughs> but I don't, I just want this to be the same level of comfort. I want everyone to be able to feel right. So before we move on at Automatic, we have employees in, last I checked, 93 countries around the world. Uh, dealing with localized diversity, which is what we usually talk about here in the United States, is difficult enough. But when we're talking about our community, the WordPress community, automatic, uh, dealing with globalized diversity is exponentially more difficult because it's hard to exactly put your finger on what that looks like. I know that on any given day at work or in my personal life or both, I'm going to make a mistake, but I've made a promise to myself and to others uh, that when I mess up, I'm going to own it. I'm going to find a way to do better with every iteration that I work toward. And uh, I told you just recently not to just ask yourself or to ask someone, go pay somebody, but I have the opportunity here to answer some questions and to have a conversation with all of you, which is the part I was truly looking forward to. So if you have questions, I would absolutely love to hear them. Tiffany here can uh, bring a mic to you. And if there are any questions from the live stream, I would love to include all of you as well. If there is something that you don't feel comfortable asking or talking about, I understand. We're lucky enough, if we're lucky enough for this conversation to go long and there's not enough time, please feel free to reach out to me, Twitter, Instagram, uh, my email address at work. So Cami Chaos, pretty much everywhere. And uh, let's open up a conversation.
You mentioned intersectionality. Can you define or explain what that means and what that is? I should have prepared for this one. Uh, <laughs> I just told her she could ask. Come on. <laughs> no, oh, oh, yeah, I can. Intersectionality are all the different disparate components of a person or a thing that make up the whole of them. So when I talk about intersectionality with myself as an example, I'm a woman. I did not go to college. I am a mother. I am a single mother. I have a gluten allergy. I have thyroid disease. I have high blood, so I'm disabled as well as being a woman, but I'm also white. And I'm born in the United States and raised in California, and I apparently have what they call newscaster speak, um, <laughs> which is a whole level of privilege I never knew about until I was in speech therapy. Uh, and so when we look at all those pieces, I consider myself to be a highly privileged person in some ways. But in other ways, I'm really, really looked down upon and fall behind and marginalized. And so each person needs to kind of look at themselves and pull together what it is that brings them together, whether it's their sexual orientation, their race, their gender, their caste, their education, uh, the people that they choose to associate with. It all comes together to make the package that is you as a unique individual. Does that? Yeah, okay, thank you. And I, I apologize, I, do I need to repeat the question or we'd have her on the recording? I believe the, uh, the microphone is being picked up okay. for the live stream. Okay, fantastic. Oh, and I should have, Ali, I should have had you say your name, but if you can tell us who you are, I would love to, to know who I'm talking to. Hi, um, I am Cassandra. Hi. And I want to ask you what... Um, strategies you have used as a woman to ask for a raise Ooh, i can only <laughs> i can only partially answer this question uh, every business is different the way that employment works is going to be unique to every company my best advice is when you go in for a new job push the limit ask for as much well, find out what your white male colleagues might be making and ask for more than they're being paid. Um, because it's kind of a fact in our current hiring system that most companies are more willing to spend more money on retain, um, hiring new employees than they are into retaining them. So I would say give yourself frequent self-feedback. Make sure that you log all of the good work you're doing. Have like a brag sheet for yourself. And when you go to ask for a raise, because you know you deserve it, bring all of that to the person. And if they're like, no, that's not possible, the question I like to ask is, how do we make it possible? I'm doing the work. So that's not something that I feel super self-confident with, but that is what I have tried to do for myself. Along the same lines of, my name is Federico. Hello. From Portable. Along the same lines of that question, uh, what are some things we can do to, I feel like the, the salary situation, its birth is in the cloud of not knowing what somebody else makes, I regardless of, you know, yeah. anything else. You so know, this, what I'm about to share are, I don't often say this, these are my thoughts and feelings, not the thoughts and feelings of my employer. I believe that in order to have equity, equality in salary, we need to have salary transparency. We need to know what everyone is making. Yeah. I have a bunch of coworkers in the room right now, and I could not tell you what any of them make. None of them know what I make. Okay, maybe I might be able to tell you what a couple of them make, but not most of them. Um, and it's just something that is not transparent in, in the company that I work for. And I am starting to see more of it. I like seeing job listings specifically that have their salary ranges on there. I think that every company should have something at least accessible to the internal employees, even if it's not listed by name, but listed by title, what everyone is making. Um, it, it's there. 
because it's the only way that we're ever going to be able to hold our leadership accountable for the way that we are being uh, not just paid, but being given other compensation as well. So yeah, I think the only solution is transparency. And uh, So fight for that, people. Come on, <laughs> let's have some salary transparency. Hi, I'm Ebony. Hi, Ebony. <laughs> um, can you tell us about an experience where you, where you had someone say something super racist or sexist to you and a privileged person was like, no, that's not going to happen? I'm fortunate. So my partner is also in technology. Um, and he is a fierce, I have, to, I have to admit, I love a straight white man. I love a straight white man with a huge college education. He's incredibly intelligent. He comes from a privileged background. His mother was a psychologist. Um, but he does not take crap. He doesn't, no, he allows no crap for anyone that is in his sphere. He, uh, he incubates and accelerates startups, and he is like a mother duck protective of all of these startups and founders that he works with. And so I have seen him prevent that conversation from going awry many, many times. Um, but sometimes it's just as simple as a woman. How many of us have been told, oh, you're so pretty when you smile. Should you smile more? Uh, that is the one that I have seen shot down both by him and by a lot of other men that are in my sphere. Please don't ask her to do that. That's inappropriate. Um, that's the one that comes to mind most readily. The thing is, is that there's that simple intervention, right? The person has to have enough privilege to feel safe intervening in a situation. Um, and that's something that, uh, if it's okay, I'm gonna rip on for a second. Uh, if you're a person of privilege, or you're a person who is not scared and you see something happen, you can say something. You can say something right then and there. Or you can distract. Uh, if you ever see a woman who is being hit upon or a BIPOC individual who is being harassed, you can walk up to them and say, hey, I haven't seen you in so long. How are you doing? Oh my gosh, let's catch up. You don't have to know them. As a woman, if someone walks up to me when I'm being harassed and does that to me, I'm like, oh, girlfriend, hello, I haven't seen you in ever, and I'm gonna walk away with them. I'm not teaching you how to kidnap people. Please don't do that if you're a bad person. Um, but we need to intervene more. Everyone needs to intervene more. If you do not feel safe intervening, I feel like we have an obligation to do something. If it's a dangerous situation, record it ask someone for help. I'm not really, I mean, there are times at which you must call the police, but sometimes that's also going to cause the situation to be inflamed and escalate, and we don't want that. Um, you can also call people in. If it's someone that you know that's doing the, the bad thing, you pull them aside and you say, I didn't want to embarrass you. I know that's uncomfortable. But this is a problem, and this is why it's a problem. This particular method I use particularly when I see uh, inappropriate language. If I see someone say, I was talking to a realtor and they have a house listed with a master bathroom and a master bedroom. And I was like, oh, can we call that the primary please? I don't like, that's not comfortable. It's not appropriate. And they were like, why isn't that appropriate? And I was like, well, slave culture for one. I mean, can, can you just change your listings? It's not appropriate. Um, and that's a safe space to do that in. But I, I, I personally prefer not to be on the internet. You can't do that, it's horrible. It is horrible, you can't do that. I'm gonna tell you that privately. Um, and then from my own experience, uh, we have sabbaticals at Automatic. And I was preparing for my sabbatical. Uh, and I was working on the community team at the time and I was handing off a lot of other work to my teammates so that I could enjoy my three months off. And a person that I was working with uh, was upset that I was going to be leaving. He thought it was inappropriate that I was taking maternity leave at this time and was upset and wanted to know exactly who he could be working with because I didn't have a name for him. I was like, just email this address, it's fine. And I wasn't pregnant. I wasn't going on parental leave. I, was, I had earned a sabbatical for working five years at a company. It was part of my package. Uh, and I, uh, angry keyboard, 
I wrote the most vicious, angry response. How dare you? This is completely inappropriate. You don't know me well enough to make assumptions. You should never make assumptions. Edit down, edit down, edit down, walk away. Whew, no, I went and had lunch. I think I took the afternoon off and came back in the evening. Uh, I was not okay, and if someone had sent that to any other woman I know, I wouldn't have been okay. My teammates had to jump in. I was like, I need someone to edit this, please. I am obviously having a lot of feelings. I don't want to be cruel to this person. I want to take it as an opportunity to teach him. But uh, so in that case, I had a lovely support system that gathered and helped edit my piece until the only really angry thing was it is inappropriate to make assumptions about the reason that a woman or anyone else in this community is taking a leave of absence. So, I mean, the best way to do it is with words and bravery and education. I think we have one up here and we've got one right here. We've got one right here. We've got people. Thank you for talking with me. I've missed humans. Uh, someone back here has been waiting oh, as well. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Tiffany. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, my name's Adrian. Hi. Um, so just a quick background on the question before I ask it. Uh, my company, probably like a lot of other people's companies, got really fired up about DEI right after the George Floyd murder. Yeah. And we started a committee, we brought in consultants. And then over the years, from lack of, I'd say, uh, commitment from leadership, not entirely their fault, lots of business changes, those sort of things that took their focus away. The, the there just wasn't a lot that the, there just grew like less and less enthusiasm around it and yeah. so the people on the committee sort of fizzled out and went to do other things and how would you recommend working to try to build that culture from because I, it feels like it needs to come from the top down in it, terms of the support so how would you recommend trying to build that from the top down when you're not in the top <laughs> You said the magic words. We need to build DEI from the top down. And in most places, we are building it from the bottom up. Um, especially when we have leadership that is a group, a homogenous group of people, they are going to look for qualities in other leaders that match their own. And so then we wind up with an even more homogenous group of leaders. And even if this is important to them, on a theoretical basis, it's not something that's touching their everyday lives. Um, and so you need a strong advocate that is willing to talk to leadership and talk to leadership and talk to leadership and talk to leadership until they get agreement. Or you need to have a really strong relationship with your HR who will help you build ERGs so that you can start to push the work to move forward. I don't think that that's the ideal solution because once again, that's asking marginalized people to do the work, uh, but it is a path forward. I think it's just something, as much awareness as you can raise of the importance of DE&I with leadership is what you do. Uh, I wish everyone treated DEI the same way they treated revenue. When we're making decisions, we should be looking at what's best for the company as a whole individual unit or the community as a whole unit. And what's best for the community is for us to diversify and to have more people from more backgrounds so that we have more voices. And with WordPress specifically, truly build a more inclusive and better product. Um, so again, a lot of the answers to these questions are you have to you have to do the work and you have to recruit other people to do the work with you and you have to convince leadership. I feel like I'm like starting a union right now. Um, <laughs> you have to convince leadership that that's the way to do it because no one else is going to. You have to assume that you have to do this by yourself. And I hate that I just said that. Hi there. Hi. I'm Bree. Um, so the question I wanted to ask is, as someone who is a part of marginalized groups and who also works towards DEI initiatives, there are often times when the, the world seems to fight back at you. Oh, yeah. And that crushing weight of defeat uh, often gets to be a lot. 
So mm-hmm. how, how do you how do you deal with that? What are what are your coping mechanisms for feeling as if the world a lot of the world is fighting against you? Uh, when we talked about intersectionality, I did not mention the part that I have crippling anxiety. Um, I've had anxiety my entire life since I was a very small child. I had my first panic attack when I was three years old. Um, so self-care is pretty important to me. Um, I am well taken care of. I have an incredibly supportive community. It takes a village to care for a cami. Some of my villages right here being awesome. Uh, and so I really prioritize self-care, but not self-care like go shopping, get your nails done. Maybe that's it. I, I like to get my nails done, um, but you need to make time for yourself. We make time for everything else. Intersectionality, again, as a mother, my first priority is always my daughter, right? I love her to pieces. She is always my main first priority, but in order for her to be my priority, I have to focus on other things. In order for work to be my priority, I have to be a whole person. I can't be broken. Um, And so take time off work. If you are lucky enough that you are a person who gets PTO, don't let it go to waste. Uh, Set boundaries. I know that there's a lot of talk right now about silent quitting, and that is complete crap. We are paid to do the job that we are paid to do. We're not paid to go the extra mile. They want us to go the extra mile. Let's get some salary transparency and pay us more. If we want to, we might just want to just do the work we're doing and be respected and appreciated for it. So set boundaries. Make sure that you are setting just as much time to take care of yourself as you are to taking care of anyone else. Make sure that you're getting the mental health and emotional support that you need. There's a huge shortage of therapists right now, but if you are engaged in DEI work, I beg of you, please have a mental health professional to work with because you are going to be battered. And that's just the fact of the battery. It sucks and it's horrible but you're gonna need emotional support. So make sure you have a village. And if you can reach out to like-minded people and make sure that you support them just as much as they support you. Because I find with some people being supportive of them is as healing and beautiful for me um, as me being supported by someone else. And play with cats. Uh, she's been hand up for a little while and then you're next sir hi this is a question for you or anyone else who may have a good answer in the audience Um, I'm a biracial lesbian who has so many times had white people straight people dudes DM me on Twitter wanting me to help them through their journey of being a (laughs) not racist sexist homophobic person and I, d- I don't want to help them. You know, like, I don't yeah. want to don't want to spend my free time <laughs> helping them. Um, but what can I say in that moment that isn't angry or, you know, I want to say, like, okay, $5 million an hour, I'll help you. Um, and, but, like, I want to do something that is impactful in that moment. Here is somebody for, you know, it may be – their intentions are – their intentions a, are good. They their want intentions to not be are to be better. To right. They want to be a better yeah. person. They may be doing it in an ignorant way. They may be asking me for my time when I, you know, don't yeah. want to get. What can I reply in that moment that is helpful, but not like expending of my like energy and time? I would encourage you to write up like a. How many of us use the autocomplete things? Like, and I think we only have a few minutes left, right? Um, a lot of us use the autocomplete things or have copy and paste. I would write up a, a two sentence statement that you can just copy and paste in to respond that expresses that you are being asked to do emotional labor that is not appropriate, but then unfortunately encourage them towards a resource that you find. Like just pick one resource and send that that way. I have seen people put that resource in their Twitter profiles and in their blog profiles and just say, if you're going to ask me about this, go here. Um, If you have a friend who does paid DEI consulting, pimp them out. That was an inappropriate phrase I should not have used. Let me apologize. Thank you for your apology, Tammy. Thank you. Share their information and promote them within the community. 
Apologies, people. See, I will do better next time. Um, and I believe, do we have time for one more question? Okay, we've got another question over here. Did that help? Yeah, no. Yeah. Send them to Allie. Everybody, if you have this problem, send them to Allie, but they have to pay her. Yeah. Okay? Hi, my name is David. Thank you for this amazing talk. Thank um, you, David. I have a question. Love for your feedback or thoughts. Are there uh, suggestions that you have for ways to meaningf meaningfully measure or quantify the level of DEIB in an organization so that someone somewhere doesn't check a box and say, yeah, we did that? Yes. Yes, there is. Yes, there are. Um, first of all, we have to have the check boxes, right? If we don't have the check boxes, we don't know if we're making improvement. The problem is, is most of the time we check the box and we're like, cool, I'm done with that now. I did it. Hey, did you see that? We got up to 25% women and 10% BIPOC individuals in our entire company. This is fantastic. That's not fantastic. That still sucks. That's like the minimum, right, that you're supposed to reach. And so I, I, the best suggestion I can have is just like I was talking about, if you're going to make a big decision for your company, you're going to run it past your CFO, right? You're going to run it past your chief marketing officer. You're going to run it past your chief technology officer. Run it past your DEI specialist and say, hey, what do we need to be doing here? Um, but one of the things that makes this really challenging, especially on an international scale, is that in order to make that progress and to be able to quantify it, we have to have demographic information. And there are questions you can ask in some places and can't ask in other places. It's different in every country. Sometimes it's different from state to state. So I would partner with a great tool or company that specializes in that. There are a few. There's one that I'm starting to work with that I'm not going to share the name of because I'm not fully. I think they're going to be amazing, but I'm not sure yet. Um, but I would also encourage you to make sure you're asking the right questions for the right reasons. Don't just gather a bunch of demographic information and then like squirrel it away. Because then it, why are you asking that? Why do you want to know my gender? Why do you want to know my pronouns? If you want to know someone's pronouns because you want to make sure that they're being used, give them the opportunity to share it. Don't make it mandatory. If you want to know someone's marital status, why do you want to know their marital status? Is it because you're going to be doing more, are you giving insurance to everyone's partner and to everyone's children? Um, do you want to know how many women you have because you genuinely want to raise the number of women in your company and leadership? Um, and then the other part I would say that's always true, we were talking top down. We have to do it from the top down. As much as possible, promote people from marginalized groups. They're every bit as qualified. Well, not every person is every bit as qualified, but what I'm saying is just being a white man in our society seems to make people feel like they're more qualified, um, and that's not the case. So that's the biggest one. Make sure that you have diversity in leadership, because when you have diversity in leadership, naturally the rest of the company will start to fill in the blanks. I think we're good because everyone can go to lunch and if <laughs> I'll be up here for a few minutes if anyone wants to ask me anything but thank you all so much for listening this is so important and I really appreciate you all
Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a great lunch. We have a few announcements before we get started with our next session. We'd first like to thank our sponsors, as without their generous support, this event would not be possible. Please take a moment to visit them in the sponsor hall at your earliest convenience. Please join us tonight for the WordCamp US Social. It starts at 7 p.m. in the Riverfront Park, just a short walk for those that attended uh, the speaker's dinner. It's just behind the sponsor area in the green area there. We'd love to see you at Con Contributor Day tomorrow, starting at 9 a.m. If you have questions, look for someone wearing a yellow lanyard and they'll be able to help you. Don't forget to use the hashtag WCUS when you share WordCamp photos on Instagram, Twitter. We'd love to see your photos. Additionally, you can share your WordCamp photos directly to the WordCamp official collaborative photo album. Look for the signs around with the QR code that you could just scan in. I'd like to uh, bring our, spe our speaker on stage. Our next session is a new era of WordPress themes is here, block themes with Rich Tabor. As a WordPress entrepreneur, designer, and developer all wrapped in, up in one, Richard is recognized as one of the top leaders in the Gutenberg era of WordPress. His ever precise design chops have topped the Automatic Design Awards and led him to co-found Coblocks, Theme Beans, and Iceberg, a markdown editor with Gutenberg. Now, Rich leads the Ex Extendify team as the head of product, extending the best WordPress through innovative Gutenberg first solutions. Please welcome Rich Tabor. Thank you. Hey everyone. So you're here today to learn about this new era of WordPress themes, block themes. So when WordPress 5.0 landed, and Gutenberg was introduced into the editor, the classic editor became something new. It became block themes. Lots of folks dove in, started building all sorts of interesting experiences within the editor. And blocks were seen as the foundation of this editing experience. I actually don't quite subscribe to that. I know blocks are cool and interesting. I built a handful myself, and I know many of you in the room have, but blocks are only micro experiences within the greater editing experience of WordPress. And you know what drives that? Themes do, in particular block themes in this new era. So what we're gonna to cover today is how block themes are different from classic themes, the architecture behind a block theme. We're gonna take a look at some code today and just understand the underpinnings, underpinnings of what exactly these block themes are and how they work. And then the, the way that they facilitate a full site editing experience within WordPress core. I'm Rich Tabor. Uh, my Twitter and my uh, website are up there. I write a lot about design and WordPress and the intersection of this whole new era. Uh, previously, I was uh, building a lot of different products. I built Coblox, Theme Beans, um, Iceberg, uh, Block Gallery, and an, I was also at GoDaddy for a number of years running the product uh, team for the WordPress experience. And now I'm at Extendify as head of product, leading that team, building on much of this new stuff here. Like many of you, my career is staked and built on WordPress, and uh, in particular, all this new stuff here. So themes have evolved quite a bit over the years. We've had the most basic of blog themes to the most advanced themes, where we even have page builders built into these themes to help leverage the editing experience of WordPress. There's one common thread, though, through all these themes, and that's that they have different experiences. That's not a bad thing if we can take a theme and form it into an experience that serves a client site or your own site. But having a system that creates a lot of friction is not good for WordPress. If you have to redo your site every time you change a theme, or if you opt for a page builder or opt off of a page builder, it's just too much friction that in overall is just hurting the WordPress experience. And that's where block themes come into play. Because block themes are the catalyst for a theme agnostic WordPress experience. That's taking one system that's standardized and flexing it in a bunch of different fashions to build new WordPress experiences that are consistent from theme to theme. And that starts with the theme.json file. The theme.json file is a specification 
that lets you assign styles and settings of a site. The styles is everything of how it looks. The settings is the, the way that the editor experience is customized. Let's start with styles here. There are three different origins of styles. There's core styles, theme styles, and user styles. These form what I like to call the hierarchy of styles. If you like pie or cake, you'll like this illustration here. So these three styles layer on top of each other to form the site styling. The first is the crust, or the core styles. This is everything that Core Gutenberg provides out of the box. So how your buttons are displayed, the typography, the font sizes, the font spacing, um, everything that you see out of the box without a theme layer in the editor. Then we have the filling, or the theme styles. This is everything that the theme adds to flavor the pie, or the cake here. That's taking that default Gutenberg that's black and white and making it red and white or blue, styling uh, the rounded corners of the button, changing anything stylistically that it wants to based off of what's provided in core. And then we have the user styles, that's the topping. That's where you go into the editor within the global styles interface and the user chooses some different changes on top of that. So if core decided the buttons were black right out of the box, then the theme said the buttons are red, you can go into the global styles interface and make the buttons blue. And that's a site-wide global change that is applied everywhere. If we dive a little bit deeper into the styles of a theme.json file, you, it's kind of an inception into this. There's global styles and also block styles. Global styles is generating the CSS for HTML elements. That is the body, tag, headers, captions, uh, buttons even. And some of this stuff is still relatively new and will come out in WordPress 6.1. But the gist is I can take one JSON specification and style consistently across a different number of themes with one fashion. And this is what it looks like. I've got a styles object within my theme.json file and I'm setting a color notation and also some typography settings here. And if you could see, I've got CSS variables or custom properties within each of these and I'm using the presets that are established by the theme throughout the JSON. You would use this method here because you have one source of truth for the design of your theme. So if I change that base color or contrast color, it is reflected throughout anywhere that you've used those colors in the styles. So if we take that, it, the or we'll take that and merge it and output CSS to the front end and it will target the body class or the body tag. And this also exists within the editor targeting the content of the editor itself so if you're a themer and you've built themes before and tried to have editor styles that match the front end of your site within Gutenberg, uh, you don't have to do that anymore. It happens uh, with this one system and it's converted as it needs to be instead of requiring two style sheets. And as you can see a little bit later, we're actually removing the need for any style sheets within a theme, a block theme, other than declaring the name of the theme and the slug. Elements work quite the same way. So within the styles object, I have elements, and I just declare each one individually. So I have a button element, so I'm using the color the same way I did previously, but now I'm adding another one here to take a look at. I'm assigning a border radius of zero for the button style, and then I'm styling the H1 tag as, uh, with a large font size, again, using the CSS properties generated by the theme. And this is the output of that. Uh, the H1 is, is simply just throwing an H1 on the, on the uh, styles here and adding the font size. Button's a little bit different because uh, we don't want to target every button on the page, but we do want to target buttons generated by the Gutenberg editor that have opted into the system. So there's a, a couple classes that are generated for you. So again, we're not writing any of the CSS uh, from these styles here. It's all configured by core. All we're doing is providing the values in JSON. So that's it for global styles, uh, the global styles within theme.json. Now generating block specific styles uh, is pretty much the same way, and this is CSS that is scoped to specific blocks. Here's an example where I have uh, the styles object again, and inside of it I've got blocks, and then inside of that I'm using the namespace and the slug of a block, so this one I'm targeting the core site title block, and I'm setting some stylistic attributes to this as well. 
And just like previously, it's generated on the front end and within the editor targeting this specific block. Now this CSS is applied inline on the page if your theme opts to do so. And that's um, probably the most forward thinking way to do uh, the block styles here. But the interesting thing about targeting specific blocks is instead of a theme being just different colors and different typography, different layout widths and whatnot, you can actually target specific blocks and make them more personal and more original to a theme. So if your site title was all caps or italic or bigger or smaller, you can do that sort of granular control design-wise. So that's it for styles within theme.json. Now there's this whole other side of things for settings. Settings of a theme.json file define stylistic presets, so like the colors and the font sizes that you use throughout the site, but also the editor experience. The editor experience is really interesting because you can take any controls, or not any controls, it's, it's a number of controls today, but the, the goal is most controls can be either turned on or turned off, opted in or opted out by the theme uh, to either tighten down the editor experience. So say you're handing off a site to a client and you wanna tighten things up, you can do that now within theme.json. And it's also in one standardized fashion. Uh, and you can also take some of the, like the styles, for example, imply, as you can apply specific styles to block, you can also do specific settings. So for the paragraph block, for example, if you don't want the drop cap option available within your client's editor experience, you set drop cap equals false and it'll hide that control within the editor. Now there's a, a lot more flexibility that needs to happen on this front to continue moving towards the configuration layer of settings. Uh, but I do see a future where uh, we have one system that can be as simple and as streamlined editor-wise, but also as flexible as we want building out the site-wise all in one system. And it's also a system that's not locked down. So we could take the editor, perhaps it starts out really strict, really tightened up for your client, but as they grow with the site, maybe you unlock some of that feature set for them to continue editing with. Here's an example of settings, a couple of settings here within theme.json. I have a color palette that I'm using here. And uh, if you could see, I've got two options on line uh, six and seven where I'm turning off the default color palette and also the default gradients. It's another one of those editor configuration layers. So I'm turning off the, you know, the red, yellow, green, purple, blue colors that you see right out of the box. So only your theme colors are available. And the same for gradients. You can turn off gradients that are, may not be appropriate for uh, you or your client's website. There's a couple different settings showing up in WordPress 6.1 to be released later this year. Uh, the first is which uh, is fluid typography. It's very interesting. You set a min and a max value for your typography, and then it, the editor will calculate how that displays. And if the viewport is wide enough, it'll display at the max. And if it starts shrinking down, it'll slowly gradually move down towards the smaller size. And then we have root padding, which sets the amount of space around the viewport and the content of your entire site. This is very interesting because if you're familiar with themes, and especially with uh, moving towards editor styling and whatnot, you've had to figure out how wide and full width blocks uh, are associated with padding of a site. And if you want to have controls for that, themes have notoriously had to add quite a bit of CSS to override and fix that. If you look at 2022, there's, you know, there's a whole glob that tries to solve this. Now Core has done it in a standardized fashion that will be released in 6.1, where we don't have to have any of that CSS. And if you set something to full width, it'll be full width. And if you set it to wide, it'll have appropriate padding on either sides. It seems like such a, a simple solution, but the, it's very complex behind the scenes to figure out a system that works across all themes. Then we have spacing presets. It's a, a very interesting one as well. So being able to define a scale or a ratio of space and have a consistent way to apply that either in margin or padding or even heights of certain blocks is a very powerful and this is coming in 6.1 and uh, it's fairly easy to implement. Uh, you can do it with just a few lines in, within theme.json or you can add your own spacing scale if you want to do your own custom sizes for that. So that's it for settings, but I would kind of group these other parts, the templates, the parts, and the patterns in a template layer within settings. Now templates are block-based groups of blocks that are styled and arranged within the full site editing experience. Uh, so think of editing, you know, prior to full site editing is basically manipulating your post content of a page, and then it's rendered within your templates of a classic theme. 
what a template here does in a block theme is actually depicts where that post content is going to go. So you can choose to have different headers or footers or other blocks uh, on the page within this experience here. And it's consumable within full site editing so you can manipulate it around and actually change the way this template looks. In this example here, I've got the header template part at the top. I'm using the query loop block and that just renders the loop as a block. And then way down below, you can't really see it, but there's a, a footer template part as well. And this works for all of the classically uh, you know, tightened down parts of a block theme or as a, of a classic theme like the index.php files, all the archive views, searches, um, and whatnot. So the most interesting part about templates uh, is the last point here, and that's that they can be overwritten by the user. So a theme will provide a block template out of the box declaring what the blog role or the index view would look like. If you go into the site editor, make changes, like moving your featured image above the, uh, the post title, or adding an author to that view, and you hit save, that template is opted out of the theme's ownership. So when the theme updates, it's not going to reflect on your site. Your theme, your template is now yours at that point, uh, which kind of almost starts negating the need for child themes because we're having this system of, it's kind of like the system of hierarchy styles where it's now yours, so it's not going to be overwritten. And you can see, if you can look closely here, there's a bunch of different templates. I'm using the same template hierarchy within block themes as exists within classic themes. This is from the 2022 theme. And if we take a look at this page.html file, I've also had featured image block, post title block, spacer, post content, and both my template parts here as well. And the cool thing here, and you might have seen this before, but it's like understanding that all of these functionalities are abstracted from PHP now. Uh, they're sure it exists, but the block is referencing that instead. So it becomes something you can move around and you can manipulate uh, either here within the template, but most likely within the full site editing experience. That's it for templates. So now let's move on to parts. So I showed you earlier with the, the header part at the top and the footer part. And these are parts of templates. They're registered within the theme.json file, and uh, they're essentially synced across the site. So uh, think of it almost like a reusable block with an extra bit of interface around it. And um, just like templates, you can edit a header, change the navigation, move the site logo somewhere else, and it becomes your header. It doesn't get overwritten by the theme part anymore. This is how that works within theme.json. You have template parts array right here. I have a header and a footer. Uh, the key part here is the name, which has to match the file name within the parts directory of a block theme. And then the area, which defines the, the class of part this is. So I have header and footer here. And within the header.html file, it looks just like a block template. It's just a, a piece of UI that is synced again across all templates and reused. I'm using site logo, site title, social links, and I also have search on here. And that renders within the editor, the site editor, as the actual header template part. This is from my blog, uh, richdaver.com. A cool thing about header parts and footer parts in particular is that you can replace them with other of the like kind. So if you set an area of header and you have alternate header uh, variants within the theme, I can pick either of these, for example, within my theme, and it replaces the entire part across anywhere that part is used, on, in my case, on all the templates, to this new header here. So it's a, a maybe two clicks to get to this UI to have a completely different header for your site. Um, it's really powerful in coming up with, you know, this think of component systems. There's only so many ways to do a header, maybe 50 ways if we really flex it out. But if you had all of those capabilities built into one system, then you could use this right here to just replace it in a few clicks. So parts and patterns are similar, but patterns unlock a different level of editing that is abstracted from a part. So patterns are essentially predefined block layouts. You, they could be sections, they could be small, like two or three blocks even. Uh, but generally, I would like to think of a pattern as a whole section of a page. And then we also have page patterns, which are designing an entire page of content that can be dropped in uh, anywhere in the post content at one time. You can copy and paste them throughout your site from page to page, and also from the WordPress patterns directory. And um, 
This last bit here is, so the patterns directory gets a little confusing because there's a local patterns directory within your theme, uh, just like parts and templates are, but there's also the actual patterns directory from WordPress.org. Now the interesting thing about the patterns directory from WordPress.org is that a theme can utilize that to pull down patterns within itself without actually having to register the pattern or have any, any sort of markup in the actual theme. And you can do that with theme.json. Patterns directory has, I'm pretty sure, a couple thousand patterns. Like Quality-wise, it's probably not ideal right now. I think we can get better at curation and creation of patterns. Uh, but having a system where you can create one pattern, upload it here, and then reference it on any theme that you build or any client site that you're going to use, uh, you can have one source of truth, like one set of markup that you have to maintain, and still use it across uh, any of your sites, but also anyone else can grab that pattern and pull it down into their theme. I think it's a, a very powerful and sustainable system that probably will become the future of how we interact with patterns and add patterns to themes uh, as themes continue to move more towards component-based systems. So to do that, you would add a patterns array within the theme.json file and grab the slugs of the patterns that you want to add. So these two would be wordpress.org slash patterns and then the two slugs here and they would actually open up um, from the website. So I grab those two slugs, put them in here, and you'll see them populate within the editor, just like as if they were actually included in the theme themselves. And uh, if you wanted to include them within the theme, you can. You can do that within the patterns directory locally. So here I have a pattern. Uh, the one key difference here is that this pattern is a PHP file. We have this like auto registration method, so you define a basically a header here for the pattern, set its title, slug, categories, keywords, and there's a few other things. Um, like view, viewport width is pretty interesting. It lets you set how zoomed out that pattern is. So if it's a, a big section, maybe you zoom it out a little bit further. Uh, but this defines how that pattern is re rendered within the editor. And uh, it's essentially, essentially another version of a template, another condensed uh, block-based component that we can drop in anywhere. Again, patterns, I think, are going to be the, if not already, are moving towards the primary way of interacting with the editor. Blocks are great, and some blocks that are very more experience-based, like trying to build forms or trying to build uh, like uh, ordering type capabilities or even checkout stuff with WooCommerce, is that, that stuff will stay blocks probably, but the idea that patterns are taking these these very complex layouts that might be very difficult to do still in the editor and dropping it on a site in one or two clicks. It's like a, the ultimate shortcut. And speaking of shortcuts, style variations are probably the most interesting part of a block theme to me. Uh, so if you take the design system of theme.json, all the global styles, the block styles, all of the colorings, the font sizes, package it up and just start spinning it around and it starts shooting different uh, variants of that, kind of like the multiverse, I guess. Like you would have style variations. Style variations are alternate presets for a theme. Think of them as one click design solutions. You go into the global styles interface. You, you click on the little global styles icon and hit other styles. You'll see a couple of different cards if your theme supports these. Once you click one, it instantly reflects on your site within the editor with the new style applied. If you hit save, it's on the front end as well. And uh, it creates a system where it's easy to express different uh, creativity options just by having a one-click solution. The best part, though, about style variations is that they inherit from the theme.json file. That means I, I have one theme.json file. I've set up everything I wanted to set up experience-wise and also stylistically. And then if I want a style variation just to change the colors, all I have to do is override the colors. So if you think back to the the pie with the core theme and user styles, it kind of plugs between core and user as the different variants at that level. So you can do something simple, just changing colors, just changing typography or colors, typography, layouts, uh, spacing values. You can register different template parts if you really wanted to. You can kind of extend as, as much as you want. So one style variation can be as many different versions of, its, of that one origin theme or not. I have a, a theme here, it's a little small, but this is a theme I created called Wabi. And the intent here was to keep a similar vibe to the origin theme style, 
Uh, there's a couple variations, some of the typography changes, some of the spacing changes, but I just wanted the same theme with different takes on it. So that's one approach to do it. But then we also have themes like 2023, which is a work in progress right now to be released with WordPress 6.1. And this theme is interesting in that it's right now uh, formed of 10 different style variations. These were submitted by the community. There was a, an ask for just Figma or JSON entries to come up with ideas on how to express uh, more creativity within default core WordPress. So uh, later on this year, we're going to see 10 styles out of the box with uh, 2023, which is a very interesting change of pace from the classic way that themes are handled. 2022 actually already has style variations included in it, so you can see this live today. Um, so if you, I think in WordPress 6.0 earlier this year, these landed, and there's four different ways to use core default WordPress already. So one question I get asked quite often is, you know, how do themes play a role with all this new stuff? If we have style variations where it's one theme but morphed into a bunch of different avenues, like how, how do like how do themes play a role with all of this? If, is a theme what is a theme anymore, and how is it relevant? Um, and I would say the themes are certainly relevant, but they're entirely different. Themes are component systems, so a theme is what patterns are included into it, what styles, what style variations. It is what editor controls even are, are enabled or disabled. That the entire experience is all packaged into one component that you deliver to a site or you install on your own, and it becomes a kickoff point, a starting point. It's intended to be flexed out. The core styles and the theme styles are not meant to be the only things there. You're supposed to extend it with user styles and go into global styles and create the experience and also the style that you're looking for within WordPress core. So while themes are different, there are some of all these parts that form an experience, and that's the full site editing experience. Full site editing is just that. It's taken everything that I shared with you. Everything I shared was, was all block based. Everything was a block. And that's because full site editing enables everything to be edited, which are all blocks. It's taking blocks and putting them everywhere. Headers, footers, sidebars, no more widget areas even. Just having collections of blocks throughout the experience. And realistically, these are only the full site editing experience is kind of only relative to a block theme. Now, I know there's some thoughts around bringing uh, support for classic themes and trying to figure out how to add block templates and whatnot to the classic themes, but, but leaning forward, there almost is a, a line in the sand on opting into this experience. You know, WordPress a year ago, without the block theme being a default, or the default theme being a block theme, was a completely different experience than what we have today. Like 2022 opens the door for the full site editing experience that just wasn't there previously. Uh, right out of the box. So this leads us forward into editing with blocks. You get to it from the Appearance tab, you click on Editor, and it pulls up your site within the Site Editor. This is uh, my blog here again as the example. You can navigate to the Templates tab. You can click on any of these here, and it's a little bit blurry, but the idea is you can click on Single Post, for example, change the featured image above the post title if you want, or set a, a cover block with the featured image as the background. You could customize that template itself. And again, when you do that, that template is opted out of the theme's ownership, and it does not get overwritten anymore by the theme if there, if there are updates. You can go to the global styles interface. So I've got color palettes on the right and also elements. So again, earlier I showed you how elements were styling the body tag. Like this is the UI component of the theme.json that does that. So you would go into here, if I change the background to black instead of white, now my user style is taking precedence over what the theme has decided here. And we also have the navigation component. Uh, it's, a, it's a little small there, but the navigation is, is still relatively new, and we're still experimenting with figuring out how to best uh, open up the idea of uh, managing your navigation from the site editor. I know the block is, is you know, it's tough, it's tough to build that system. Uh, so we're trying out this uh, sidebar approach with the navigation within this full site editing experience. Now, one thing that I know is a bit touchy is the idea that uh, the customizer is, is almost not there. And that's because the site editor is, is meant to replace the customizer experience. 
It's not meant to remove it though. If you're using a plugin that requires the customizer, I think WooCommerce still has quite a few options even for the customizer. The customizer will still be there. It's a, a very valid part of WordPress and I've built plenty of experiences off the customizer that a lot of folks still use today. But the full site editing experience and the site editor in general is meant to surpass what the customizer can do today. Um, there's still a lot of need for flexibility in the site editor and trying to open up more capabilities for plugins to inter intercede into that experience. Uh, but the overall goal is to replace the customizer experience here. So I added a little extra here at the end. Uh, so all of these experiences, all these block stylings and settings and configurations for uh, with the WordPress experience kind of open up this whole new avenue of theming with the site editor. And this is done with a relatively new plugin called Create Block Theme. Now, Create Block Theme lets you go into the site editor, make as many changes as you want, any of the stuff that I shared with the template editing or the style changes and whatnot, and then go into this, this currently uh, very uh, new or very uh, beta type experience and export it as a brand new theme or as a child theme or as a clone of the theme. So here I'm going to activate this plugin here, create block theme that you can download today. Go to the site editor here and start making changes. So I took my same blog, I replaced the header with a different header. I did a style variation and applied it here so it's the dark style variation. I have the color palette on the right that's uh, where I can go in and change and manipulate some of these colors. I have typography settings here where I can change the font size, font families, and manipulate all the type. And then also within the layout settings, I can set again the global padding values and set the wide width, the full width values of this theme. Then go back to create block themes admin, which is a temporary admin. I think eventually this will be within the full site editor experience. And then any of these options, I can export it as a new theme create a child theme, clone it. I can even just create a style variation if I'd like. And this actually packages up this, your theme as a brand new theme. I think one day it would be interesting if from, not necessarily this admin view, but from an experience within WordPress, we can take your theme and actually send it to the WordPress uh, themes directory from there as it like send all my style configurations, all my templates and parts and patterns and make it available for anyone to use. I see that as a probably something we might lean into. So that's everything I know about block themes and theming. <laughs> that's, uh, I know it's a big dump. Uh, I, I have a, a write about on richtabor.com. I tweet a lot. I have my slides. I just I think I went out on Twitter a few minutes ago. So um, just feel free to chime in wherever you can find me. And I'm, I've got a few minutes for questions if, uh, if we have any. Thank you. Have any questions in the audience? Do we have any questions? And by the way, um, if you haven't picked up your shirt for the event, make sure to grab it in the sponsor area against the right hand wall. Also, Matt's uh, presentation is tonight. All right. Hi. Um, this is probably a question that's been debated very heatedly online, but I don't know because right. I haven't seen it. So. I'm not saying this is like a gotcha or asking as a gotcha, but um, one of the great things about WordPress is that you can do anything with it, right? So I feel like full site editing has its place for certain use cases, but there are other use cases where it's more like you have a product inside of a company that has a very strong brand, everything's de you know designed very specifically, and you don't want to give that. Is this is the full site editing and block themes intended somewhere down the line to completely replace the classic theming in the future or are they going to exist side by side the way they kind of do now yeah i would say you know it's just probably my 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 thoughts are the classic themes will still run on the, you know the future of wordpress right now i don't see that it becoming deprecated to the point where you can't run them. Uh, just like the customizer, it's going to be there for a while because a lot, I don't know what a while means, maybe, maybe forever, I don't know, uh, because it is something that a lot of people uh, rely on. And you can't tighten WordPress down to one experience. 
and block themes are meant to to add some sort of configuration layer so that you can start putting it into a certain lane if you'd like to, like if you want to tighten it up for clients and whatnot. There's still a lot of work that goes into that and it's not there today to do very, very tailored experiences around um, something like a high level publisher would require, uh, but I think we certainly would, would aim to get there. And we have an online question. Christina has it for you in the back of the room. I've got a question from Michael Cunningham. Do we have to further use that plugin to make changes to the theme? Uh, so you can make changes to the theme within the global styles and within the templates, within the site editor experience, and you, you, that plugin, all it does is export it as a, a new theme. Um, so you would use it for now. I think eventually it'll be within uh, the actual editor, though. It's just a, more of an experiment now. All right, we have another question in the back, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for doing this. Um, I'm primarily trying to figure out the differentiation in um, like input versus output. And so kind of the concept, I think like the conceptualization behind using a block theme is we're going to give this interface of editing control within a set of defined parameters dictated by the theme.json file so that we can get some sort of predictable editing interface and give the users the options that they want to use. How how does that how is that playing ideally into the front end, especially when you're using something like Bootstrap or the US WDS or um, you know some sort of um, templating system that's intended to do that standardization on the front end? And how are you how is that kind of handled well? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, um, there are a lot of experiments on using some of those systems within primarily within the block editing realm and less in the theme.json realm. There are you know, some ideas around trying to use uh, color values a little bit more in a standardized fashion that let you extend it. But I do think we need more thought leadership on that front on how to leverage those external tools that are very valuable and that a lot of folks already know how to use. Um, I, I like to think of theme.json as like the starting point for like how do we get a simple site there. But for all of us, or most of us who do use some of these more advanced tools, it's like we have tooling that works really well. Like, how do we leverage that? And I think that um, I'd be open to discussing that further with you. Okay, we have one more. Uh, actually, we have one. I'll get to you next. Hi. Um, so I've started working with the 2022 theme and made a child theme out of it with and implementing the templates and parts. Um, in the past, I've always been able to do a PHP like queries for custom taxonomies and and things like that, custom post types. I'm having a harder time switching over to that, and I, I believe it's because it's actually not something that's doable at this point. Is that true? And and how long will that be able to be like custom queries alone um, being able to be used in the themes and the templates portions of it? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, the query loop block has gone through a number of evolutions in the last couple of years. Uh, I believe in WordPress 6.1 though, it does have quite a bit more flexibility and you you would probably create a template, which is also something you can do at 6.1, create a brand new template within the site editor and add the query loop block and try to manipulate its parameters because you can do custom post types now with that. Uh, but I mean, just a, a little bit of warning, that block is, it is tough to use, it's big. It's, you're taking the entire WordPress loop and configuring it down into an interface. So it, it needs a lot of work, but it also needs a lot of feedback. So I, would, I mean, I would love to like sit down with you and, and take a look at what you're trying to do and see if I can uh, help guide that direction. And we had another question on this side, yeah? Oh, gotcha. right behind you. Um, so for third-party plugins, how extensible is the uh, is it something that can be utilized by other plugins in order to provide customization to those plugins from that theme starting point? Not yet. <laughs> you know, that's uh, probably one of the um, debatable parts of Gutenberg that's been, you know, it's been recently gotten a little bit more attention on. Uh, there was a lot of focus on bringing all the theme.json values into the global styles interface, but now I think it's about time to start opening that up for block, plug block plugins and other experiences to like start thought fill into that experience uh, so that we do have one standard method of using it. 
hundred percent. We've got another online question for you. All right. Christina. Caught. Connie from Burbank says, thanks, Rich. My question is whether custom templates and template parts are overwritten by theme updates. Uh, they're like, not. Oh, yeah. sorry. Okay, yeah, she <laughs> says, it looks like they don't get overwritten. Yeah. Yay. Right, right. As soon as you make a change to a template, at least right now, the way this works, oops, sorry. The way it works is that your, your template belongs to you, your site, and with that theme active, that template is also active on your site. Uh, you can clear the customizations and opt back into the theme's ownership, uh, but you don't have to. Right. Okay, another question. I'm getting my steps in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if full site editing themes are kind of a combination of what options that Gutenberg or WordPress core uh, lets us have, do you think there's a danger that full site editing themes won't be able to innovate in the same way that kind of classic themes did, where you can only say, if an option isn't exposed to me as a theme.json thing, it's not possible for me to do? Do you think that's a danger? So I, I see the, the themes, the block themes, and the theme.json spec as the starting point. It's not, I think the innovation on what you want to do with the theme comes in the blocks. So if you're building really interesting, intricate blocks, like for hotel reservations or event management, that would belong in a block, which is also a portable system that could be used across themes at that point. And if you, if you figure it out, you can also use theme.json to style those blocks. So instead of having you know, an out-of-the-box out of experience where your form fields look rough, like you, you have a consistent method to ensure that however the theme.json file styles form fields and buttons, your, your stuff will adapt to other themes. I think it's a, it's a powerful medium to kick off from. I just want to clarify um, following up on the updates. So if updates don't overwrite, does that mean that there's no longer a need for child themes? Uh, that's debatable. <laughs> I'm probably of the camp that there's a need. I think there's a need, especially with uh, client sites and, and some of the, the ways that people are flexing and, and block themes in that direction. But generally speaking, probably not. Yeah. Any other questions? Did I you talked a little bit about the drastic change in the full site editor from one year to another. What are you looking forward to or what can you share with us that you're most excited about in a coming update or release? Yeah, so you know, all the 6.1 stuff is great, uh, but it's, it's, been, it's been taking its rounds and uh, getting some improvements and feedback on. I think the most interesting aspect of uh, the project is where we're going on the admin front. So we've been focusing a lot on the theming, the block editor, the site editor, but how does that kind of come together, one, and how does it pull into an admin interface that's much more modern, uh, much more simple in a sense, and maybe we even can expose some of the, the type of configuration that we have within a theme like JSON on, on the entire WordPress experience. Like maybe there's something there where we can tighten it down in one fashion or open it up in one fashion. Again, instead of having a bunch of different hacks to try to create experiences around. I think leaning into that front is uh, very uh, interesting and compelling for me. All right, last call for questions. All right. All right. Maybe perhaps this is less a question, more of a comment. Um, a lot of people who fight against, at least in conversations I've had, because I'm a big proponent of FSC, is losing control and also not being able to do everything and therefore not willing to go as far as you can with what's available. Just as a comment that I've experienced is, it's okay to give up some control, even if you think you can trust some users, especially if they have a strong brand, but also we've always had to create something custom for something. So learn how to build that custom in a block. If the block doesn't exist, you have to add to your tool set and be able to make that custom. So don't say, oh, FSC is not going to work because I don't know how to make the custom block that I need. Learn how to make the custom block, and now you have all the awesome new tools with you. It's, it's got to be the complete mindset, but it's worth it. Yeah, it's, it's worth it, and it's, it's hard work, too. Um, but the tools that for developing, especially on the block front, have evolved quite significantly. And even with create block theme, like being able to create a theme without using code anymore, like that's, that's almost like hard to grasp a concept of. It used to take months to build a theme if, if out, or maybe a couple of weeks if you're quick. 
uh, but now you could do it, I mean, if you're fairly new to it, but you like to tinker, maybe it takes a few days to put, to put together those components and, and publish it. I think we're, we're approaching this, this new era of, uh, of uh, you know, this theming and, and block editing, and also we need some of that extensibility to really like, empower the editing experience, but we're, we're on the cusp of that, and I think that that's uh, such an exciting and opportune time to be a part of WordPress. I guess Great. that's it. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank Thanks, you. Rich.
on uh, behind the sponsor area out on the lawn. Um, also, if you haven't picked up your event t-shirt, uh, you can grab that in the sponsor area on the right-hand side. And tonight, uh, Matt's chat will be at 445. All right. Also, tomorrow is Contributor Day, starting at 9 a.m. If you have questions, look for someone wearing a yellow lanyard, and they can help you. Don't forget to use the hashtag WordCampUS, WCUS, on social media. We'd love to see your photos. Also, there'll be a, a WordCamp official collaborative photo album, so look for the QR code around the venue as well. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. The Future of Themes, Designing for a Block Editor with Michelle R. Schulp. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Michelle is an independent UX designer and a front-end developer in Minneapolis. She studied visual communication, psychology, and sociology, branching into front-end development and user experience as a, her career progressed. This combination of disciplines led her to adopt strategy, a strategy-based approach on how people, no, a strategy approach, a strategy-based approach to design, focused on solving tangible problems and achieving real goals based on how people think. Now she collaborates on projects with clients ranging in size from solopreneurs to enterprise. She loves the open source community, and when she's not pursuing professional, personal, or wellness goals, she enjoys giving back through speaking, writing, and connecting with others. Her passions are communications and empowerment, and she believes in the power of why. Michelle, take it away. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It is so lovely to be back up on stage and seeing real people uh, in real life. Like, it's cool that all of you have torsos and, like, legs <laughs> instead of just faces on a screen. Um, so, hi. That was, like, a great intro, so I don't have to talk about myself too much. Um, but, yeah, I'm a... Uh, designer, front-end developer, been doing WordPress for a while, and actually I, I realized today, I kind of did the math, and today is my uh, 50th WordPress event that I've been speaking at, so I'm really excited to be sharing that with all of you. Ow. Thanks. We'll see if you want to clap afterward, it's fine. <laughs> um, but I, I want to talk to you all about the future of theme design, because as a theme designer, that's kind of important to me, and a whole lot's been happening, and people have a lot of opinions about that. Uh, but before I get into the future of theme design, I kind of want to step back through a little bit of the history of themes, uh, so we can remember how we got here, so that we know where we're going, right? So. Historically speaking with WordPress, uh, themes were basically these very cohesive templates that were generally separate from the content. And that was basically the whole point of themes uh, because the content was now in your database and your, your theme was powering the output and that meant you could update your content without having to update code. That was like one of the best parts of content management systems. And the way it worked was that your theme was managing your look and feel, the structure, the way that everything laid out, uh, your content, your words and images and media, those lived in the database or they lived in files. And then you started adding plugins to add new functionality. Uh, it wasn't always this perfectly cut and dry but this was basically the way that WordPress was set up when it started. And in this state, you know, when, when themes were like this, what was the role of a theme designer? Uh, I kind of said that the theme designer was basically the design dictator here, right? Because we were, as a designer, we were dictating the use of color, typography, spacing, branding. You know, we were building, like, what exactly is this header going to look like, the footer, the sidebar, all of our page templates, our page layouts. Where is content going to be used within the layout? Which content needs to be where? Like, the designer had a lot of control over what was ultimately going to be rendered on the page. But then slowly, as many of you remember, uh, websites began to do more, right? WordPress started out with posts and with pages, but we, we wanted more than that. So sites started to become stores, sales funnels, uh, membership sites, social networks, event hubs, learning centers, communities. Uh, and the basic template and content model started to get a little bit of strain. So as a result, what happened? Um, well, layouts kind of needed to start evolving as content was changing, right? It wasn't just text on a page anymore. Um, we started needing stuff like landing pages and other kind of bespoke content to be able to speak to different audiences. Um, there were a lot more complex functionality needs. You know, once you have products or testimonials or users, you want to be able to lay those out in different ways. And there were a lot fewer options to 
build these unique layouts without learning code, right? I mean, the number of people that are like, I just want three columns in a row with an image on top of each one. How do I do that? And the result of this was a lot of end user frustration, not being able to make these things that seem like simple changes. And there was also a little bit of resentment about like our, our developers kind of gatekeeping us. Are they preventing us from being able to do simple things? So we tried a lot of different things as a community to try to solve some of these problems. So what did we do? Um, we, you know, we tried like widgetized themes. That was one of the first approaches to it. Like we've got these widgets, maybe let's put them everywhere. Uh, we tried um, to rely a lot on short codes. You know, can we build things using short codes? And a lot of uh, big page builders were using short codes as well. Um, we used a lot of customizer-based themes. So there's a lot of options in the customizer. Um, custom fields really rose up and stuff like advanced custom fields, of which I'm a, a huge fan. You know, can we use this to craft maybe more custom content layout experiences? Um, each of these things, and, and then obviously the page builders, of which there are several, right? That was kind of a very big one. And each of these things, they each had their strengths and weaknesses. They had, they had pros and cons. They were doing the best they could. Um, and people tended to get opinions about which one was their favorite. Um, but part of the problem here is that there were so many different solutions that the WordPress content editing experience became really divided. You know, if you asked one person what using WordPress was like and asked another person what using WordPress was like, you would get totally different answers. And, you know, if you go to different dashboards, as you might have as a professional, they might not look anything like somebody else's dashboard. So we, we had a lot of splintering. Um, so block-based editing was introduced as a way to start to unify this editing experience for all of these different use cases and provide a, a visual and procedural set of standards for all of these different needs. Uh, we wanted to make the content editing experience more closely resemble how the content was actually going to look on the page and let people be able to do some of these more creative and more complex layouts without feeling like they were beholden to a developer. So the first phase of this was the introduction of the block editor, uh, which has now been available in core for content editing for over four years. Uh, though it's not perfect, it has undergone a lot of changes in that time to make it more stable, more usable, and more intuitive. And that brings us up to uh, kind of where we've been at the last couple years. And a lot has happened in WordPress theme and content management since the last time we were all like gathered together in a space. So I wanted to make sure that we're all up to date and kind of what happened during COVID. A lot has happened. Um, first of all, currently, uh, we've had seven major releases of WordPress during COVID. Um, we are currently in phase two of four of kind of the road map for WordPress, uh, which is centering currently around full site editing. The previous phase was around you know, the block editor and how to, how to build that. Um, two new core themes have been released in that time, so 2021 and uh, 2022, which was the first dedicated full site editing theme. Uh, we've also introduced like a whole lot more core blocks, so uh, including site level blocks that let you actually build site layouts in addition to just page layouts. Um, we keep getting more and more detailed block styling options, uh, including stuff like typography, color, spacing, layout, um, and also the widgets that we talked about before have also been converted to blocks. And um, then uh, block patterns were introduced, which is a collection of blocks. Uh, query loop block and all of the block options that came with it became more robust. Um, and then we also now have uh, the block directory and the pattern directory to be able to search for individual blocks or individual collections of block patterns. Now patterns being you know, predetermined groups of blocks that you know, let you streamline your building process. And then this one you're going to hear about a lot from me in this presentation, um, but the theme.json file and all of the new kind of global styles and variables were introduced in 5.8, and then they introduced support for child themes, and then uh, style variations in the last couple of releases. And then the big one, full site editing, uh, got merged in in 5.9, which is supporting these new, this entirely new templating system for building WordPress sites. So there's, there's a lot has happened in the last couple of years, and this is where we're at now. Um, if you want to learn more about kind of where WordPress is headed and where it was coming from, you know, check out this 
link. It's a pretty, it's pretty good. Um, but I want to get back into what we're here for, which is uh, what is the purpose of a modern WordPress theme? Because if any of you have been following block editing at all, you might be feeling like, uh, I, I don't really know where this is going. Um, and for the average end user, when we think about a WordPress theme, uh, modern themes are pretty far from these like mysterious black boxes that they used to be where you input content and then a custom layout just comes out the other end. Um, it's also, we're also pretty far from the days where you needed to have a complex uh, page builder system or a very uh, heavy plugin just to be able to create three columns with images and a button, right? Uh, nowadays, with full site editing, uh, the concept of even having predetermined templates is a little bit up in the air because a user could completely redo or rewrite or create new templates right from within their editor. Uh, so. In this, in this, like a modern WordPress theme, almost kind of feels like maybe it doesn't exist at all. So, in that case, like, what is the role of a theme designer now? You know, we're not a dictator anymore. So, who are we? Um, I propose that the new role of a theme designer is a creative curator. We still, we care deeply still about brand and aesthetics. That's why we do what we do. Um, but our methods and our audience have changed. So our job as a creative curator is to provide a thorough set of thoughtfully curated opinions, patterns, styles, layouts, templates uh, that actually function as suggestions for the end user to be able to build their content off of. And that includes a lot of different things that we should be providing, right? We're not necessarily building bespoke layouts. We do have to think about color typography and spacing. We have to take into account all of the different core blocks and some third party blocks. Um, and we want to create all of these rules for how all of these things combine uh, within the content and really help our end user be able to build these compelling layouts that are still understandable and on brand. So we don't just design the experience for the website visitor, which we've been doing as theme designers. We are also designing the experience for the content creators. We are curating the content building experiences to enable their guided creativity. So we're asking ourselves a lot of questions as designers. You know, are we, do we need full site editing for this? Do we need to support every single block style option? Um, how much control do we want to give the end user? And uh, how free or locked down should our content creation be, right? So as creative curators, uh, we can extend and enhance the block editing experience by providing maybe additional styles, patterns, and controls for blocks that already exist. Um, you know, so the questions we're asking ourselves are like, do we want to maybe create some block patterns or pre-populated blocks for our content within our theme? Uh, do we want these to be changeable or do we want them to be fixed? Uh, do we want to extend any of the core blocks that are already available with maybe some custom styles or controls? Do we want to provide multiple sets of styles? Are we including any styles from maybe some specific third-party plugins or other blocks? So then our job is we're not creating these pixel perfect solutions anymore. We are creating comprehensive design systems where many future solutions can flourish because we're not just thinking about how do our design decisions impact our current content. We're thinking about how will our design decisions impact all of our future content as well. If you've ever heard me talk before, you know I love talking about design systems, and I'm going to do it again because they're great. Um, how many of you are familiar with the concept of design systems? Probably, probably a lot of you, which is awesome. Um, as a review, uh, this is a language from InVision. Uh, design system is a collection of reusable components guided by clear standards that can be assembled together to build any number of applications. And one of my favorite things to talk about when we talk about design systems, and I think it gets increasingly relevant in WordPress, is atomic design. Um, how many of you have heard of atomic design? Probably several of you at this point. Yes. Um, if you don't know about it, it's basically just like chemistry. So I know you all remember your high school chemistry, and this will be easy. Um, it goes from our least complex thing, which is atoms, then atoms become molecules, molecules become organisms, and then the metaphor breaks down because it organisms become templates and templates become pages. Um, but what you have to remember is that we're going from like the, the least complex to the most complex, uh, the smallest to largest, and the most general to the most specific. 
There's a fun animation here kind of showing how atoms evolve into molecules, which then evolve into organisms, and then these come together to become a template, which then becomes a page. So that's super fun, and we're going to be talking a little bit about this kind of as review. So first of all, we've got atoms. Atoms are the smallest building blocks, and atoms, in this case, would be all of our HTML elements. Um, this is a really fun graphic that I found, the periodic table of HTML elements, pretty clever. Um, but basically, you're noticing that it is all of your uh, unique HTML elements, but this also includes you know, your, your colors, your typography, your various utility classes. Those would all be considered atoms as well. Um, so as an example, and this is from uh, Pattern Lab, which is Brad Frost's uh, site. Brad Frost is the person who kind of coined the term for atomic design. You, know, you can see an image, a heading, uh, color swatch, paragraphs, an input. These are all atoms. They are not very exciting on their own, much like atoms. They're just kind of floating there, not doing anything. But eventually, we can build some cool stuff out of them. And that's when we start getting into molecules. Um, where we are combining HTML elements together in uh, specific useful ways. So as an example, you know, maybe it's an image with a caption, maybe it's a, a title with a link, maybe it's you know, a small bit of uh, a list that is navigation, or a, a photo matched up with maybe a title. So you're starting to see these, these start to look like stuff. These look like content. These look like content patterns. Um, still not that exciting yet. They're still kind of floating out there, not really doing anything. Um, but that's when we start getting into organisms, which is when we're now combining several different molecules together. Uh, and we're going to start recognizing these as maybe some block level elements, right? Um, but usually organisms are more complex, they're repeatable, and they're their own contained unit of content. So some examples might be uh, a gallery of images, or uh, a list of several posts, or an entire form with multiple inputs and a submit button. Those would be great examples of organisms. In the context of full site editing and templates as well, um, Variants of the same group of content would also be considered an organism. So these are like several variants of a header of a site, uh, each of which could be included inside a, a full site editing theme. Um, footers, sidebars, other similar things. You might have several different organisms. And that's when we also start getting into stuff like templates. Um, so if we're starting to combine these block level organisms together in different ways, we're starting to build templates, which are, again, repeatable combinations of organisms. And these often are entire layouts or entire content stories. So for example, this, um, you might recognize some of these elements from some of the other pages, but now we're starting to combine uh, headers and content and sidebars and footers, and we have now started creating templates, right? These can be replaced with other things. And then we have pages, which is where you take a template and put real content into it. So again, you uh, have specific content, so uh, you could have the same template multiple pages. Great example, here is a template, here is some content, right? So we're all following, atomic design makes total sense, great. So how has the move towards block-based content and full site editing made WordPress theme design more atomic? Because I think, I've been talking about atomic design for years, and I think as block editing has become more and more pervasive, this is more and more relevant. And in order to do that, I want to talk you through a little bit about the structure of kind of a traditional or a hybrid theme versus a new full site editing theme and kind of what we're looking at when I, when I start talking about these things. So first of all, um, this is a, a standard theme, which can also be used as a hybrid theme. A hybrid theme meaning you can, you're still writing PHP, but you can support a lot of the block content editor stuff. This is your basic file structure. There's a lot of other things. But you, know, you have your, your functions.php, your index.php, your style sheets, um, any other PHP templates that you want to support following the template hierarchy. Um, you have any, any other functions in your includes folder if you want to, any assets like CSS, JavaScript images you want to include, right? Um, and then you also have, uh, you can have a, a theme.json file. And again, I said I'm going to talk about it a lot because it's kind of a big deal. Um, and it is usable in PHP-based themes as well as in full site editing themes. So I think we should all be paying attention to that. 
And then you have a full set editing theme. And the biggest difference you'll notice is that uh, there's not that much PHP left anymore. I mean, you're still using it to write functions. But we have all of these like HTML markup block template things. And it's a very different structure now. You still have you know, your functions, your index, your style. Um, but all of your content now lives in templates and template parts. It's a little bit different. And then we have this new folder called styles, which actually contains other JSON files if you want it to. Uh, so this is real exciting. So I just wanted to like kind of give an overview of these things, because depending on whether you're doing a hybrid theme or a full set editing theme, it might work a little bit differently. I wanted to bring just a little bit of attention to how styling themes works, uh, because some new things have been introduced, again, with the theme.json. So traditionally, you know, we're using a style.css and then also maybe an editor style.css now that we have the block editor. Um, these are both required uh, if you want your front end and your editor to look the same. Um, I guess you could also just enqueue your style.css in the editor, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because they have a few different needs. Um, but you can use these on their own. Uh, you can also, if you're using a theme.json file, use these to supplement that. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I did want to also bring up the styling with theme.json. So this is the newest styling tool. Um, like I said, it can be used in both a hybrid or a full site editing theme. And what's cool about it is it automatically generates things that are loaded in both the front end and the editor. Um, it generates both uh, CSS variables and also CSS styles, depending on what part of it you're working on. Um, and it's, it's responsible for like most of the styles in full-site editing. I say most because I think the ultimate intent is for you to basically be writing almost all of your styling in theme.json. I, as a CSS person, support where that's going, but am skeptical that more complicated things can be written in a JSON file as opposed to a CSS file. But it will certainly be taking care of the bulk of your styling in full-site editing. So something to pay attention to. And now we'll get into actually how do we map all this atomic design stuff I just talked about to uh, WordPress theme itself. Um, so we kind of divide it into a few different categories. Um, I have you know your atoms, molecules, and organisms. I also put like kind of as a pre-atom. I have this thing called settings uh, that could be an atom, but I kind of think it's a little different because we're talking about you know editor settings, block options, stuff that's even kind of before you encounter an atom. And then we have our atoms, molecules, organisms, and then for layout, our templates and our pages. Um, I also want to mention, so I'm going to start showing some examples. And uh, most of my examples are actually examples that have the Gutenberg plugin activated. Uh, I know that that is you know, kind of the, the bleeding edge stuff that they're working on. I like to enable it for my personal stuff because I want to be, I want to be aware of what's coming. And generally, it's a pretty good indicator of what's going to be coming next in core. So just so you know, you might see some stuff on here as examples that aren't necessarily in core now, but probably will be soon. So first of all, in our settings, uh, theme.json, there is uh, an entire kind of section of theme.json that is basically just about determining what the content editor is going to see when they are creating blocks. Um, this kind of replaced a good deal of the stuff that they were doing with add theme support. Um, but basically, this is these, these things here determine if a, if a particular control is going to be available in the editor. And there's a lot of controls that exist right now. Um, there's you know, whether or not you want them to see a color picker, whether or not you want them to be able to pick font sizes or font families, whether you want them to be able to control border radiuses, whether you want them to be able to control spacing, all of those kinds of things. Now, this isn't setting the values of those things. This is saying, like, can my user set custom values of these things, which is important because, again, designers were often concerned with branding. Um, so I provided an example of a you know, paragraph block. And on the left is with everything enabled so your user can do whatever they want. And on the right is a bunch of stuff turned off. And this is the same exact core block. And all we did is change whether they're true or false in theme.json. So this is really great if you have a pretty strict brand and you don't want your users doing like bright red giant text in a weird font, right? So we can, we can turn that off. So we have controls here, even though this is still a custom editor. We also have options as theme designers to kind of extend the user interface for existing blocks by creating additional styles or settings. Um, 
So this actually helps kind of reduce the need to build a new block. So if you're like, I wish I had a paragraph block, but it just looked like this, well, maybe instead of creating a custom block for that, you could just create a style for that in order for your end user to be able to select that. So I kind of created, I showed an example of like, here's something that I did for the cover block where we have our, our default style. And then I also created a few other styles that have some special things and they just click on it and it, it loads. Um, so these are all different things. You can also create custom block controls for existing blocks. Uh, that the, the block styles are something that you, you can do within PHP, the controls you have to do within React. So um, depends on where your, where your stack is at. But this is something that I found to be really nice uh, for being able to give users more options without having to create more bespoke blocks. Then we get into our theme.json variables. So um, theme.json generates a lot of CSS variables. And CSS variables, if you're not familiar with them, are basically just uh, a, a value that is output in the, in the like, header in your CSS. Um, this is the format that they follow. So if you, if you look at uh, the font sizes, for example, it would be you know, WP preset, font size, slug name, so extra small as an example, and that's how it would output. Um, there are several different presets WordPress currently supports. I believe there will probably be more as time goes on, but they support a lot right now in terms of color, typography, layout, and spacing. And these ones you'll, you'll be able to recognize if you go inspect your editor because they will have that WP preset at the beginning of them. But these, again, are defining. These aren't outputting styles. They're not styling a specific element. They're just saying, like, here are the colors that are available. Here are the sizes that are available. Here's the widths that are available. This is what they are. We can reference them later. Um, Theme.json also supports creating your own custom variables, which right now I am using extensively. I think it's great. Um, you can create custom settings as detailed or as granular as you like. Um, I'm really in favor of doing this, whether you're doing a full site editing theme or a standard theme, uh, because you can basically create a single source of truth for all of your different values. And then you can reference that either in theme.json or in your style.css. And then as things evolve, rather than having to rewrite things everywhere, you can just like you know move stuff out of CSS into JSON or maybe change the value in one place. It'll update a bunch of other places. So I'm, I'm in favor of doing this. Um, as a methodology. And as more and more of these are supported as part of the preset styles, we can either move them out of our custom styles or just reference our custom style in our preset style. Uh, either way, it makes it a little bit easier to evolve. But this is the kind of, if, you, if you're looking, if you're inspecting a theme and you see WP custom and then a bunch of other stuff, that means it is a custom variable defined in this custom section of theme.json. Um, another thing, uh, so we're talking about elements. Remember, our atoms are HTML elements, stuff like headings and paragraphs and stuff like that. Um, there are several kind of block level elements that uh, theme.json will actually output styles. So this isn't outputting a variable. This is actually outputting CSS styles. Uh, so instead of writing the CSS, it'll do that. Um, I would recommend doing this if you're doing a full site editing theme. You can also take care of styling your elements within your CSS if you're doing a hybrid theme. Uh, but either way, you can reference some of these variables that we already created. So that is kind of all of our, all of our atomic things. And I'm showing you just like a bunch of unreadable JSON, which is totally fine. You don't actually have to be able to read this right now. But just kind of showing you as an example of like, what does this look like and where you're going to be looking, where you're going to be looking for it in your theme. Then we get into molecules. Um, so molecules, again, if you remember, they are combinations of atoms. Um, many of the simple blocks that you're going to encounter in both the content editor and full site editing would be considered molecules, um, where we've combined a few HTML elements into a more complex component. So you might recognize you know, quotes, lists, buttons, forms, uh, images, audio, post elements like the, the author, post meta, um, post summaries different navigation elements like the site logo, uh, taglines, menus, et cetera. Uh, I, I've included, and again, I'll have a list, uh, I'll have a link to all the slides afterwards. You don't feel like you have to panic and try to read all this stuff. Um, there's a link to uh, kind of all the core blocks, and many of these would be considered molecules. Now, within theme.json, if you are doing full site editing, there is actually a styles section where instead of writing CSS to style these blocks, um, you can write JSON to style these blocks, and it will target a specific block. So if you know, you know the, the block slug, like the button one is, I think that's the one that I have as an example here. You, know, you can give it 
certain parameters that it supports. So you can style the border radius right from here by referencing uh, you know, another thing. You can style the typography, the font family, all this different stuff. Right from theme.json, it's kind of fun. Um, or you can do it in, in CSS uh, if you're doing a hybrid theme. But the point is that there are a lot of uh, support for uh, atoms and molecules like right in the JSON file. So that's pretty neat. Speaking of organisms. Now we get into uh, several different things, one being more complex blocks. Um, some blocks I would consider organisms that, you know, these are things that contain several other blocks. They're introducing complex functionality and other settings, uh, stuff like the you know, layout blocks, like the, the cover block, the column block, the group blocks, um, mixed media blocks, stuff like you know, galleries, uh, the, the widget blocks, also query blocks, which are pretty powerful. Those are the ones where you're pulling in a whole bunch of posts into one block I would consider an organism. Um, and a lot of other custom blocks, these things that are you know, testimonials or like a, a slider or something like that. These are, these are generally considered organisms and these are more complex. Um, these don't necessarily have the, the core blocks you can style via theme.json. Most of these you're probably going to be writing styles for traditionally in style.css. But again, thinking of it atomically, these are our complex blocks. They're inheriting our styles from the atoms and molecules, and then they're just getting more complex. Uh, PHP template parts would also be considered an organism. So if you've been writing traditional themes, you know, uh, these are just you know, headers, footers, sidebars, different re repeatable bits of content that are included in our broader site. Um, kind of just an example of like, you know, here's where you'd see them in the theme structure. Um, also, full site editing template parts would be considered organisms. Again, headers, footers, and other reusable content. The difference being, instead of just being included as a PHP file, here they are, and they are selectable in the site editor. And you can see them. There's a whole template parts section. So that language is actually getting exposed to our end user, which is interesting. <laughs> um, block patterns I would consider an organism, and these are fun. So uh, commonly used groups of core or custom blocks that can be pre-configured and inserted all at once. Uh, I find them very useful. They can be defined either using register block pattern in PHP or um, you include them in the patterns folder and then list them in your theme.json file for uh, full site editing. Um, about patterns, they show up in the same place that you search for blocks. They are tagged, they're sortable, they're searchable. Kind of an example here, uh, some patterns that I built into my personal theme. You know, you can sort them by type and then you, it's just like, you know, basically a combination of stuff that makes it really easy to build stuff. Um, again, those, those three columns with images, text, and buttons, you could just build a pattern for that instead of expecting your end user to try to assemble that out of blocks. Um, Reusable blocks, these are interesting. I'm not really sure, like, they had a really good use case. I'm not really sure where that use case is going as we move into full site editing. But basically what reusable blocks are is you can actually, like, create a block in the editor and then save it as a reusable block. And then if you place it in any other spot, when you update the content in that block, it updates everywhere. It's kind of nice if you're building, like, a call to action or something. Not necessarily sure where this is going to go once we have now you know, let people build template parts and other things in the site editor. It may become obsolete. It might still be useful. But it's still a thing that exists, and it's still a thing you should be aware of. Um, and that also, if you have any, will show up in the same block editor. Uh, so here's my really great call to action as an example. And this is just every, if I change the text anywhere, it'll change everywhere. And, and that's fun. Um, and then we get into templates, right? So now we're, we're combining all these blocks into bigger things. Um, both full set editing and traditional themes follow the template hierarchy. So they'll, you'll, you'll recognize that if you're familiar with it. Um, some of the PHP templates that you might be familiar with are standard, you know, standard page templates, whether those are template hierarchy or custom page templates you can select in the template editor. Um, also post type block templates. What I mean by that, if you've ever uh, use a plugin like the events calendar is a good example and you open up they use the block editor and you open up a blank event and there's already a bunch of blocks on the page for you that's a, a post type block template those are really useful as a, as a theme design to be in again example of uh, PHP templates there they are and then also full site editing templates so these are you know the core templates you would expect um, they can be created custom or they can be assembled out of the full site editing template parts. 
So again, we're kind of we're building it kind of in a similar way to PHP, but these show up in the editor in the template section where you, they you can see they have uh, template hierarchy names. So your single, your in, your you know index, your search, etc. And then we have the concept of pages in atomic design. Now, obviously, we think of pages as you know a single page of content, but I would also argue that different views that are created by full site editing. So maybe like a, a this specific page maybe has this content, but it also has this header and footer and sidebar configuration. That would be considered a page. Um, stuff to think about when you're starting to think about atomic design. I also wanted to mention one of the cool things that they started doing, and this is especially if you're doing, I think, like commercial themes or variable themes more so than bespoke client themes, is being able to include multiple variations of JSON styles within your theme. So. Uh, your end user would be able to switch between different styles without switching themes. That looks kind of like this. So in your site editor, it looks like this right now. There's, there's some uh, discussion on making this user interface a little bit more usable. But um, your end user would be able to go into the style section and be able to completely change what their theme looks like. And that's something that you as a theme person could include. Uh, I wanted to kind of close this by talking a little bit about, I mean, I said a lot of good stuff and how it works, but I, I did want to also address that there are kind of a lot of concerns and considerations when you're working with this right now. Um, this is, I mean, it's not bleeding edge technology from a, from like a technical standpoint. Like this is, the technology powering this is pretty tried and true, but it is still not even close to the most widely adopted form of WordPress interface. And a lot of it is still either officially in beta or, basically still in beta, even if it's not. So there's a lot of things to be thinking about. And I wanted to kind of um, acknowledge that while I'm standing up here. Um, many elements of the block editor and full set editing are still in flux. Um, CSS class names might change, how core blocks are styled might change, different experimental APIs might change. Um, so I just wanted to present a series of questions that don't really have answers yet, but I do believe that these are questions theme authors are going to be thinking about in the near future. So one is like, how do we address breaking changes, right? Because you know, I I I don't want to be you know, it's hard to be shipping software that might break. Um, so things we're going to be thinking about, you know, how how do we know when we should be using this? Um, how do we monitor these updates? You know, how do we provide support or updates if we choose to use new features? Right, this is stuff we have to be thinking about. Um, where and how should we be defining our styles? I just gave you, I, you know, every other sentence was like, oh, you could put it in theme.json or you could put it in style.css, right? And instead of giving you an answer to that, I'm like, great question. <laughs> um, but we, you know, besides just deciding where we're going to style something, we have to think about, you know, how much are we going to be accounting for WordPress's core styles? Do we want to include them? Do we want to overwrite them? Um, how do we deal, if we want to include them, how do we deal with battling against their specificity in CSS, right? Also the question, you know, are themes supposed to be unique or are they supposed to be standardized? You know, if content are des and design are mixed, which they are, you know, what happens when themes change? Like, does that break something in your content? Um, how do we address these incompatible style issues between themes? Um, how do we address the assumptions that maybe third party blocks or plugins are making about what should be included in our theme? How long, how long is a theme supposed to last now, right? I mean, now that it's becoming more ambiguous, now that it can evolve along with our content, you know, are we even going to be changing themes? Or are we just going to change all of our options within the theme and just keep the same theme? Or are we going to be just like loading some new like JSON files and some new patterns in there and just like keeping our theme forever? Like how long are we supposed to be supporting this? And also, and this is you know the fun one, how are we supposed to learn all this new technology, right? Like, oh man, like I just I just learned WordPress and I have to like learn new WordPress? Dang. I mean, there are there is a lot of new tooling involved. There's a, a new markup language, you know, you have to get familiar with JSON. If you want to write blocks, you have to learn React. Um, you know, modifying anything with JavaScript, you're gonna have to learn a whole bunch of build tools, or at least find a good framework that does a lot of it for you. And working with this stuff, it's a little bit harder to learn by reading because a lot of this stuff is a little bit obfuscated. You know, you used to be able to just like open up WordPress core and just like read the PHP file and be like, I see. Um, but now it's a little bit harder to kind of figure out where everything is and how it all works. You have to kind of work a bit harder to do it. That's a little unfortunate. But despite all of these things, you know, I, my key takeaway here 
is that theme design might be evolving, but it is still a crucial part of the WordPress ecosystem. So I say, let's help people build creative content. Um, I have a list of resources, so these will be included in the slides, but different things if you want to learn more about design systems, if you want to learn more about the block editor and full site editing in general. But this is a slide to take a picture of. Um, here's me. Um, this is how you get a hold of me. This, uh, this link right there is where these slides are located, so that's the bit.ly link, Future of Themes 2022. Uh, if you want to find me next, I'll be at the social. I'm online on WordPress, Slack, and Twitter. And in person, I don't know whatever's next, but I hope to see all of you again. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Michelle. <laughs> we have about uh, seven minutes for questions. If anyone has a question in the audience, raise your hand, and I'll come over to you. It was such an incredible presentation. Thank you. Very thorough. One? Oh, I'm we got sorry. one. Thank yeah. you. Not thank quite you. as Just, thorough. Oh, we go. Here, here they come. Here they come. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll answer a kind of similar question that I asked Rich in the previous talk: Is do you think that uh, WordPress themes these days still have room to innovate in terms of the designs, uh, with kind of the constraints that full site editing provides you? Of like, these are the options that Core can let you change. Can you still create an innovative WordPress theme? Do you think? So can you create an, an innovative WordPress with all these constraints? I mean, I think that's been the question the entire time that theming has existed. Like, as things are standardized, can we be unique? Um, I would say yes and no. Uh, it depends on what you need. I think that there are certainly cases where you can create you know, pretty interesting and revolutionary ways. Like, what if you created styles that only happened when like two blocks were up against each other in a certain way? And if they were in a different way, they did something totally different, right? Um, what if we did things where we weren't just thinking about squares and we were making things more organic? We were giving things different containers. We were, I don't know. There's lots of ways to still be able to push things and be creative just because we're working with a standard set of blocks. And I know that there are ideas in the future, especially now that like CSS is going to be supporting container queries, which is very exciting. You know, that means that you can style something based on what it's inside rather than just based on the window. Um, that's very exciting. I think there's going to be a lot of potential for that. There's going to be a lot of potential for uh, understanding you know, the context of what block is inside or near or by another block and being able to style based on that. So I think we can do a lot of stuff if we're like forward thinking and thinking about like not just here is this block, how do you style it, but like what happens if this block is here? What happens if this block is here? What if it's here? I think then we can do some cool stuff. Awesome, thank you. And we have an online question. Oh, an online question. Christine. Oh man, okay. Yeah, Maestro Stevens is asking if you can touch a little bit more on the difference between using themes versus templates because it sometimes feels like it's used interchangeably and not necessarily right. Okay, so templates live within a theme. So the theme is the parent and templates are different things within a theme. So a template will probably render a specific page view or a specific type of, of outline. I, I mean, understand. Um, so yeah, think of the theme as the parent. It contains not only your templates, but also your styles, scripts, everything else it needs to function. And then the template is something that powers some specific layout. Hope that helps. Awesome. Did and that was an online question from Meister. I think I know him in Northeast Ohio. Awesome. <laughs> Last question. Oh, OK. No pressure. Um, with full site editing and blocks becoming more and more powerful, should we be focusing on building themes or just focus on building plugins that will add the blocks that we need to create the design that we want to create? Ooh, good question. OK. Um, I think that it makes sense to do both. So uh, uh, being able to control the theme means you're kind of controlling the kind of like main stack. And then being able to add plugins means that you can make that stack more extensible. So I think that most of the brand should probably still live in a theme. But perhaps that can be like very extensible in a lot of different ways with a lot of different plugins. So I imagine, I mean, this kind of happened before when we were doing you know page builder based things or custom field based things where we would have our theme but then when we wanted to do like all the cool stuff to the theme we would add all this other stuff on top of it i think blocks aren't aren't going to be that different than that okay thank you actually i do think we have time for another question if, Ooh, if encore 
Hi, great. <laughs> I see you. There you go. Oops, excuse me. Thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. It, it's really excellent. Um, I guess I'm wondering, this is all, a lot of this is pretty new, um, and where would one go if one wanted to just start playing around with this theme.json, you know, this, this whole ecosystem? Like, is there kind of a starter theme that you can just mess around with? Um, yeah, what are some resources? Sure, I mean, I think 2022 is a good one just because that, that was kind of like the first kind of core theme that came out that supported it in, in detail. I also recommend going to fullsiteediting.com that's been one of my favorite resources so far, and they, they keep it very much up to date, and they go into pretty great detail about like what is and isn't supported right now. So I think between those two things, you'll, you'll get a lot of great examples. All right, give it up. Thanks, Michelle. Yay. That was incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much.
All right. Welcome to the 315 session. Uh, we have a few announcements before we get started. Uh, we'd like to first thank our sponsors uh, for the generation, generous support um, making this event possible. Please take a moment to visit them in the, the sponsor hall. They're breaking down now, so they have a lot of goodies if you want to run by and get some. Um, please join us for the uh, WordCamp Social at the end of today over on Riverfront Park. Also remember, tomorrow is Contributor Day uh, starting at 9 o'clock, so look for folks with the yellow lanyard if you have any questions. Actually, our next presenter is going to have one, so if you want to seek them out and ask them questions, that's good too. Don't forget to use hashtag WordCamp US, WCUS, to share your photos on social media. And we'd love to see your photos. Also, there's going to be an official collaborative photo album, so look for signs or at the QR code around the venue. Uh, this next uh, speaker is very special to me. During the pandemic, uh, I'm an early riser, for those that may not know. I get up really early. I'm on the West Coast here at 5 o'clock. I run down the stairs on Wednesdays uh, during the pandemic, and I would log into his meetup in London. And that was one of the highlights of getting us through that really terrible time. So it's an honor for me to present him at this point. Our next session is Empowering Local Stores, Learn from the Tech Giants While Staying Local with Ronald Giselle. Ronald is a co-host of Do the Woo, the Woo Commerce London Meetup, aforementioned, and co-organized various other meetups and word camps. He's spoken and hosted over 120 online and in real life uh, sessions in the past five years since getting more involved in the WooCommerce and WooPress, WordPress community. He loves sharing and talking with experts on new and inventive ways to support this, the mission of democratizing commerce. Please welcome Ronald to the stage. I should, yeah, you can hear me. Thank you so much, that's uh, great honor. So, Empowering local stores learn from the tech giants while staying local. So I'm speaking to you as developers, as freelancers and consultants. Um, the WooCommerce economy was worth around $31 billion in 2021, a whole lot more this year as well. But uh, to put it into perspective, that's similar to uh, the countries of uh, Latvia or Estonia. Now our statistics tell us that around 60% of stores are influenced by people like you. That's a lot of power we have in this room, and I'm glad more than five people turned up. <laughs> it wouldn't quite work. So this is me. I am data. I did not forget to update the slides. Hopefully also you find me a lot more interesting than this. But what really matters is this for stores. So looking at these um, lines, and I'm sorry if at the back you can't quite see it, but how likely do you think I'm in the market for a smartwatch? Maybe one of those with uh, a fancy nautical feature, a Garmin. So I do what millions of us do every day, and that's to go to Google and find a good deal. I have a budget of around $250. But from the first instance from the search uh, result, I realized that that's not going to get me far. Uh, you can't see the prices, but the prices ranges from around $200 to $2,000. Um, also, it's pretty overwhelming. I can see who are the dominant market base, marketplaces that appear right at the top. But Ron, you must shop local. These are some of the quotes that I used in a, uh, in a presentation for uh, WordCamp Santa Clarita a couple of years ago. But come on, who shops for such a specific item at a at your local high street. Most likely they will not have them in stock. And you know, what's better than next day delivery and free returns? Exactly, it's just same day pickup. Because local shops now can have an advantage over leading marketplaces, which is through Google Shopping. If you search for something, you can now filter by what's nearby. And labels tell you how far away it is and if it's actually in stock. That's a huge, huge advantage you can have now. So as a local retailer, what do you have to do? Upload your whole catalog into the Google Merchant Center. It's free and it even supports um, organic listings. So my first of five points is that in shopping, you know, set up, upload all your products 
if you know your audience, and I've demonstrated that you can filter, um, it's still anonymous, that's why I'm still data at the moment. Um, you can, uh, so as soon as somebody then searches for a specific product that you have in stock, you have a very good chance you appear right on top. If you want to promote it a little bit more, if you know your bu budget for marketing, set a return on acquisition spend and just run with it. So now we have the customer on our side. How do we convert them into making that purchase? So 66% will opt for the free delivery, even though it's more expensive. Zero and uh, free is a very powerful emotion because actually you get people to spend a little bit more. But in the way I see it, we still lose a third of customers. So this is an easy way. You match the price and offer free delivery. So now in this way, we have all 100% of customers buying from you in theory. If we do quick maths, 400 customers, you probably have a cost of an additional $1,000 on uh, postage or shipping cost. But you then have acquired 100 customers, so we only have to make them, then make them purchase a second or even a third time, and then suddenly it's seen as an investment. It's a different way of looking at it. I do understand you can't discount your products and services just to buy customers. So let's have a look at an easy way to increase the average order value. This is a pretty tough upsell, right? Somebody comes in for the lovely gray one, but really I want to sell them the hot pink item. Suddenly that hot pink item doesn't look so bad when you match it to, or uh, put it next to a, maybe a more expensive price. When I didn't know about the Garmin watch, when I set myself a $250 budget, from the first instant I realized that $250 wasn't going to get me far, so I upped that budget to $500. Now I need to justify that spending that money. Um, think of a wine list, so you don't know what the price for wine is, but you open the wine list, you see the budget option, you see the most expensive option, and you choose a wine that sort of fits uh, within your budget and feels like the best value. So price benchmarking is a very common place on marketplaces. Here's another example where you bundle products and now it's almost impossible to compare this with your competitors. And remember what the, the emotion you get when something is for free. I'm sure you all had some lovely swag from the WooCommerce stand. And how does that make you feel? Pretty good, right? So my second point is benchmark your price. Benchmark it against your competitor, a competitor and maybe more ex uh, important to uh, benchmark it against or within your own uh, products uh, catalog. Figure out what, I what is the trigger that makes a customer feel they get the best value. And remember what happened to me when I was searching for a watch. And you maybe have your own example as well. Um, maybe a bit of homework is to, next time you search for a product, go on a marketplace and figure out, figure out what is influencing your decision. It's not always on price, but it's also on reviews, maybe a bundle or even free delivery. So here's a way to get customer details without them needing to make a purchase. I'm sure lots of you are familiar with this screen for browsing for an Apple Watch. It's actually really nifty because you list every single combination. You don't need to click away to go to another page and compare the different tabs on features. But it's a lead generator. Retailers have now the option to capture details and then market the product that's, that you like um, pretty much straight away in your inbox. At this point, I still haven't bought a watch. I've done a lot of research, but I wanted to extend my shopping research a little bit longer. So at this point, I know three stores should know that I'm interested in purchasing a Garmin because I've visited them on a number, number of occasions. Um, I visited one particular page many times. Remember, my name is still Data, so they don't know who I am. <laughs> um, now, this is it, it, what should have happened. If, if you're a retailer, if you're a store owner, if you understand or figure out when, uh, what conversion window, let's say 80% of your customers make a purchase, that still leaves 20% who didn't make a purchase. Try to empathize with them. Why are they not making a purchase? Going to the competitor um, or they've lost interest. Trigger an action. Test if they're still interested. interested. Ask, would you like to pick it up today? We can reserve it. If they're interested and you figure that out through uh, a click, maybe mail marketing, um, but they still haven't purchased after a week, 
offer a free gift. Maybe it's a, an extended discount or a warranty. But if they're interested and still haven't purchased, then go in for the deal. Maybe at this time you've only have 10% to convince and with a 10% discount across the board is well, one or two percent or so that you invest. So my third point is competition is fierce. Analyze your customer and build a marketing automation or as I call it a mouse trap. So back to my watch purchase and now I'll tell you what really happened. So I'm sitting in the, in the car park for waiting for my son to finish his tennis session. I probably should have gone for a run, but that's the whole point why I'm buying the watch to remind myself to get off my lazy backside. Um, anyway, I do get an email, and this email is 12% off if I purchase the watch over in the next 12 hours. I didn't have my wallet with me. I was thinking, shall I wait until next day? I probably lose the discount. Not only that, that 12% actually brings me into the bracket of which I think that's good value. That's exactly the budget I set for myself. So what I do? Of course I hit Apple Pay. So that's my point. If you haven't got a quick sort of no sign in payment option available on your site, this is a really quick win. And so many sites still don't have them available. So if you're a developer, go speak to your, uh, to your clients. It's fast, it's secure, and it leads to higher conversions. Um, and they also alternative, alternative or local payment types. And even now in terms as well, payment in terms. So now I've totally justified a purchase. As I said, I've had a discount that converted me to buying it. Uh, I saved around $80. Um, of course, to my friends, I will tell I saved $100. I might even tell them which shop I bought, them, bought the item from, which is, you know, word of mouth. And there's a value in that as well. Um, but consider, would I have bought it if that quick checkout wasn't available? Because I didn't have my cards with me, and I can definitely not remember the last three digits of the, the security code. The last point I'm going to make is um, a decider of uh, buying an item, whether to buy or not to buy, which is to do with customer support. And often this is happening post-purchase or when you return an item. It is one of the biggest drivers to make a decision and create a customer, create a, a customer loyal, loyal customer. And returns are impacting profits. It is really very tricky to rival the customer support of the big, massive, marketplace. You hear of people buying five pairs of shoes in different sizes and returning at least four of them. So for the local merchant, that's, that's really very uh, costly to deal with that. I can't change people's behavior, but I do realize out of these six common reasons to return an item, there are at least four of them that we see as, I see as an opportunity for developers to uh, take on. The first one is to describe an item really well. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but set the ex right expectations. And that, of course, does mean lots of pictures and even video. The second one is a confirmation email, a really clear confirmation, e confirmation email. You ordered size 12, maybe it's not right, and give them a chance to put it right before you send it. Um, you might even make a second purchase or an additional purchase there. For the third reason, if it doesn't fit, ask the customer to uh, buy the correct size straight away and promise an additional discount if they return the item. In that way, you've secured your customer and you might even have a chance for a second purchase. And build a form to, to uh, manage returns. Making it awkward is definitely not going to make you more profit. And there they are. That's my final quick point. Um, and the last one is to do with returns. It's a scary cost, but do analyze each of the um, returns and treat it like an opportunity. And remember, you have fought very hard to acquire a customer in the first place. Thank you very much for listening. I'm powering local stores learn from the tech giants. My name is Ron. Thank you so much, Ron. Okay, as we get uh, transition to our next uh, presenter, I'll just start with the introduction. So thanks, Ron. Thank you so much.
Uh, we have a few short announcements before we get started with our next session. We'd like to thank our sponsors, as without the generous contribution of our sponsors, this event would not be possible. Please take a moment to visit them in the sponsor hall if you're able to. Please join us for the WordCamp Social. It starts at 7 p.m. tonight at Riverfront Park. Uh, we'd love to see you at Contributor Day tomorrow, starting at 9 o'clock. If you have questions, look for someone with the yellow lanyard, and they'll be able to help you. Don't forget to use the hashtag WCUS when you share your photos on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We'd love to see your photos. Uh, the WordCamp, an official collaborative photo album. Look for the signs around with the, uh, the quick QR code. I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, <laughs> who's one of my heroes. Um, finding and fixing the six most common WCAG 2 failures with Joe Dolson. Joe is a WordPress develop plugin developer, a core committer, and a web accessibility consultant. He is part of the Make WordPress accessibility team, the team dedicated to improving accessibility in the WordPress ecosystem. Find Joe on Twitter at Joe Dolson or at Joe Dolson Accessible Web Design. Please welcome Joe Dolson. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, this is a quick talk, so I'm going to have to dive right in. So this talk is, of course, about the six most common WCAG 2 errors, and this is according to automated tools. So really, at its heart, this is a talk about using automation effectively. Automation is something that gets talked about in the accessibility world frequently in only a negative light, and that's because automation can really only detect approximately 30% of types of accessibility errors. But that ability to detect errors is still really crucial. These tools, and it doesn't matter which tool, when we start to talk about these six errors, all of the automated tools can find them. They are a universal thing. These are simple errors, they are objective. And so using this automation to find these errors is going to save you a lot of money and effort. Automation is characteristic characterized in the accessibility world by quick results. It processes a high volume of data. You can crawl your entire website, pull up all of these documents, and you can integrate it with other testing tools. But it also comes with the challenges that it has an extremely incomplete scope. That's that 30% I talked about. And it has relatively low accuracy outside of some of these very objective problems but that still comes with a lot of value. And this talk is ultimately also about efficiency. This is about using consultants effectively, and it's about using automation effectively. And automation in accessibility is a lot different from most web development testing. This is how the general purpose accessibility assessment goes. And this is what I do all the time, so this is from my personal experience. Somebody sends me the URL for an active live website that they've never had audited before. They've never looked at the accessibility of that site. I document painstakingly hundreds of repetitive issues throughout the site and also find a selection of unique or potentially very subjective problems. And then I send that client a monstrous, horrible, 100 plus page report describing everything they've done wrong. Shockingly, those reports are not wonderful. They're not fun to work with. They're overwhelming. They have so much information in them. So it would be great if we could make it so I did less work and you had a shorter document to deal with. Hundreds of repetitive issues. And in a very specific way, I can say that in recent assessments, I, would, I counted up. I looked at things that I'd been doing, and a full 50% of the issues I was reporting to clients could have been found with automation. These six most common errors come out of a study done by WebAIM. That's a nonprofit out of Utah that runs the WAVE Web Accessibility Evaluator Project. They did an automated analysis of the top million pages around the web. These are the million most frequently visited pages, the most popular pages. 
and they analyze it. They've done this four times now in 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022. And a few key selected statistics. On average, these pages exhibited about 51 errors per page. That's a little bit frightening. 96.8% of those pages had at least one failure. And if you went to Sarah Cannon's talk earlier, she mentioned a number of those 97.4% of pages had at least one failure in the 2021 study. So things are getting better <laughs> by a really, really small margin. And of these errors, 96.5% of every error they were able to detect autom with automation were one of these six types. Wow, that's only six different varieties of error that come up to that many, that high a percentage. Wouldn't it be great if you used some automation, dealt with that, and found them in advance? And just because it's only 30% of types of errors, don't imagine that these aren't impactful. These six errors, for your users, they can generate unidentifiable forms, unusable links, unusable controls. There's loss of information, things that people can't read, can't understand, or can't absorb. For your companies, this might lead to lost leads, lost sales, lost opportunities. It can be thousands of dollars in extra consultant expense, and you could just identify and document these easily. So I'm 10 minutes into my talk, and I haven't even talked about the errors. And that's why, oh, that's 10 minutes left. Hey, I misunderstood what I was told earlier. That's great. I was a little worried by being 10 minutes into the talk and I haven't even addressed the title yet. But that's okay, because really this is about automation, right? So these are the top six errors. These errors are globally on the top million homepages are 96.5% of the problems found. Now, obviously, that's 96.5% within that narrow band of 30% that can be tested. Those other problems haven't been dealt with yet. But as I mentioned earlier, in my own assessments, I found that a full 50% of my reports were automatically identifiable errors. So what that tells you is that these automatically detectable faults are overrepresented in the data. Those are more common than the more difficult problems to find. So getting through these is actually going to reduce the volume in a much more significant way. So the errors. Number one, low contrast text. That's where you've got your gray text on a white background, or you've got buttons that are yellow and white, or teal and white. Uh, these are very popular combinations. They're pretty, they're wonderful. That doesn't mean you can see them. You've got images with missing, generic, or repetitive alternative text. Now, to be clear, this is not images with inappropriate alternative text. That is not something that can be tested with automation. These are images where the alt attribute is literally missing. A missing alt attribute doesn't mean the same thing as an empty alt attribute. A missing alt attribute says, we have not told you what this is. An empty alt attribute says, we are declaring that this image is decorative. And those are very, very semantically key differences. Generic, that means that you've got something that's just been plugged in with the word image or graphic. And it's just over and over again, and it's what, there's no point to that. It doesn't prove anything. It doesn't show anything. When a screen reader goes through these images, they are told this is an image. They don't need to also be told it's an image with the alt text image. The next one is form fields without labels. This is amazingly common. And that's partially because you've got a lot of form fields that use placeholders instead of labels. Placeholder is really not a label. It doesn't do the same thing. It's not permanent. It doesn't convey in the same way. It's also because sometimes form fields just have nearby text that happens to tell you what that form field is, but is only relevant if you're looking at it visually and doesn't offer any of the other benefits that a real associated label gives you. Then you've got empty links and empty buttons. This is most common because what you've got is a link that is 
containing an icon, it's a font icon, it's an SVG, it's an image that doesn't have an alt attribute. And all of those items, if they don't have text content, even if that text content is hidden, it doesn't necessarily have to be visible to be present, then they can't be used. And then the last one, which is very rare in WordPress, is a missing document language. This is an attribute on the HTML element that simply says what language the page is in. This is a Spanish page, this is a French page, this is a Japanese page. And that's critical for screen reader users because otherwise the screen reader is going to read it in their, browse, in their operating system's installation language. You know the pronunciation rules for Japanese are a little bit different than the pronunciation rules for English. And if you try and pronounce English words with Japanese rules, it doesn't always work out. So automation tests for all of this. Automation can search for your text node. It can identify that color, parse the background either from an image, a gradient, or color, frequently by using pixel sampling, because in fact, parsing that element stack is extremely complex. And it can measure that contrast ratio. It will also check the font size so that it can tell you which contrast ratio is most relevant. Wikake includes different ratios for different needs. Some ratios are going to be higher because this text is small or it is very, or you're working to a higher standard. And then you just need to fix this by making changes. You have to change some of your color choices or kind of some of your color usages. This is the only one of these top six issues that imposes a design problem. This is the only one where you actually are gonna to have to go back to that client and you're gonna to have to tell them, sorry, you're gonna to have to change your brand colors. That can be an awkward conversation. It's not always necessary. Sometimes you just change the way their brand colors are used. Use it as a border or an ornament rather than as a background color. It's, that might be easier. It depends on the context. It depends on the design of the site. You can also just darken or lighten the text. You can add shadows or opacity in on text that's in front of an image because images are highly complex and when they change, it's hard to know for sure whether it's really going to work out. The images with missing alternative text, this is one of the simplest things for automation to do. You just search for the element and say, it's not there. Done. Now the rules for actually deciding what it should be, those are more complicated. That's going to require you to actually investigate the image and work out what it is. But alt text does have some fairly straightforward rules. And there are resources to learn about more about how to do that. But the most important rule I want you to know is that alt text isn't about describing the image. Alt text is about describing the purpose of the image. And that may be describing the image because sometimes the purpose of the image is to show people the image. But sometimes the purpose is as a link to another resource, in which case what that image is actually about is the target. It's about what does this link do. And so what a user actually needs when they encounter that is to know what they're going to be linked to. Form fields without labels, that's just as easy as the alt attribute for automation to find. It's all about just finding those element associations. Does this form field have an explicitly associated label or does it have an element wrapper? Does it have an ARIA label? You have to make sure those labels are there, they have to be present, and they have to be accurate. Accurate is not something the automation can do. It does not know what type of an email you should get and it does not know what name field this is. So you have to make those decisions, but it can certainly tell you that there is a problem. The empty links and buttons, again, making sure there's a naming characteristic. Do you have an SVG file? The SVG element has some other characteristics. It's got tags that can be associated with it that'll give it an accessible name. There's a great article on CSS tricks about accessible SVGs. Uh, it takes very little time to make sure that those are fixed. Font icons can be a little bit trickier. Usually those are going to need some screen reader text that's hidden to sighted people uh, that will expose what this control is supposed to do. 
And it's exactly the same problem, whether it's a link or a button. It doesn't matter to the solution what you're trying to do. It just matters the fact that you can't tell what it is if it's not labeled correctly. And then this last one, which I put last for two reasons. One, because it's a lower frequency issue. And also because if we didn't get to it, this is a very unusual problem to have in WordPress. Because frankly, themes have pretty well solved this. And there's a WordPress core function language attributes that adds that to the HTML element. You should look at your theme. If you're using a 10-year-old theme, who knows? It could be a problem. But most modern themes, it's handled. Finally, that automation accelerates your accessibility. It makes you work with consultants more effectively, and it makes your site better even before you have a conversation with one. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joe. All right. In between, as we get prepared for our next speaker, I have some announcements. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Right. Remember tonight, uh, our social. It's, it starts at 7 p.m. at Riverfront Park, a short walk away. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors, as without their generous contribution, uh, this event would not be possible. Please take a minute to visit them in the sponsor hall or at the social tonight. We'd also like to remind you that uh, Contributor Day is tomorrow. It starts at 9 a.m. Uh, if you're on social media, use the hashtag WCUS. And we'll also have a uh, WordCamp US photos directly available to you on the WordCamp official collaborative photo album. Look for the QR code around the venue, scan it in, and it'll give you the information. All right, our next session is WordPress for the Next Generation with Klimbio Hodge. Klimbio is an entrepreneur who owns two businesses in Anguilla. He is the chairman of the Anguilla Youth Business Foundation, which offers business development support in Anguilla for persons aged 18 to 35. His businesses are centered around marketing, creative media, and tourism. Please welcome Klimbio. All right, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. I flew all the way from the island of Anguilla, a very beautiful island in the Caribbean, uh, to speak to you about youth development and WordPress. So, what is what? Are, are youth. What is the definition of youth? Now, the United Nations has a definition of youth as persons from the age of 15 to 24. Um, whereas the, the International Youth um, Business Foundation, they, they uh, sorry, the Youth Business International recognizes youth as persons aged 18 to 35, which I prefer as a definition because as a 27-year-old, I still think I'm a youth. And I'm sure many of you in here still, you, you know, your definition might be a little different than that as well. Uh, so what is youth business development? Youth business development is removing the barriers from, for entry for young persons so that they can become entrepreneurs. On that basis, we want them to be able to create businesses that can be profitable, that can be scalable, and that can also employ other young persons. Now, what is WordPress? WordPress is an open source content management system that allows persons to build websites. It also assists them to make their dreams come true. And uh, it is also a tool that is used to remove barriers. So I, I like to see a correlation between youth development and WordPress on the basis of the freedom to create, and also to remove barriers. So who am I? I had a lovely introduction earlier, but I have two businesses. The first I inherited from my father, which is a, pub a publication, a tourism publication for my island. And I took that over in 2015, um, after he ran it for 25 years. And what I did with that, along with my siblings, was to develop a marketing company. And we have delved into uh, WordPress, because we have our own web website, which hosts our, um, our magazine. And that really came about because a friend of mine who 
knew how to create WordPress um, sites just through tinkering, just through learning, like many of us here um, may have done. Um, he introduced it to me and said, you know what, I think that you need a website. I think you need to have the magazine online and so forth. Um, and then from there, I, I added more things. And then I met another young, ma young man. He said that your website could be a little better. I think you need to add this and this. And from there, he assisted me to, uh, to develop the website to what it is today, which offers e-commerce solutions and also has a magazine online. And we do a lot of content generation and so forth. But I'm also the chairman of the Anglican Youth Business Foundation, which is there to remove the barriers of entry for young persons into business, which this talk is about. Um, but I would like for us to really look at the barriers of entry for young persons in business from the perspective of WordPress. Now, as it relates to WordPress and having websites in general, for persons in my community, it almost seems like a, a distant dream. Uh, one of the main reasons for that is because uh, there is no way, uh, there were difficult ways of getting it to be monetized. Because at the end of the day, you still want to be able to make something out of the website that you have. Um, otherwise, it's just there for awareness and engagement. Uh, so, a little bit more about my island. It's located next to St. Martin. Most people know St. Martin. You can fly, you can fly into Angola from Miami as well. Uh, we have 15,000 people, and it's a British overseas territory. Continuing. So removing barriers with WordPress. WordPress has, is the demo, demo, uh, democratized publishing, uh, the freedom to build, the freedom to change, the freedom to share. And the key benefits of WordPress is you can install um, and set up with no HTML coding, which I didn't really have any knowledge of. Um, it's cost effective because it's literally free, because it's open source. Um, you, it's SEO friendly, mobile responsive, which in today's world we are all in, um, mobile users. Everyone has a mobile phone. Um, it's globally accessible. There are over 54,000 plugins that can do anything your heart desires, and you can even make it into what your heart desires as well, even if it's not necessarily um, built for that and also the ability to create blogs. Now, removing barriers to entry for youth in business. Um, with the Anglo Youth Business Foundation, there are three co core things that we want to, to remove. Uh, the bar barrier to entry for training of young persons in business, uh, removing uh, the issue of having mentors to teach you how to uh, have um, their own business, and also access to financing. So, as it relates to WordPress, um, WordPress addresses some of these things because there's a community like this that allows you to have mentorship. So that's a very important part of it. It's free and for young people who don't really have any access to income, they don't make any money, um, it's important to allow you to go on and tinker, much like myself when I started, and learn about the, the, the ability to have a website. And also uh, financing, I, I did mention that and it's free. Many of the plugins, there are free versions, there are premium versions, and you can walk your way up until the point that you can actually uh, pay for WordPress and all the great features that there are. Um, however, in smaller countries like my own, uh, we face different kinds of, of barriers to entry than most people in bigger countries because there are um, very fundamental features that we would uh, we wouldn't pay any importance to because when you when you when you're born here or you grow up here, um, you can start a website tomorrow and probably start making money directly from that website because you know the banks and all those other financial institutions have relationships with um, the plugins and with developers and so forth to make it a reality. Whereas from my experience, I, I had about five to six years just trying to find a way to uh, to make money on my website. I tried PayPal, I tried other options, but because the financial institutions in my country did not have that relationship, it was very difficult for me to do so. But I had big dreams. I had lots of big dreams for that website. And so um, as a content creator and as someone who's an entrepreneur who has all these dreams and stuff, it, it, was, it was daunting and it could even make you want to give up. So WordPress and new development.
WordPress is built around the same objectives of institutions that promote youth business development, removing barriers through training, mentorship, and, and capital. So with WordPress, youth can learn by doing. They own their own content. They have a safe environment, especially as it's youth. We know we want to ensure that their um, data is safe, the, there's privacy, and you know, that they, they have an environment that um, they won't suffer from bullying all, and all of these issues that we see around the world. Uh, they can share all of the content that they have, photos, videos, long and short text, and they can be paid for their content, they can sell merchandise, and they can create a business or a uh, career. Uh, now, as it relates to sharing all kinds of content, yes, there's social media. We have TikTok, we have Facebook, Instagram, you name it. There's a wide array of um, platforms where you can share content. But is that content really your own? That is a question. Are the people that you're engaging with really your own? And that is one of the things that WordPress allows people to have. They allow, it allows them to have ownership of their audience and ownership of their content. Whether it's posted on YouTube, they can always embed it on their website, or they can also host it on their website as well, that same content. And that, that is a very important part of, of WordPress. So who are the next generation of content creators? The content creation industry is now estimated to be worth more than $400 billion, according to a 2021 article published by Content Hacker. The next generation of content creators are skilled in using their smartphones, uh, in creating viral content from those, using those same smartphones. They're marketing gurus at what they do for the products that they endorse and even the products that they own. And for, uh, further examples of this include bloggers, online publishers, newsletter authors, podcasters, YouTubers, course um, creators, and so much more. There are also new technologies that are on the rise. Many of us have heard about blockchain and NFTs, and for many that is still a daunting um, area to really delve into, but WordPress has solutions for that. And it is providing the opportunity, as I said, for us to own our content. So like I said earlier, WordPress has plugins that can make all your dreams come true, and if it's not there yet, it can be developed. And the, the plugins that are there are also so versatile that you can, you know, manipulate them to the direction that you find is best for you. So, like I said, my personal experiences with WordPress, I had a dream of um, having a publication online. Um, a, a friend helped me to create my first website. Then another friend came in and helped me to build that website more. Um, and... And then I, I added more plugins and I learned by doing and I read and I went on YouTube, I engaged with the community as well. And that has really boosted me to become the person I am today and to be standing here as well. So like I, I learned how to do SEO. Um, we had a blog as well. And all of this added to, to the, the wealth and the, um, the functionality of that website. But like I said, we are missing the, the ability to accept payments. So in to today, well, within the past nine months, we, we got that ability. And that was very a very exciting time for me. And I would say that the way that that occurred was just because one developer, one local developer, found a way to, to work with a financial institution locally to create a, a plugin that could work between my website and, I'll, and the financial institution, and I was able to, to make money through that. Um, and so today now I have two businesses. Um, the other one is a tour operator, and we allow people to pay us online. And that might sound very, it's, it's a small thing. It's a drop in the bucket. It's a regular thing for everyone else. But for developing countries, there are a lot of things, a lot of, of um, potential and, and, and growth that is there. But, you know, we need the connections. We need persons who know how to develop, we need access. And that's what WordPress is about. Um, so I mentioned monetizing, so using AdWords, um, using online ticket sales, online stores, native, native advertising, all of these things are very common to everyone here, but it's not necessarily common for us. So uh, barriers faced by small countries, small developing countries, other barriers would be 
internet speeds. You know, whenever we get a slow internet speed, that is something that really frustrates us. I'm very sure of that. And especially if you're a content creator who has to upload big videos, uh, HD videos and, and photos and so forth, it, it's very daunting and it causes you to move away from those directions. Those barriers cause you from really uh, expanding on those opportunities that you have available to you. Um, and then, so within my country with COVID-19, because you couldn't go anywhere, they really opted now to try and get everything online, so e-payments and so forth. And these are things that are very common everywhere. So you know, we're, we're getting in, into the groove of it, we're removing those barriers, and things are happening. So in conclusion, WordPress is a very powerful tool. It provides young business persons opportunity to really realize their dreams and to grow businesses and have the potential to, to make money from them. Um, youth business development is centered around removing those barriers and WordPress is equally the same. It removes barriers and it, it, it provides a freedom to uh, realize the dreams that you have. Some youth, especially those in small developing countries, may not be able to really go into the directions of what we would think of the next uh, generation of, of WordPress, um, WordPress persons would, would be going into, content creators would be going into. However, um, that is a new direction for them. Whereas in countries um, like America and those other larger countries, that's, uh, that's not the case. So my final point, uh, the future of content creators is WordPress, where youth can own their content and create profitable businesses. Thank you very much for your time, and it's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much, Clemio. Great job. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Pleasure. All right, we're going to take a break now, and then we'll see you later.
Hello, everybody. It's good to see you again. It was my privilege to meet our next speaker at my very first word camp. In 2008, however many years that is, some of us have gotten older. Today, however, it is my honor to introduce our final speaker, of WordCamp US 2002. The co-founder of, what did I say, 2002? <laughs> See, I told y'all I can't do math. Anyway, y'all know what year it is, right? 2022, our final speaker. Please welcome to the stage, the co-founder of WordPress, Matt Mullenway. <laughs> <laughs> ah, 2002. I just met this guy, Mike Little, online. We were thinking about starting something together. <laughs> uh, yeah, those were, those were kind of a very different internet days. No iPhone. It's actually kind of wild to think of how much technology has changed since WordPress started. Um, and one thing that I am going to talk about a little bit, so we're going to try to devote today mostly uh, to Q&A. So I hope you all have some questions. If not, start thinking of them right now. Uh, we've got a few, or one mic right here? Is that the one mic, or is there going to be more than one? Cool. So that'll be where we'll start asking. But first, I did want to take a little time uh, to just welcome everyone back. How have the last two days been? Yeah? <laughs> it's um, really special to be back in person. And the last few years have really made me appreciate that although, just from the very beginning, you know, WordPress has always been radically distributed. Um, we sort of lived on the internet, was always our headquarters. Um, how important our in-person time was, and now still is, for building those bonds between people. Think of the lifelong friendships, the relationships that have started. Um, uh, there's a rumor that, in fact, one person who's, not, who's usually here is not here because is marrying another WordPresser. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard some of that. <laughs> uh, and it's really the bonds. You know, when people ask me what the best part of WordPress is, my answer is always the people. And uh, so being able to see some of y'all in person and at the party later is definitely the highlight for me. Um, I did want to uh, introduce a little bit of what's been going on uh, with 6.1, what is coming up. And so, much like before, we've got a little bit of a video um, to introduce some of the features that are coming. All right.
Ta-da. <laughs> One of the things I'm very excited about for 6.1 is that we're doing something different with the default theme. So the 2023 team is actually going to ship with 10 different style variations. Um, not unlike if, for those of you who might remember the, you remember the CSS Zen Garden back in the day? So we were able to show these variations of the default theme. So um, instead of shipping one theme per year in 2023, or I guess this year, uh, November, we'll be shipping uh, 10 and from, I think, nine contributors, different contributors. Um, and we got, how many contributions were there, submissions for there? I feel like they're 28-ish? 38. 38, there we go. Um, so keep in mind, it, that actually, I think we'll be able to do this in future years as well. So if you have, uh, would like a design of yours to potentially be on millions and millions of websites, um, but you don't want to cold up a whole theme, <laughs> doing a, a variation for uh, the 2023 or 2024 theme next year, be a good way to do it. As WordPress approaches its 20th year, um, which is kind of wild, <laughs> we're, we're not slowing down. Uh, we're trying to continue to invest in creating the most compelling platform, both the freedom of publishing and amazing web experiences for people who uh, just want to express themselves online. So uh, both together and, of course, everything we do being open source and inclusive, which is very core to the philosophy of what um, What's going on? Now, uh, y'all probably know this already, but if you like the tweet me thing, um, we're using the hashtag WCUS, nice and short this year. And then I am uh, Photomat, P-H-O-T-O-M-A-T-T, on Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you want to tag me. And so without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and hop into the, the questions and answers, or at least the questions. I can't promise answers, <laughs> but y'all can bring the questions. So. Uh, yeah, make your way over here if you got a question. And it looks like we have someone amazing and brave to kick us off. So mm -hmm. introduce yourself and um, we'll say hi. Uh, hi, my name is Milana Tap. I'm from Serbia. And I'm here uh, on behalf of Make Teams. So ah. I'm from the documentation team. And we started contributing, well, collaborating uh, together with other teams like learn and training teams because we have yeah uh, we have needs for the same infrastructure but there is no infrastructure and uh, we also started uh, collaborating with hosting team mm -hmm. on new handbook that will happen at best uh, administration and we really want to collaborate with core team mm -hmm. to have dedicated documentarian for every developer, so we document everything mm. while it's being developed, so we don't ever again ship code that is not fully documented. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, because we are doing this all in private messages, and that's not mm. the way for open source, mm -hmm. can we have some you know, support from Meta team or something mm -hmm. uh, to make this, uh, to create the infrastructure for, for collaborating between teams? Mm. So would that be like a, a channel on the Slack or a new P2? Well, what no, no, not there? just that, you know, uh, when you start with just a, a release, mm -hmm. there are changes and now we from documentation, we document that, but mm -hmm. there has to be some waterfall that information goes to learn team and uh, support mm -hmm. team and uh, training. So if we could have some system where mm -hmm. uh, it, it kind of expects us to work together, not mm -hmm. to be just a separate team. I mean, we can discuss this tomorrow at Contributor Day to see how we yeah. can do it. We just know that we need to do it. Yeah, the good news is all the changes are happening in, um, in source control, and so everything is there. Yeah, yeah. Maybe what could be a good role um, is someone to keep an eye on that. Yeah. And do like a notification. So uh, that could be even more than a new form. It might just be like a new a uh, way for people to contribute. Yeah, that um, would be also great. That's yeah. that's the way that I try to keep up with things as well, is keeping an eye okay. on like the GitHub issues and, and the change sets. I used to read every single one, but not so much <laughs> anymore. But I would say that if you if you want to know what's coming, reading the change sets, and we have pretty good commit messages now, is by far and away the best way uh, to do it. But I could see where perhaps if that's um, if that might be too technical for someone who else yeah. who wants to contribute otherwise, someone to translate that um, could be helpful. Cool. Okay. Thank you for the Thank suggestion. You. Thank you. <laughs> 
So, uh, non-serious question followed up by our serious question. Sure. So, welcome back. Uh, in honor of you being back in San Diego, are you going to do Irish car bombs again tonight? <laughs> I, I don't remember the last time doing them, so they must have worked. Uh. <laughs> That was our, our first word camp here in San Diego, 2011. So, ah. this, and there was photographic evidence of that. <laughs> I seem I seem to recall taking photos of you behind the bar. <laughs> you know, as as I enter my late 30s, hangovers seem to last longer, so I drink a lot less. <laughs> cool. So, um, so a, a little bit more serious of a question is, um, you know, recently I had I had uh, as a developer work on a, a project on WordPress.com, mm -hmm. and. They didn't want to move, <laughs> despite my urging, mm -hmm. um, and you know I ended up, uh, you know, having to really go through the process of working on there, mm -hmm. and seeing some real, you know, like struggling to work through mm -hmm. being on .com and some limitations that are on there. Mm -hmm. um, it was not a great experience mm -hmm. uh, as a developer, and um, like. <laughs> I, I've used some very strong language about it before, but like it was very poor experience as a hmm. developer, like working on the platform mm -hmm. and and getting anything done. Like as uh, I was created as an admin, as mm -hmm. a user, I couldn't install plugins or themes. Huh. Um, you know, they had their um, their main account, which. Um, I guess was what was paying for their premium service. Mm -hmm. I had to be logged in as them mm -hmm. to be able to install or edit plugins, that sort of thing. Hmm. So um, and my question is, what are we doing about .com? This is the mm -hmm. thing that really drives, you know, the you know this what what we're, what we're doing here, right? This like really pays for all that, you know, like what where, well, some, where some of it, not most of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, but I mean, that's, I mean, the majority of like, you know, the, the user uh, base that we have as WordPress, right, right. Is, is comes from the dot com. So, um, yeah. probably it'd be good to talk about a little bit of the history and then what's some of the latest stuff that maybe okay. you haven't seen yet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I'm just kind of curious, we're, we're, as... we're, 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 I feel like we're being overlapped by Squarespace and Wix these days, right? Mm. Like onboarding, user experience is like, you know, taking significant leaps above and beyond what WordPress.com, I think, has now. Yeah. And, and I'm kind of concerned that some of the dip in user base that we've experienced in the last year or so is kind of a direct result of that. Mm. These public companies that have the money, that have the background, throw all kinds of stuff at that. Like, we have almost an infinite supply of, you know, like, contributors mm -hmm. uh, as, as being an open source platform. Yeah. And I, I think that what's missing is a little bit of is the vision. And maybe you can talk a little bit about maybe there is some upcoming vision to that. Yeah, originally WordPress.com started as, like you said, a way to onboard brand new people. Right. And it was a big multi-site instance. Right. Um, so uh, there were a lot of plugins and things built in, but you couldn't modify the code or install your own or things like that. Um, what changed is on the business plan and above, um, you now it's a full, essentially like VPS type site. Mm -hmm. um, so you do get complete control over the code top to bottom, including being able to install plugins and themes. Right. It sounds like this, this uh, customer might not have been on that business plan. Oh, he was. Oh, yeah, they were, yeah, okay. Yeah, was. Um, I had to be logged in as him to actually do any of that. I couldn't, even as an admin user, yeah. I couldn't do that, which is... They might have set you as the wrong role, because you should be able to. Could and be. the thing that just launched, I want to say last week, is now full SSH and WP CLI access. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Um, it is something we've been, a lot of people don't know about this yet, mm -hmm. but um, definitely we've been hearing from a lot of developers and we want to make it a developer friendly place. Right. We also launched a pricing change that we ended up rolling back that brought the full um, kind of hosting access to basically every plan and mm -hmm. lower the price. And that ended up being a huge disaster for some reason. <laughs> so we, we reverted back to the old plans. Sure. Um, but yeah, there's uh, new things launching there. I would say developer focus is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And particularly if you haven't yet, check out the, um, the SSH and, uh, and WP CLI access. Okay. And of course, what's happening in the back end that is unusual there is um, actually multi data center failover and also super high performance, including mm -hmm. high frequency CPUs and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So you can actually run like very advanced uh, LMS sites or WooCommerce sites or other things on it. So if you haven't checked it out recently, uh, check it out again. Okay. And in fact, that platform behind it is 
uh, WP Cloud, WP.cloud, mm -hmm. which is now being used by a few other folks like Pressable, GridPane, some other hosts are starting to license that as well. Right. Um, because yeah. it is one of the highest performance. Yeah, I was so, just talking to Patrick this, yeah, this oh, afternoon. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, but sorry you had a bad experience there. And <laughs> definitely, I would say right in on the, the admin thing, mm -hmm. because maybe that's a bug. Okay. But the other things like the SSH hashtags just launched. So okay. <laughs> check that out again. Okay. Yeah, and thank cool. you for the question. Right. Yeah, good to see you again. Yep. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is James, I'm with PMC, and my question is, if you could wave a magic wand and make a WordPress problem that seems otherwise insurmountable just disappear overnight, huh. what, would you, uh, what would you choose? Hmm. I'll pick two, because one means. really drives me crazy. Um, <laughs> Y'all know the capital IDs in the, <laughs> in the database tables? <laughs> Oh my goodness, <laughs> what were we thinking? Uh, I think that goes all the way back to the B2 days. So that, um, that would be one I would change. And we probably can change at some point. We just need to migrate <laughs> some things. I think uh, none of people actually directly create a database so we could do that. Um, I guess I'm gonna wave this magic wand three times. <laughs> You're the boss, uh, you're in charge. The second one, and I think there is some solutions for this, um, but you know, I've been thinking a lot about um, projects that really build for the long term mm. and th think not just in years but decades and of course open source has some of the best ones of these and one I've been kind of particularly enamored with recently is actually SQLite um, as you know, they, they try to think about their data formats um, you know being accessible for decades to come like a, a really safe data storage format for rich data and so something a little more native in terms of supporting SQLite I think actually would pair very well with WordPress's thoughts on longevity and permalinks and everything like that that we try to support. And third thing I would say, which you know, came up in a lot of questions, particularly in Europe and other places, is um, if we could help people onboard better uh, to get involved with the community. And I think particularly with the um, loss of a lot of meetups during COVID, they're now starting to catch back up. And I know there's actually going to be some focus on that at Contributor Day tomorrow. By the way, who's sticking around for Contributor Day? Ooh. Wow, <laughs> um, that's great. I think, was it, was it Porto? We actually ran out of food and chairs and stuff because <laughs> we had so many more people at Contributor Day. Um, so I, I think you know, the best way to get involved with the WordPress community is typically sitting down at a laptop with someone else who's already involved and like um, kind of walking through it and learning and uh, learning together. And so meetups, Contributor Day is coming back and everything um, is fantastic. I would love to get better at doing that in a distributed fashion. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're pretty good at it if you're in person or able to come physically to a contributor day. But as y'all know, like we had to cut the, cap the tickets quite lower. This is, I think, the smallest WordCamp US since a um, oh, while. Wow. I kind of love it because this feels like the old days. <laughs> Not quite 2002. That one would have been much smaller. Um, a lot of people don't know, but the very first ever um, WordCamp was organized with only like a few weeks of notice. And we did it at the Swedish American Music Hall in, um, in San Francisco. Uh, I just saw an amazing documentary as well called um, We Are As Gods, which is uh, about Stuart Brand, who is this amazing character who founded the whole Earth Catalog, which of course inspired Steve Jobs. And um, they were going to some of the original, I think he also organized the very first ever hacker conference, kind of like around the Homebrew Computer Club and everything like that. And in the documentary they had, pictures of this first conference. And gosh, if you wouldn't believe it, it was at the Swedish American Music Hall. <laughs> I was like, wait, I recognize that weird place. <laughs> um, so that in-person is helping, but I would love for us to, whether that's online pairing or you know, uh, online meeting times that are in different time zones and things, to make it easy for the folks who, for whatever reason, aren't able to come to a WordCamp or a meetup, um, get involved. Because that's, I think, part of the power of, of our online community as well. Time awesome. to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> can I help him with a mic there? Yeah. Got it. Michelle Frechette with Stellar WP at Liquid Web and Post Status. So, Whoa. <laughs> yes. My Busiest question. woman in WordPress. <laughs> What's that? Busiest woman in WordPress. <laughs> Maybe. Merger, <laughs> you've met Josefa, right? 
Mergers and acquisitions have been a hot topic in the last few years. What are your thoughts about this for the WordPress ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? Why or why not? Hmm. Um, I think mergers and acquisitions are value neutral in and of themselves. And it's more about what happens afterwards. So I think it's natural that particularly when we enter moments of economic uncertainty, which we've certainly had a lot of in the past few years and might be going into more of now, um, or when markets are super hot, like they kind of were a year ago, uh, for there to be some consolidation or folks that particularly have a lot of equity value in their stock to use that to, um, to join up. And um, I'll also say that having done over like 25 of those, <laughs> been on both sides of, of a lot of those, including as an investor, um, they, they're tough to do right. And um, one thing that I actually see helping uh, in the WordPress community versus acquisitions that happen in more general technology is um, there's so much philosophical alignment across a lot of the organization in the WordPress community, including very many of them being distributed or having a strong like distributed aspect to them. And so, of course, like having the open source ethos. So um, I feel like the WordPress organizations are really good influences on each other. And uh, certainly at Automatic, we've had a lot of inspiration from you know, some of the cool things that other organizations do, including around contributor days or how they give back or all sorts of things. And because there's so much sharing and blogging about it, <laughs> there's just a lot of cross-pollination, which I like. Um, where they're tough is just integrating different cultures are hard. Um, sometimes uh, founders might leave after an acquisition or just there might be sort of like an organ rejection of the, the cultures of a new organization and old organization. Um, one way we think about it is that when we buy a company, we're hoping to both influence them and be influenced by them. So uh, Automatic itself is kind of like a different organism once the cultures merge. And depending on the size of, of what's joining, um, that might both take a while or be a b really big change. Like uh, for us, one of the most, the largest ones in terms of people is uh, Tumblr, which is about, I think, 200 people, 180 people when we bought it. Yeah. So that has uh, been an interesting process. I would encourage you know, folks who, who work on acquisitions or do them in the space to think about the, uh, the day that deal is signed as the halfway point, not the finish point. Because mm -hmm. however much work you did getting to that uh, and working together is I think you need at least that much on the other side to really intentionally integrate the cultures and onboard people well. And also just make sure there's not something um, you know, kind of lost in the bureaucracy that's happening around like expense policies or uh, vacation resetting or just all the kind of logistics um, that sometimes we can forget about when those things happen. So well, I'd love you to have you on post data so we can talk about it more. I'm happy to, <laughs> always happy to join the podcast of the different WordPress uh, publications. Awesome. And thank you again for the question. My pleasure. <laughs>
definitely agree that there's been a lot more done uh, recently with that, but is there, is there more plans coming up to make it even more so? So very much so. So I would say that, um, especially if you were to compare, well, one thing that's tough is that the block editor is giving exponentially more functionality right. than more of a traditional document editor or, or different things. Um, we do put a lot of work into creating keyboard shortcuts for everything and a good amount of testing, including creating some entirely new interfaces to allow sort of faster, particularly keyboard-based navigation. But of course, accessibility is more than just that. Mm -hmm. And so particularly if there's feedback from users or it sounds like uh, uh, this person who sent you the long <laughs> couple of paragraphs, yeah. um, one if they haven't checked it out recently, check it out because it's been incredible improvements. Actually, WordPress 6.1 is including 11 releases of Gutenberg. Oh. So we're still releasing at a very, very fast pace. Yeah. Um, it's actually the part of WordPress that's having the most commit activity and the most growth in the past year. Um, and feedback, particularly from users who are using different assistive technologies, is really invaluable. Because mm. the, even the standards or the other things, like you said, what we might do technically, might not reflect how a certain client or a certain use case. Right. Um, so that real world usage um, is really, really helpful. Particularly because like for user testing, it can be difficult to find enough users that access the technology in different ways. Yeah. The final thing I'll say is that you know, the WordPress both has API and multiple ways to do things. So for example, if someone were primarily just writing blog posts, for example, didn't really need like, the advanced layout capabilities mm -hmm. of, of the site editor or the block editor, um, I would actually encourage to use a different um, method of posting, including you know, there's lots of desktop clients that talk to XMRPC or the REST API. And, um, and I have given some thought as well as if, actually for the entire interface of WordPress, if there could be an interesting project to create kind of a parallel API-driven um, version of it that was designed to perhaps have, um, like hide some of that more advanced functionality for the everyday use case. Again, particularly if you were doing like something more like blogging on it versus right. the full layout yeah, stuff. Right. And so you could access that more complex interface if you needed to do that particular task, but for the everyday, that could be a simpler one. So that's already possible with the APIs, um, but I think actually a pretty interesting uh, approach for like the accessibility team or something, um, because we now have APIs for pretty much everything. So you could actually create a, a completely parallel WP admin with not that much overhead. That could be a much simpler markup or something. Yeah, all right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
multilingual in WordPress today? And two, why is it further down in the Gutenberg roadmap? So I'll try to address those separately. Um, multilingual today is obviously not in core, but the good news is there are a number of pretty good plugins for it. And so many, many WordPress sites are, multi, are run in a multilingual fashion. Um, actually, who here runs uh, WordPress in more than one language? That's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, that looked like about a 5 or 10%. And we're in WordCamp US, so I'm sure it'd be much higher uh, if we had asked that same question in WordCamp Europe or one of the international WordCamps. Um, so very possible. And I was, actually, it, these plugins are pretty good. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to endorse a specific I used one. to work at one. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> but they still cost money, and that's not the democracy we're trying to build. And some of the, and most of them have free versions, and then some of them have paid upgrades and other things. Um, it is tricky, particularly the data model for it. So that brings us to why it is later in the Gutenberg roadmap. And just do a quick refresher. Um, version, uh, sort of phase one of Gutenberg was blocks, sort of the post editor. Phase two, which we're in right now, is taking those blocks and allowing you to edit the whole site. So that's what we're now calling the site editor. We're moving away from the full site editing term and probably won't call it site editor. Um, phase three is workflow and collaboration, uh, which there's a little bit of a tension earlier because there's actually a lot of folks who want to start that right now. And uh, I'm actually trying to pump the brakes a little bit because I really want to get our site editing to a point of, um, of excellence and accessibility before we move on. Um, <laughs> and then fourth is the multilingual. So, and that's the only four of the phases that we've announced so far. Um, one of the reasons I really wanted to create the building blocks sometimes literally, uh, before we got to multilingual, is because to me one of the big parts of creating a, a really great multilingual experience is that collaboration and workflow. So when content is created in one language, how does that then flow to the other languages? What does that look like? Um, and so having some ability to have some different roles and workflows built into WordPress, I think is gonna be really key for doing that well. The other thing and why multilingual is gonna be, I think, tricky to uh, address in core if you notice, a lot of the WordPress plugins for it actually use different kind of models of the data. And some use other tables, some use the post table. But regardless of how they work, it's, um, it's very tricky because you move to kind of a one-to-one -one relationship between like a page and a post or, or the, the content there to almost like a many-to-many. And there's so many different workflows. Like some sites want every single page translated and some might want a subset or some might want how switching works, you know, whether that's URL-based, subdomain-based, cookie-based. You know, there's so many different ways uh, to address it. Do you want um, the same slugs, which is kind of what's in the URL for all of them? Um, so like slash contact, and then you know, just the content is uh, translated? Or do you want a way to map, like it's contact in English, and someone tell me that in another language. <laughs> A different word, right, would be, would be in the URL. Uh, so that kind of many-to-many -many approach is honestly um, going to add a tremendous amount of complexity to WordPress. And I'm actually still not 100% whether we should do more of a core plugin for it that's officially supported and, and created by, by folks, but maybe not actually distributed with core WordPress, kind of like Gutenberg was in the beginning, um, or whether it should actually be in core, just because it... Um, creates that. But the number one thing I, I do want to figure out there is the data model, because then much like page building plugins can all now use core Word, WordPress blocks, and that's kind of a new standard versus having like a different way to do blocks across the different page builders, whether you're on Beaver Builder or Divi or you know, whatever. Um, if we could make it so um, all the multilingual plugins were using kind of common data structure, I think that would be much easier for other plugins than to integrate with them. But I don't know what that right data structure is yet. And um, I don't think we have enough folks to work on that simultaneously with these other phases. So uh, it is really kind of a matter of focus. And it drives me crazy because I get this question every single time. <laughs> Seems natural that we want to grow our market share and this is the way other softwares make it a little easier. Yeah. Anyway, thank well, you. I don't know if they, it's possible. I haven't seen also an implementation that does it in a super great user way yet either. Um, so that would also be something like if any of you have, you know, whether it's another CMS entirely or one of the plugins for WordPress that you think like really nails the user experience, I would love to spend some more time with that because the complexity of this mini to mini and how the workflows work, how the URLs work, everything like that, um, it appears I haven't seen like a perfect implementation. It's more like a series of trade-offs or implementing a subset of it. Mm. So. I will follow up with you on that. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> Gracias. Come <laughs> Samida. Arigato merci. Hi Matt, my name is Birgit Polly Haag, and I have a question about tomorrow is the contributor day. Yeah. And um, if you stay, and I don't know if you do, but what would be the favorite, the most favorite thing for you at contributor day to oh. work on? Oh, I, I believe. By the way, is it that we have 17 of the 21 make teams represented as well? Oh, cool. I'll repeat that. So she said that there'll be some representatives online as well there. So there'll actually be 20 of the 21 teams. Which team did make it? Plugins. Plugins. Oh. <laughs> no, it's okay. Plugins aren't that important, right? <laughs> We've got a lot of them already. Oh, where'd you go? Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, Hmm. Uh, you know, something that I've actually really enjoyed at, at previous ones is uh, there's so much on WordPress.org that I think is, you know, we just redesigned the homepage and a few other things. Um, it feels like there is a lot of lift from relatively simple changes, whether that's more CSS or just copy-based, um, that could really improve uh, both the core main WordPress.org site. And I also think a lot about the Rosetta sites, you know, again, um, being relatively monolingual, at least for natural languages. Um, I don't know, probably some folks in here could say, like on the es.wordpress.org or one of these other ones, how good of a job are we doing? And both having compelling copy that's you know, relevant, that's maybe synced up with the, what we learned to be best on the main site. And um, it's kind of a version of the last question, actually. <laughs> What's the workflow for propagating those changes in different directions? And, or is there more that we can do, particularly on the Rosetta sites, which is our international subdomains? Um, to be more compelling and relevant for that market. So that would probably be the, my pick. All right. uh, thank you. Thank you. And looking forward to seeing lots of y'all there tomorrow as well. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Philip Levine from South Florida Web Advisors. I got a quick question. Many of the people in the room, I get, use block editor. That's the direction of things mm -hmm. are going in. But there's a lot of folks who are still using classic editor, still using mm -hmm. page builders. Whenever I do a new install, it's a pain that I got to remember to go in and install classic editor, or classic mm. widgets. Could there be a toggle for during the install to say install in classic mode and, and throw those plugins in automatically and that way you're not having to do it every time? There could be, but <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. No, it's okay. No. Let, let me give a slightly longer answer there, which is that, um, you know, we definitely are going to, you know, we actually, I think, extended how long we're supporting the, the classic editor plugin and everything like that. Technically, it's, it's not too hard to keep that going for a while because we still need to have kind of tiny MC support and other things kind of embedded within Gutenberg. We do have a classic block in Gutenberg as one example that provides the legacy support. So if you open a post that was created before um, Gutenberg existed, you can still edit it and convert it to blocks if you want to really simply. Um, but very much so. Uh, the preponderance of new development in WordPress is, is really focused on the block editor. And so any effort that we could put towards adding that toggle or something, we'd rather put into making it so you don't want the toggle anymore. <laughs> and someday, it sounds like that day is not yet, but that, you know, that won't be the first plugin you install on things. And more and more, we want users uh, to also be demanding that because they want a functionality of a block or an integration with a plugin which primarily operates through blocks because it just allows, um, such a more common user interface to what could be very, very advanced functionality. So um, all the new developments going into that, and think of Classic as just like a stopgap. So if you're, if you're still building sites with Classic in 2022, like see how you can maybe minimize that or, or migrate the users, spend an hour with them to teach them how the new stuff works, because it's really the future of WordPress. So thank you for the question. <laughs> Hello, sir. How are you doing? I have a Good. quick question. You may not have a quick answer, but um, I'm William Jackson, representing my wife, Aida, and we're real interested in knowing, we've been teaching about the metaverse and onboarding people and applying it to a business aspect as well. We wanted to get your idea of how the metaverse and its growth and immersive and immersive um, communities and societies Hmm. Have you taken that into account of how you can apply it or uh, work well, with WordPress hmm. or in some fashion? 
Hmm. Um, it's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're teachers, so we always try to ask good questions. <laughs> It's interesting because, um, you know, operating and developing connections online mm -hmm. uh, has really been my entire adult life, even before I was an adult. Right. And it was so powerful to me from a very young age to be able to participate in online communities, like going back to even like BBSs and IRC and everything mm -hmm. like that, where uh, my physical identity or age or appearance or anything mm -hmm. um, wasn't a barrier to connecting with folks. Right. Um, particularly, I was pretty young. My voice was like three octaves higher. <laughs> if you met me in person, you wouldn't take me seriously. Mm -hmm. Like I'd walk into Best Buy to, you know, I saved up money to buy a camera and they wouldn't even talk to me and stuff like that. But then online, you know, I had my usernames, Photomat, before that it was, I think, Illusion or something, you know, my hacker names. And the, mm -hmm. it was fun to be on the forums and learn about right. whatever it was from BBSs to uh, mm -hmm. phone freaking or whatever it was that was right. uh, kind of what I got into in my youth. And then, of course, um, you know, a lot of participation in forums and getting involved with open source, mm -hmm. which is still one of the things I was gladdest to this day, right. things I was so glad to stumble across right. in my life and is something I hope to be the rest of my life. So the element of the, what's now called the metaverse of like mm -hmm. being able to put on and off online identities and participate mm -hmm. more on the basis of your contributions or your avatar, what, however you choose to present yourself online, I think is like one of the best things about the internet. And, um, and very cool that the WordPress community is so good at translating that into person, where it, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this already, but like very much a community where people don't judge a book by the cover. And um, it's great, you know, every WordPress event, you'll right. see folks from tons of different backgrounds, ages, everything. Like it's like, it doesn't matter. We're all here combined by like a similar love of open source, WordPress and everything like that. And, and that's what I think one of the best parts. Yeah. Particularly, you know, a lot of the recent conversation around metaverse is, is centered and pushed by like, Facebook now meta mm -hmm. and very much around their investments in VR, right. which is uh, not insignificant. I think they're spending like five, ten billion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. um, and the hardware is getting better, better. Right. much faster. And, you know, in theory, like Apple's going to come out with a new uh, headset or there right. might be some AR type things. And... Um, if that technology was to follow similar curves that mm -hmm. cell phones have over the past, what's now 15 years since mm -hmm. the iPhone was introduced, and I guess even prior to that with like right. rim devices and handsprings and stuff, um, I could see mm -hmm. five or 10 years from now, maybe a lot of us wearing these things in the audience. Um, okay. I would certainly love something that would like remind me of someone's name or something <laughs> when I met them or like some sort of scanner like that would be, be kind of cool and a lot of y'all wearing glasses already so if the technology got to a point where it could be embedded in a glass um, that's pretty cool and then hopefully we don't have to wear masks then so they won't fog up so much <laughs> but my personal experience is that screens are still really good mm -hmm. and so I I've enjoyed VR for example or the headsets for like gaming or right. just having fun but I think it would be hard for me to imagine wearing one of these mm -hmm. for the amount that I'm on a computer all day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, having a screen that you can put in your pocket, take right. out, look at, show people, share really easily, right. um, is still pretty great. Uh, so I'm not actually convinced that the sort of VR use cases mm -hmm. um, are going to be as ubiquitous as right. the more screen ones. Um, unless there was some sort of breakthrough in technology that is just okay. like impossible to imagine, for, at least for me yet. Right. I'm sure in the, in the depths of Apple or Meta, they have some, some <laughs> prototypes there that are pretty neat. Yeah. Um, and in the meantime, I'll say that games, forums, mm. there's so many online communities that are, I think, fulfilling all the promise of what Meta mm. is saying could happen. So if right. that is appealing to anyone, I'd encourage them to like, spend some more time on some of these time. online communities that exist, including like the Roblox and Minecrafts of the world right. that create like really rich worlds. Okay. Well, thank you, yeah, because um, we're seeing more and more conferences reaching out to us to, to see our ideas and opinions of how, how to integrate people into conferences like this, hmm. into the metaverse, and, you know, people come in as avatars. So we just wanted to kind of get your, your, your perspective of the way it's going to go and how it's happening so we can kind of guide what we're doing and, and teaching. So thank you. Appreciate thank it. you. And just to follow up there, maybe that could be a fun, like, WordCamp. Uh, I definitely, you know, now that we can come in person, it, it wasn't as 
not as interesting, but during COVID, I definitely went to a few of those online conferences and the software advanced pretty quickly. There was even an online Burning Man one year um, <laughs> that uh, I think there were actually multiple ones you could access through different, um, different platforms. And it was interesting. Uh, not as good as the real verse, <laughs> but um, coming up, and, uh, but still pretty neat. So was that? Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear that. Oh, okay, cool. Um, how about lightning rounds? Try to get through the rest? Okay. Hard oh, hard stuff, what time? Oh, okay. So I'll try to answer short answers. So, but uh, we'll try to get through these five, and if not, we'll have to stop right at the 5.45. So. Sure. Clarifying on a question. Hi, I'm Courtney Robertson from GoDaddy Pro. At WordCamp Europe, I asked about the... Um, translation on learn.wordpress.org. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to clarify, that question was more around courses. We do have ways of mm -hmm. storing some of the other languages, but courses are using Sensei Pro. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure on the time frame of multilingual, mm -hmm. and I would like to see an alternative before we wait that long yeah. to make languages more available. And if that means a plugin or a Rosetta site or something to maintain that, I'd like to see that get unblocked. And then um, related to that, you and I had a conversation in Slack around the data of how many views or what the access is mm -hmm. on Learn. Mm -hmm. And as we know on .org, gathering too much data is a little bit tricky because people don't like a whole lot of sure. data being gathered, especially on an open source site. Mm -hmm. um, it would be helpful. So those are areas that I'm not sure if we can get unblocked, but it would be really nice too. I think we could, yeah. Okay. So we can continue that on, on the .org stack, but I know we do run like Google Analytics in some places, and we've, we've shared that with different contributors. Okay. So that shouldn't be too hard. And I do think we do have some other language courses on Learn as well. So it's a little bit of a manual process now, but it is, it is already happening. Right. Oh. And do you have an ETA on overhauling make, the main make.wordpress.org page I, itself? I don't think currently on the roadmap. So perhaps okay. that's something that people could take a look at tomorrow. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right, lightning round. I'll try to... <laughs> As you can tell, I, I, I can be loquacious, so I'll try to keep these short. Uh, hi, I'm Nathan uh, from Elegant Themes. Um, one of those weird people that got into WordPress for blogging and still does it to this day. Cool. So, <laughs> if anybody remembers uh, way back in the day, like WP Mods, <laughs> I wrote for them. Wow. Um, and so I fell in love with WordPress as a blogging platform. It's been my profession for like 10, 15 years now. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, whenever I go to WordCamps, or I, I especially was surprised at WordCamp for publishers that it wasn't actually for people like blogging, it was like for news organizations. <laughs> so, um, uh, you seem to be at a very interesting position right now as like the, the company um, that acquired Tumblr, mm -hmm. um, that reinvented the editor within WordPress uh, for Gutenberg. Um, we are kind of seeing a, a potential for new ways to revolutionize blogging itself mm -hmm. as, a, as a medium and what's possible there. As someone at the nexus of all that, how, what do you see as the future of blogging? Ooh. Um, short answer. Short answer. Um, yeah. So a quick stat, uh, half the people coming to WordPress.com are actually blogging and bloggers. And we're seeing a ton of activity there. Things I'm most excited to work on, one, like as I mentioned before, we're switching Tumblr to be WordPress powered. That's so I think that could provide a really nice in, uh, sort of like gateway into the WordPress world. And I'm sure, I hope as future WordCamps they'll be like, because Tumblr is a younger audience, people who started on Tumblr and then now are like at work camps, writing plugins, things like that. I think that'd be really cool. And um, things that we're working on right now, particularly the re remainder of the year, that some teams focused on are the reader. So, because I think, you know, since Google Reader has been gone, there hasn't been a good way to follow other blogs. And commenting. I feel like commenting um, is, uh, there's not good interactions for follow up. So, I think both of those can help reinvigorate, because of course, comments are the best part of blogging. And uh, so keep an eye on for some improvements there, both in Jetpack and WordPress.com on its way. Okay, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, uh, David Yard from Orlando. Um, first, I want to thank you for the awesome photo that you took of me and John Maida back at a random <laughs> obscure meetup where I was more nervous than anything else. Um, and also, you said people. Um, Thank you for having us speakers here who are challenged by the attendees to be better and do more cool stuff. Um, my question is, uh, after talking to a few people here, 
um, it kind of seems like WordPress has a marketing problem mm. where it is an amazing platform. We know the power of it. Um, but really and truly, only developers are kind of like welcome at the table. Mm. Um, so as designers, as UX people, as brand strategists, we're just kind of like, yeah, WordPress is great. You should get it. And then hopefully pass you off in the hands of a great developer. Or if you're mm -hmm. lucky and you find someone that is kind of like that unicorn, then so be it, right? Um, no pun intended. Oh, snap. Um, so how do we uh, or what would you see as a best way for designers in the field, content people, to kind of come together to uh, collaborate around those more and um, not make it so technical, so to speak? Mm -hmm. yeah. That is why we started Gutenberg, is to try to open up the, the flexibility and power of how people are able to customize if they knew code in the past or just got good at building themes and things uh, to a much wider audience. Um, we also, there's going to be a design table tomorrow. So come to that if you're, or maybe you're already at it, I bet you are. <laughs> uh, I, I will say that um, one thing I hope to develop is a more culture of um, open source participation from designers. And part of that is uh, showing the impact of like user research, design, everything. And I think, at least what I hear from developers in WordPress, is they're really hungry for it. Um, because we, we might do a first version of a design, but like, uh, or the developer might do it themselves, but the feedback from like a user test or something else, I find incredibly influential. So uh, I'd love to see more of that actually as a way, and if we can publish it and show, um, do that in public, I think it's actually could teach a lot of people design skills, even though they might not identify as a designer. Agreed. Cool, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, we might actually get through these by, <laughs> by the time they kick us out. So I don't know if the lights are going to go off or my mic will cut out. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Hi, my name is Cassandra. This is my first WordCamp. Welcome. So, <laughs> you so picked I, a good one. <laughs> yes, I only understand about half of the development conversation, but that's all right. Um, so I actually come from the nonprofit world, mm -hmm. and I have had the privilege to learn from presenters here about some of the efforts around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to hear your thoughts about how our community, everyone, right, not just the community team, mm -hmm. um, could actively and strategically create avenues for disadvantaged communities. Mm -hmm. I've helped build relationships locally between companies and schools, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but this community is brilliant, it's loving, it's um, so focused on connecting, and I just feel like we need to be intentional about fighting for access and combating poverty. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> With the time, I'm definitely only going to be able to scratch the surface this, this one, so I apologize in advance. Um, for a longer depth into this, if you, if you didn't see earlier, there was a great talk by uh, Cami Chaos. Yes, I did. Is Cami yeah. here? Yeah. Somewhere. Uh, so that's already online on the live stream. I got to catch a bit of it and, of course, saw David Bissett's great tweets and everything about it. So, um, But I, th I think that's worth a much uh, more in-depth because it really, like you said, there's so many different avenues and places uh, to try to be more belonging as a community. Um, I will also point as well just briefly to some of the work of the WordPress Foundation, uh, the different programs that are being run, like workshops in other countries, uh, the do action type things that actually build websites for nonprofits. So it's both teaching people how to do it and helping a nonprofit in a different field have a better online presence um, as being very high impact. And I know some of the work, um, Automatic as a team uh, that builds websites for folks just for um, basically friends or, or influencers or stuff like that. And we found it being very high impact that, you know, even more than just giving money to an organization, if we were able to help them convert more visitors to their website to be donators, that had like a, a big multiplier effect. And so it was one of the big ways that we've, or one of the giving back that I've been most proud of that we've been able to do. So think about that as a way as well to support not just WordPress, people learning WordPress, but other nonprofits in the space. Helping their online presence is uh, can be very, very powerful. And most nonprofits you contact, or if you say like, can I help with the website? They'll be like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so thank you for the question. Thank That's you. brief, but hopefully some pointers to some, some deeper discussion on it. All right. All right, bring us home. All right. <laughs> um, hi, Matt. It's Christina. And 
One of the things I love about WordPress, I've been working with it since 2008, is the flexibility and mm. the choices people have and the commitment to diversity, accessibility, and inclusion. Many of my clients are older, and mm. they've been using the classic editor mm -hmm. and classic widgets for a long time. And when you say just teach them the new Gutenberg, that puts a hardship on older people yeah. who've been using it for many years and are very happy with the classic editor. So yeah. I'm here to urge you to keep it around much longer than what you suggested so that the older community is not put in a hardship, that they have to learn something that's new and technical. So please do consider those folks. That, yeah. I think that represents one of the most difficult things about products in general. Because, for example, iOS was it 16 is about to come out. So constantly operating systems, everything. We need to update if we're going to be both not just update versions for security and everything like that, but also to expand our mission of democratizing publishing. And so one thing I do worry is that the longer that people stay on the old thing, the bigger the delta is between where, what they were using before and what they're going to have to learn. It's much, much easier if you're kind of on, if you're learning the latest thing to keep rolling with that update than if, let's say, they were going to wait another five years and then try to learn whatever, you know, Gutenberg 48 <laughs> going from classic editor. So I would actually, I will go back and encourage them to make the leap now um, because that will give them the most forward compatibility with where things are going. And I actually believe that, you know, we were kind of, early-ish to this, but if you look at every CMS now, they're using some form of block editor. And other document things are doing it. Even Google Docs is moving to have some richer blocks. So I think the concepts that you learn, uh, block editing, is actually the future of just writing and publishing on the web, and, um, and just how everything's going to work, not even just Gutenberg. And maybe they learn Gutenberg. Uh, as you all know, we're, we're relicensing the mobile version of Gutenberg to be more easily embeddable, even in commercial apps. I think Gutenberg blocks actually could wind up becoming like a wider web standard. So it won't just apply to WordPress, but perhaps even for other applications. I'd love if someday MailChimp or even Squarespace or Wix were to use Gutenberg. Um, and so it becomes more of a cross CMS standard. I think Gutenberg could actually be bigger than WordPress itself in terms of you know, being uh, usable for lots of different apps. We well, already have it on Tumblr, actually. Gutenberg is still changing. So if yeah. you could make the transition longer, that would help because it's hard for them to learn, and now it's changed, and they got to learn it again. So I'd, yeah. I'm, I'm eager to teach them, but I'd rather wait. And so if you could make the transition longer, that would be great. Well, we've already extended it a few years. Um, so, But Gutenberg started in, what, 2016? So it's been a while already. And, and when Classic Editor was our main editor, it would change a lot every single release as well. So there is, I, I, know, it's a, I know it's hard to learn new things, but I can't recommend anything else in, in good faith. Um, so it's, it's, I well, think it's uh, hard, but worth it. Well, just consider the hardship on them. That's all. We thank do, you. yeah. Thank you. And we are now over time a little bit. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Uh, oh, I do have one more thing uh, to announce, which we like to do at the end of would you all like to know where WordCamp US is going to be next year? <laughs> so one announcement. Um, the winner of the team that's going to organize for next year, where we will be, it's actually a place I've never heard of yet, which is National Harbor, Maryland. Has anyone been there? So it's, uh, it's near the DC, Washington, DC metro area. And from August 21st to August 25th, um, we're going to be at National Harbor, Maryland. So I'm looking forward to learning that. You might notice that's a longer WordCamp, and that's because WordCamp US 2023 will actually begin with a community summit first. So, <laughs> that is all we have for today. So see you all at the party. See you at a contributor day tomorrow, and thank you so much. Uh, I do have. Oh, one more. I do have a just just a few quick uh, like end of day remarks. Um, First, thank you to all of our sponsors, especially our uh, platinum sponsors, which is Google, Jetpack, Bluehost, and WP Engine. Um, the services that made this possible behind the scenes 
Blaze Media doing all this streaming for everybody that isn't here right now. Um, White Coat for doing the captioning for us and Val for handling all of our uh, COVID clearance and mask enforcement. Um, obviously a big thanks to our speakers, volunteers, organizers, everybody that made this happen. The social tonight is at uh, Riverfront Park, which is kind of behind the hotel. There will be some directional signs in the Palm Tower breezeway to find your way there. It is a grassy area that is going to be dry enough for us to enjoy, but you know, choose your footwear accordingly. <laughs> and that's everything. I look forward to seeing you all tonight and tomorrow at Contributor Day. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Aaron.